Welcome and good morning to the reconvening of our study session from yesterday. So Mr. McBride, I believe we left off on organizational structure slide 28. And for members of the public and also for council, the way we're gonna do this, so we'll do the, er, er, there's different stops along the way. So we'll do the organizational structure stop, any questions from council and then each department will do another stop. And for members of uh, the community that would like to comment at the end of the entire presentation, we'll accept public comment. So with that, Mr. McBride, you're on. Thanks, Mayor, members of council. And just as a reminder, um, we did actually update uh, the slide on the organizational structure in Legistar. So if members of the public want to uh, refresh their slides, if they're using slides from yesterday, it has been updated with a, with a minor change to the organizational structure. So at this point, uh, we'll pick up from yesterday. Um, we're gonna go through today, talk about organizational structure, and then we're gonna get into the uh, cuts that we, we talked about in January. Um, and then we're gonna get into an overview of the budget, departmental budgets, and then we're gonna end up the day uh, with Director Nutt's gonna take us through the uh, capital improvement program. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to the city manager, Mr. McGlynn, to talk about his organizational structure. So um, one of the things I want to prelude this conversation with is a, is a th thanks to a lot of the senior managers who spent long hours working on this with with a couple things in mind. How do, how do we become a, 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 a the most efficient, effective organization we can have um, and actually start to demonstrate some cost savings within the organization and, and not, not minimal cost savings, but significant cost savings. And that's the change you have in front of you. Um, the change would uh, effectively uh, create um, I think we can flip to the next slide and then we'll flip back. The, there's the big headline items are um, creating some assistant city managers. Currently as the positions are, are structured, they do not have reporting responsibilities, which becomes challenging um, in accountability conversations, but also effectiveness in managing teams. Uh, there, this, currently the assistant city manager position is geared to a project-based uh, assignment. And it would also con con uh, include the elimination of the deputy city manager. And, and I can't say that that is not a, a significant sacrifice because it is. Um, that, that position has been key to actually helping um, break down silos within the organization, uh, essential in developing uh, a pathway for us to make a change on our garbage hauler, helping essential work being done, um, reforming, um, uh, and changing our purchasing processes that you will be entertaining shortly. Um, but it also, it's, it, 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 it's time to actually address some long-term issues that the city's facing, and I think that's the exchange that we're really, we're really looking at. What the, what the change allows us to do, um, there are two other changes which I'll come back. Allows, what I think the change allows us to do is con continue to address, and, and I think I, can't complement the entire organization on the rate at which we do get work done and try to address the tier one priorities and all calls from the community. I think that the speed with which this city moves is pretty remarkable, especially when you compare it um, uh, across the region and across the state and its effectiveness of actually addressing issues that the council has placed in front of it. Um, and, and meeting the timetables of a very aggressive work plan that council has laid out. I know you all said, we, we understand we might not be to meet all these goals, but I think you know that staff's intent is to try to meet as effectively and efficiently all those things that you've laid out in front of us. I will say that I pointed out to the mayor the other day, there's a lot coming due in August, and I have some concerns about that, um, but we'll, we'll sort through it, and again, the commitment is to try to get this as much work as done as possible. Um, it also is allows us to effectively manage the recovery process. We've done that internally. Uh, I think this team is actually, I can't say enough about how this team has supported um, our colleagues and partners, both on the local level, the state level, and frankly, on the national level, it's this team working together 
that has gotten legislation um, included working with our federal partners, our federal electeds in reauthorization of FEMA. Uh, I think it was essential conversations that got to the 90-10 um, split on the cost share of debris removal and has made, continues to make significant progress in challenging FEMA and our state partners to think outside of their normal parameters on how they apply their solutions to recovery. Um, but it also, as it was illustrated yesterday, becomes a way for us to make sure that we're supporting all our colleagues. You heard there are different levels of, of assessment going on in the organization. I think this new structure allows us to look at things as asset management tools. We're not dividing it up based on territory. We're trying to make sure that we have a reliable program to address all the needs within the organization and have some accountability and be able to answer those questions directly, not just of the council, but of the public in general. It also creates, um, uh, frankly, succession planning, as I've told council members individually, and some uh, that, you know, the lifespan of a city manager is five years. I will have reached uh, average lifespan of five years. I have reached that lifespan come this September. I'm not planning on going anywhere, but you always should have a succession plan in place. With this, with this realignment, there is ability to look at these individuals. They can maybe aspire to become your next city manager if, if changes happen. Um, you know, I could get run over on a bus tomorrow, by a bus tomorrow, not a city bus, mind you, but. Um, uh, uh, and, um, uh, uh, and it also ensures that we're starting to talk strategically about how the organization adapts to what our structural issues are, both on the asset side and the financial side. This, is a, this year is the beginning of a conversation. As you see, the red continues. It's not something we're gonna escape immediately. Uh, we need to do strategic planning, and that strategic planning has to have questions about what's essential services to deliver, how we're gonna deliver those essential services, and we're gonna have some tough questions about service delivery over the next two to three years. We also have to start planning for um, a bunch of measures that are going to um, uh, unfortunately reach their maturation point at the same time. We've got the original Measure O, the public safety Measure O coming up in 2024, and that's timed exactly with um, the, the expiration of the gift the voters gave us last November, uh, almost, almost coinciding with that, with uh, the additional $9 million per year they've given us to do the organizational uh, adjustments that we need to do so that we're not depending on that quarter cent sales tax measure that just passed. Um, and then um, I think the other thing is to ensure that we're communicating and engaging with our, our constituents effectively. One of the things that's come out of this process, and again, we're threading it together, uh, I may be actually bending some rules about what people can and can't do to make sure this happens, but I think you've seen the benefit of this collaborative team effort, um, which we can only uh, codify. You're seeing it happening in the planning department. I, I have listened in this chamber as council and members of the public have talked about how notification and community conversations have evolved. That work is a work between teams and we need to bring those teams together, and so they're really actively working for the same common goal. And also, the, 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 I think the proof was in the pudding with what happened on the community conversations around the Coffee Park Master Plan. Again, it was a concerted effort to get that kind of engagement and that kind of communication going on. And by that turn, as other things come up, we'll be able to be platformed for that conversation moving forward. I think, if we switch back to 30, the 30 slide, you know, that's why we need to, to focus on community programs and engagement. They work with a message. We actually have a tool that helps us out there that the Violence Prevention Partnership has worked on that looks at areas of need within the city. What we need to do is figure out how to take that tool and adopt it into decision making moving forward. So we're making decisions not just uh, on, on, on criteria that include the need that have been outlined and the challenges that the community is facing, so we're addressing those holistically. 
uh, on the Director of Communications and Government Relations, you know, that was clearly, clearly a challenge for us in the last disaster, not having a, a chief PIO, not being able to staff that, um, not being able to support that. I think the th things that I referenced earlier are benefits of that. Uh, we're, we're having an unprecedented way of communicating, and other people may have, other organizations may have received awards for their work. We continue to do the work without seeking the awards. I don't usually get that blunt about it, but I will say this team has worked really hard, and we need to codify this team, and we need to make sure the team is supported, and the, and the individuals who are managing the team actually have clear responsibilities and clear reporting structure. This will clear this out, clear this issue out. The, there will be a chief PIO, the teams will report to that PIO and we will service the departments that are in need of those services and those messaging. But we're again, we can't be everything for everyone at one time, but I think we can be a more effective team leadership, and some of you have seen firsthand where I'm very concerned about burnout if I don't do some of these realignment steps. So that's one of those places where it was reinforced in the after action report. We made initial steps, but this codifies that and gives us the ability to respond to any issue and make sure our, com our communication is crystal clear. You know, this, is a t this person has been working not just on these issues, but things like welcome home packages, um, working with our state elected officials and our federal elected officials, and we need to support that type of position long term within the organization. But I'm not sure we'd be here um, totally in this environment without substantial savings. And as I said, there's, by making these changes, we've got about $350,000 of, of savings that we're going to be able to apply long term to the organization. So as a benefit of realignment to meet the goals and, and desires of our community, but at the same time, it's a fiscally responsible thing to do in realigning the organization and, and taking the, unfor the necessary cuts and changes as we move forward. And that concludes this part of the presentation. Councilor, are there any questions for the city manager over what he just shared? Seeing none, thank you. Okay, continuing on, the next two slides are just kind of an overview um, of how we're looking in the general fund, so that's kind of setting the table for, for a lot of the discussion today. So um, I think you, Council, had seen this slide before when we did the April workshop, um, but just to remind you, the funding sources are on the left, the funding gaps are on the right, so we have uh, an additional $10 million that we got for six years from the new uh, temporary emergency funds or the new Measure O. Uh, we have unassigned fund balance. We talked to you yesterday about our general fund reserves and we told you that based on this year's budget, we've got about $7 million in additional reserves that we could put into, you know, preferably one-time uses. Uh, we're going to talk next about um, staffing solutions. So again, going back to the discussion we had in January, we'd offered council an opportunity to cut 49 and a quarter FTEs. We've got a new proposal that, that takes that down a little bit, but still provides us a lot of those savings. And those are ongoing savings. Uh, and then we had the pension obligation bond fund uh, dollars that we talked about yesterday, and we, we'd offered council an opportunity to, um, to put that money towards the uh, unfunded liability. And then our gaps there, we have the general uh, policy reserve gap. We don't have a gap right now. We, we've met our 15, 17%. Um, we've got the deficit of $12 million. Uh, and then we've got uh, infrastructure needs that uh, Mr. Nutt talked to you about yesterday. Um, minimum of $3 million was the ask there. Uh, we have uh, uh, resiliency local match needs of about $7 million, uh, really plus. Uh, we have some other uh, uh, infrastructure projects on top of that that we haven't identified funding sources for. Uh, and then the, uh, the pensions, um, we planned, our, our plan is to, it, with council's approval, for put about $4.2 million towards that. And then just this kind of shows how that works out graphically. So you've got that general fund deficit at the top there. And the green boxes and arrows are kind of ongoing sources of revenue. So if you do the staff reductions, that offers, affords you $5 million. You've got $10 million from the, uh, from the new Measure O dollars. 
And then we have uh, one-time money there, those excess reserves, so you could put that towards recovery and resiliency and infrastructure. Uh, and then the one-time money is a $4.2 million in the, in the pension bonds that could go towards the pensions. And that little $3 million uh, at the top there underneath the general fund deficit, that's if you put those reductions and the, and the um, new measure of revenues against the deficit, that leaves you with $3 million that drops down to um, cover those recovery and resiliency and infrastructure boxes. Not a, uh, not a terrible amount of money for for some big ask there, but again, as, as we've kind of reiterated here, um, you know, this is going to be a multi-step process or a multi-year process. So these are things that we'll, we'll try to fund in future years as we have one-time revenues available. So now we're going to move into the uh, proposed Check, reductions. Before you go into that, I think there was one question just about some of those figures. Ms. Combs? On slide 31, um, I'm wondering if you can clarify the heading for funding gaps because it was pretty clear to me after the conversation about infrastructure yesterday that the gap is greater than $3 million. And I find that this slide is misleading. Um, so if perhaps if this could be corrected or come back to us so that it's clear that what you're suggesting is not that these are actual gaps, but that this is the amount of the gap you're proposing we fund. Well, um, possibly, uh, just to make it clear, it concerns me that uh, a person looking at this slide might misunderstand um, what the actual situation is uh, with regard to, to these funding gaps. Absolutely, we'll come back as we, as we revise this presentation and make sure it's clear that this is our proposed solution for a greater, larger issue. We'll find the right okay. terminology to do Either it. Either that or add a column of what the actual gaps are. Thank you. Okay, so this is um, this is a chart that you've seen before. Uh, so in, in the left-hand column there, you've got the reductions that were proposed in FTEs, uh, full-time equivalent positions, by all the departments in the city. So we initially asked for a cut of 49.25 positions for savings of about $6 million. Um, we've gone back and made some adjustments. So in that center column there, you see what the adjusted reductions are by department, and then we, we call out what the changes are in the right-hand column there. So the uh, the reductions um, the reduction adjustments there on the on the far right with the little arrow bullets next to them uh, we we eliminate one director in this and that's uh, as the city manager just talked to you about the reorganization plan uh, that allows us the opportunity to get rid of a director as um, OCE and Rec and Parks roll together uh, under under the ACM. Um, the six firefighters, we uh, thought it was best to put those back as we talked to council in January when we made this proposal. Um, this was the only way that fire could get to uh, any cut levels. Uh, however, we fully realized that there's, uh, that, that there's plans for additional fire stations in the future, so this probably isn't a realistic long-term um, solution to, to get rid of those vacancies. Uh, we're also, uh, uh, PED had offered five um, position cuts, and then we'll talk about these individually, but uh, in, in our plan, we plan to give back an associate civil engineer um, out of these cuts. Uh, we had a number of positions, I think eight positions that were cut in the police department. Two of those were sworn. That was that police sergeant and a police officer. So under this plan, we put those back, but we, we uh, continue to take out the six non-sworn positions. And then we're adding back an accountant in finance. Um, the reason that we did that, we gave up four positions. Uh, as the city manager talked about, um, resiliency is something that we're gonna be tackling in-house uh, with the exit of Ernst & Young. So um, in order to offer us some, uh, some staff um, capacity, we, we'd like to add back that accountant. And then uh, an IT tech is also being added back in. We had originally cut two. Um, this is a position that will be funded 50% uh, water and 50% fire. So we'll go through individual departments here. Uh, the city attorney's up first. These are just done alphabetically. Um, so the city attorney had offered to cut uh, an city, assistant city attorney position. Uh, this is not the chief deputy position. This was a position that was... Uh, it was um, going to be f added for cannabis, um, so that savings would be about $207,000, and then you've got some ancillary savings there of $30,000 that are the cost that go with that, with that position. 
So I, I would like to add the city attorney and I have discussed this position. There may be opportunities as we build some revenue capacity uh, during the course of the years, for example, rental special program to bring this back. So I just want to assure you that we, the city attorney and I have talked about this position specifically because there are potentially needs down the line. But again, we're trying to, you know, every, everybody tries to share in this conversation and unfortunately, we're, we're all, I'm having to take a hit in my office, which is big, and Sue has volunteered this position, but I understand that this was a point of concern before, so um, I, we're all ready to hear that conversation. All right, next is the city manager's office. And again, as the city manager talked to you about in this reorganization plan, the big savings here is from the deputy city manager. Um, there was also an admin secretary that's been vacant for a year. I believe that position actually was moved to another department. Uh, so we called that vacancy within this. And the uh, the note there on the bottom is just that the, the DCM position is the only one within this proposal that's actually a filled position. Finance department, as I mentioned, we'd, uh, we'd made a number of cuts uh, in vacant positions. Um, I'd cut a revenue manager. Uh, we're, looking, uh, we're working with management partners um, in ways to realign our reporting so that we can do without that position. I think that's, uh, I think that's doable. Uh, we also uh, uh, cut down our payroll department. So uh, the way we were structured, we had a supervisor report to a manager with four uh, payroll techs under them. Um, we thought that was a little bit heavy, so we, we eliminated that uh, payroll manager uh, uh, position. Uh, we have not had that for, I think, over a year, and it, it seems to be working out okay. Um, we also got rid of a senior admin assistant and then, uh, and then an accountant. Um, and the accountant, again, uh, the change that you see there is that we're asking under this plan um, as we bring back the, the uh, resiliency work uh, from e y that we add that back for some staff capacity. Fire department, as we mentioned, uh, fire offered up um, six firefighters. Uh, this plan uh, gets rid of that. They'd also offered up three quarter time admin assistant. So current staffing for admin is 4.75 FTE. That just means that more work gets, gets spread out to those uh, remaining FTEs. Housing and community services, we had a um, we had a reduction of, of 1.5. So one of those is a community outreach specialist for the, uh, the old uh, neighborhood revitalization program. Um, that was split between 50-50 between general fund and measure O. So that's uh, one of the eliminations of that vacancy. Uh, and then there's a senior admin assistant in code enforcement that was part-time, half-time that we, that we get rid of that also. So that brings you to that 1.5 reduction. Human resources uh, had, um, had uh, I believe it was management partners it had looked at their their structure uh, a little over a year ago and um, recommended restructuring by which they were able to get rid of a uh, employee services manager position and restructure the way the principal analyst reported now, I think directly to the director. Um, I think that's working out. And then uh, under the non-personnel solutions there, we had talked to council in January about getting rid of the, um, the wellness program just for miscellaneous, not for safety personnel. That was something that the council had directed us to do. So this budget actually reflects a reduction of $150,000 uh, for the wellness program. That's not in the general fund that actually uh, goes through an internal service fund through our risk management fund, but, um, but those, the, uh, that's, those costs are allocated out to departments. So there is, is savings in the general fund. Information technology is um, a little bit different. All of these reductions that we're showing you are not uh, part of the budget that you see. We haven't actually put these changes in there because council told us to freeze these positions when we met in, um, in January. Because of the way that we do the budget, we have to do the internal service funds first, of which information technology is, and internal service funds just provide a business uh, um, uh, service to the departments within the city, so we have to uh, we have to we have to figure out what the rates are that we're charging out from those. So we actually did build those two cuts into um, into information technology, uh, two IT techs that we eliminated, um, and part of the impact from that was going to be uh, longer uh, service times when you have tickets. Um, we've uh, with working with uh, water, IT, and fire department, uh, it. it 
it, uh, we, we want to add back one of those IT tax, and so um, that's one of the proposals as part of, of part of this cut proposal is to actually add back one of those two IT techs that we cut. Planning and economic development uh, originally had five reductions. So if you remember three of those, a building inspector, a city planner, and a program specialist were part of um, the cannabis program. They were added, I think, last year. It might have been the year before, but they were added recently as part of that. Um, and uh, those are vacant. We decided to cut those as part of this program. Uh, there was also a development review coordinator that was cut as part of this. Um, and then we had offered up an associate city planner or PED had offered that up and in discussions with them, we would like to add that um, back in. The cannabis positions, uh, where we are monitoring the revenues that are coming in from that. So if you remember for the general fund, we had um, we had projected we had about two and a half million dollars a year is what we thought we would get from, from cannabis uh, revenues. Um, we haven't realized those numbers. I, I think to date, uh, it's, we're not quite through the end of the fiscal year, but I think we're a little bit over $900,000 uh, in that program. However, there are a number of, um, of uh, retailers, distributors, et cetera, that are they're in the pipeline uh, in, the, in the permitting process. So we actually worked with our consultant at, at Muni um, Services to take a look at that and see what they thought the, the future revenue would be. Um, so they work with PED to decide, you know, what that would look like given what we have in the pipeline, what we have existing. So during this budget cycle, we actually took the revenue from that from 2.5 down to $1.3 million per year is, is what we're normalizing that at. Um, we're in a little bit of uncharted territory here, so that, that could that could turn out to be markedly higher. The, the reason I tell you all that is that is if those revenues uh, are increasing um, in future years, this is something that we could come back to and, and address whether we wanted to add these positions back. Police department, as I said, they had uh, originally offered up eight uh, full-time equivalent positions. Two of those were sworn. It was a, it was a police sergeant and a police officer uh, that was retiring in December. Um, under this plan, we put those two sworn positions back in into the police department. Um, the other uh, positions that they eliminated, they'd gotten rid of a police uh, personnel supervisor that was retiring, that handled recruiting duties and, and management of leaves. Uh, that work would would uh, go back over to the ASL for the department and to other and to an admin analyst. Um, they also eliminated three CSOs, uh, community service officers, uh, under this plan. Uh, one of those was for gra graffiti abatement. So police has been working with uh, two other departments that are also involved in graffiti abatement and, and uh, thought they could get rid of this position. The other two CSOs were actually for patrol. So what that means is that non-emergency calls would actually uh, have increased, uh, increased wait times or service times. Um, they also eliminated a research and program coordinator. Uh, that position is mostly responsible, responsible for analyzing grants. Uh, and a police tech uh, in the in the records um, division, and that will increase to uh, reduce lobby hours. Recreation and parks had an elimination of uh, eight full-time equivalents, and a lot of that is due to uh, the reorg that the city manager talked about. So, so that uh, aligns now with OCE uh, under ACM. So there's uh, some duplication of duties in there that will be eliminated. Uh, rec coordinator um, is eliminated under this. There are two frozen positions right now, uh, but I think that uh, Park and Rec is, is looking at the structure. Um, they, they believe that they can that they can do without that one rec coordinator. There's also four groundskeepers that are eliminated in this. There are six total groundkeepers, I believe. Two of those um, are being are unfrozen, being filled now. Um, and then the four here were actually. Um, uh, the, those those duties were promoted to maintenance workers. So the maintenance workers took that grounds uh, keeper work uh, with them as it, to the maintenance worker level. So it just means that some of the maintenance workers in rec and parks are actually doing some some work that they ordinarily wouldn't do as maintenance workers. The park superintendent is um, is being eliminated under this plan. That's a vacant position. Um, that was actually the city arborist. Uh, senior maintenance workers also um, being being eliminated. This will this will uh, result in increased reliance on contractual services, uh, specifically tree trimming. Uh, and then admin secretary uh, was also eliminated under this. And part of that was that the uh, department went to auto attendance, so uh, phone service is, is a little bit um, it's it's not the human touch anymore. So. 
Transportation Public Works uh, offered uh, 10 full-time equivalent positions uh, for reductions, and I think this is something that they had been um, anticipating for quite some time, uh, just for cuts overall within the general fund budget. Um, so uh, I think uh, most of these positions are, uh, are vacancies. Uh, a deputy director was part of the uh, plan, and this will this will um, be absorbed with the consolidation that'll occur with OCE and and uh, and parks maintenance. Um, there's also a skilled maintenance worker. Uh, so what that leads to is elimination of hours for special events, and particularly the banner program downtown. Um, there were also a number of civil engineering techs, three of those that were eliminated, and that means that survey crews dropped from three to two, something that Director Nutt thinks is, is, uh, is, is doable. There's also a senior admin assistant that was eliminated, um, city surveyor, uh, another senior maintenance worker uh, that addressed roadside and roadway conditions, um, street crew supervisor, uh, and civil engineer tech two in the traffic division. So that is the proposals for the reductions, 39.25 reductions resulting in about $5 million in cuts if the city council is amenable. Thank you. Council, questions? Mr. Eismeyer. Thank you, Mr. McBride. Uh, I'm actually I'm going to jump forward in the presentation just for the question, but if you'd go to slide 50, uh, 56, please. <coughs> So like I said, I know you'll get here to explain it, but I think when we talk about some of the positions that are being put back in at the moment from our previous discussion, and then knowing that this slide is coming up in our discussion, uh, are the cuts, are some of the positions that we are potentially saving from our previous hiring freeze likely to still have to be eliminated next year or the following year to hit a sustainable point? So if I'm understanding your, your question, Vice Mayor, uh, first of all, the cuts that we're talking about here, the $5 million in, in frozen positions, these are not included in this. Um, this, this uh, the expenditure shown here on that orange line don't include those cuts. Um, long term, you know, we, we showed you a $12 million deficit. Uh, we have some additional revenues from the TEF or the new measure O coming in. These cuts help to help to bridge that $12 million gap. But I, I think what you're asking me is, is if this is all the cuts, and I, I don't think I don't think these are. I think we're going to have to, I, I know we're going to have to go back and look at departments and, and see strategically long range what we can cut to to um, to uh, structurally fix this 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 budget deficit. So I don't think we can guarantee that we won't be looking at some of these positions. There are always attrition uh, models that are out there as well. So we, as we go through this conversation, there will probably be openings. Part of the realignment is to get us into these types of conversations about the long-term uh, issuance of these positions. There was a, there was, concern about not moving forward on these on some of these areas and so that's what the staff went back and said where can we move forward we know we're going to have to have other conversations in the future um, you know we haven't we haven't wrestled with the staffing study yet um, for the fire department that's going to be its own conversation when that ripens this allows us to advance these areas but at the same time with the realignment and the question we are going to be in this conversation for for the next few years and there's going to be some difficult conversations about service levels what's the right choice realigning allows us to take some initial hits the five million gets us to a good starting point so we're not spending beyond our means in fact we're actually starting to recruit some savings and gives us some flexibility to take this longer pathway. I think the council just has to realize that this is going to be an ongoing conversation for years. We're not going to, we're not going to take the structural deficit out today. Um, we've got revenue questions at the same time, but conceivably on that list are, are positions that may not um, uh, that, that may not be the final position of, of that person. When we get into any exercises, obviously we're always going to try to find 
a place for someone to land within the organization. But I can't promise that we won't be looking at some of these positions next year. With that in mind, um, we're hiring um, some positions as limited term, not as, 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 as full term positions, because then we can find as we go through and we, we, get, we get a better run, more efficient organization, a good place to place those individuals within the organization. Yeah, and you're hitting it. It's really two questions. The first is, does this get us sustainable for now? The answer is yes. The other question is, does this make us sustainable long term? I'm hearing no. And then I guess the third question is, does this make us sustainable long term without the emergency measure that the voters approved? And that's an absolutely not. That would be so, correct. Uh, what I'm hearing is that this gets us through this year, but we still have we still have to figure out $10 million worth of reductions over the course of the next five years to make sure that we keep the promise to voters to get rid of the, the emergency measure. And to, to your point, Council Member, this is actually, we're actually asking to take a cut this year. I mean, that's, you know, to, to, to you know, I think that was the point that we can, there's some additional one-time revenues that would come out of that cut that then we can apply to some urgent one-time needs that are coming through, either that's through the, the asset infrastructure conversation or frankly, our local match requirements. Yeah, no, I get that. And I do appreciate having talked with Mr. McBride, understanding that he treats the new Measure O as uh, one-time funding that happens to come in for five years uh, instead of just trying to build the budget around that. I do appreciate that. Uh, if you could talk a little bit about the cannabis positions. Uh, I know you mentioned that there are quite a few projects that are in the pipeline. Have we been able to develop sort of the sweet spot between putting resources in to get them up and running and understanding what to expect from tax revenue coming in, because this is an area that the council has talked quite a bit about where uh, upfront investment might have an opportunity to long-term help us uh, with our budget situation. And as you can see, Mr. Gouins coming down to answer that question. Good, ap Good afternoon, David Gouin, Director of Planning and Economic Development. Good morning, sorry. Um, the, uh, the question about staffing and front, front loading is a good one. Uh, right now, because we haven't seen the revenue come in and we based those positions off that revenue coming in to support them, we've been using existing planning staff to do that work. So as you could imagine, we have all sorts of projects, housing projects, business projects, hotels, other things coming in, and cannabis. So we're using the staff we have and any additional revenue that we can um, see come in through permit fees and putting that towards consultants and existing staff to try to get this work done. Uh, but we know it does um, add to the mix um, and it does add to the overall volume of work that's coming through that department, um, but we're doing it with consultants and staff that we have currently available. Okay. Uh, and then Mr. McBride, well, I guess this is also city manager. Uh, one of the programs you mentioned was graffiti abatement. I'm gonna use that as an example. In the Open Government Task Force report, one of the recommendations was for the city to figure out a way to utilize volunteers throughout the community, uh, both from a community engagement cost saving perspective. Graffiti abatement, again, sounds like one of those things where if we invested a little bit of time in developing the volunteer apparatus, that we would be able to continue to deliver those services with help. Have we looked into that at all? Well, I think I think what you're seeing is an understanding that we're going to need to, you know, we're going to need to address the problems in different ways. And again, part of the realignment conversation comes with some of these questions, like what are what are we actually able to do? I mean, part of this is that some of these services have been split between three departments, and it's been a hodgepodge approach to this. We really need to understand what the issue is, and again, are there innovative solutions? to getting to the finish line. Is there a third party we might be, or a not-for-profit we might be able to work with? I don't know. I think that those are all legitimate questions and things that we can now, in this new way of, of operating, actually begin to answer some of those questions more fully. So I, I think that's our goal. You're gonna see in specific budget presentations the ramping up of some community-oriented positions, especially a, a, a limited-term position in, in the fire department that's exactly around building um, uh, community conversations, COPE, CERT, 
but also working with businesses so that they've got evacuation plans and general community education. We have longer term event horizon with that position as it relates to um, the JPA I referenced yesterday and hopefully that'll be stood up and some of those responsibilities might be folded under a regional umbrella um, and so that we're all speaking the same language. That's one of the challenges right now. But so we're, we're thinking in those sort of stepping stone terms. But to back to that question, that's exactly some of the things that we want to be able to answer. Where is volunteer power that we could use um, to address some of these needs? Or are there other, other avenues where we can um, contract with local agencies to, to get to the finish line on some of these issues? Yeah, I appreciate that. I know that there is uh, some of that happening. Uh, you know, I, we signed up for a softball team went through the Reckon Parks uh, softball program and they put out the call for volunteers to come and help maintain the playing surfaces and I, they did that I think it was last weekend that they had folks come out there. But then I also know community groups are already trying to do this as well. I know that the West End neighborhood is doing a bocce court cleanup this weekend because they want to use the courts and, and they're not properly maintained. So I do see that there's capacity for us to do that. It would be helpful if we would engage with those groups and be a part of it. Other questions? Ms. Combs? Thank you. Um, and I think this might uh, involve Director Gouin again, uh, so you may want to not jump out of that hot seat. Um, it, it may be that it's Transportation and Public Works, but I think it's been shifted. Um, so I'm looking at the data we received yesterday on uh, Parks and Recreation, and that data from the National Recreation and Park Association effectiveness ratios indicated that our FTEs for parks uh, is at 4.3, where the national average is at 10.5. So, um, and we have, what, $50 million of deferred maintenance within our park system. I am uh, looking at uh, four park workers uh, are roughly equal to two police officers in our budget. So, and I didn't receive data yesterday on how significantly understaffed our police department was. And I'm willing to believe everyone is stretched, but I'm betting the police department is not working at half of the national average. And I'm trying to figure out, and I appreciate that there are many conversations about what core services are and what they mean. Uh, but I think that we're really missing something if we uh, don't recognize that having people doing maintenance in our parks, uh, our eyes on the park, are providing uh, deterrence to crime, are, uh, are helping us to maintain our, uh, our, so, our parks. So, our, so I'm, I'm keenly aware of having had this conversation a long time uh, being really pleased that we got park workers funded and then they were not filled. And well, there was, a, again, there were a lot of positions frozen in the budget. I don't want to isolate parks, but as you saw yesterday, also, Council Member, there are, we have a deficiency across our public works portfolio in terms of the require, the number of people that should be servicing even our facilities versus the yes. what, what's a requirement. It's significantly documented with regard to parks and we continue to cut parks. And we've been the first one to point to that issue. I think the thing that I'm gonna let Kelly and Jason respond to maybe some short-term and long-term conversations, but remind council that unfortunately, we're gonna, we're gonna be engaging in a conversation about an additional resource specifically for parks um, we have some some uh, hurdles to go through and some verification on how that resource, but remember there is Measure M coming up into the summer. So why um, would we cut positions now that are not filled when we have Measure M funds? Because coming we, that may help us we are trying to figure, figure out how to do those positions, but I, I'm just putting it out there that we are going to have another conversation in the summer, but we have to make cuts somewhere. And, and again, so what we will need if we're not gonna take the cuts here is where would be an acceptable place to take those additional reductions. Well, and I, then think I, I think I just said instead of, instead of putting back 
to police officers, I think it may make sense for us to support our Parks Department. And I appreciate that that is an incredibly difficult decision to make politically. But it is also likely in the long run to cause a reduction in the need for the police officers because we will have effective parks programs that are a deterrent and to have eyes in the parks. It's a cheaper method of solving a problem in our parks. So I'm just gonna jump in quickly and talk about Measure M. One of the challenges we have is we need to be able to do strategic investment. Um, the measure specifically states we can't supplant for positions. That doesn't mean we can't repurpose positions with a new strategic investment that furthers the cause of park maintenance and park management. So those are the things that we're gonna be discussing among the group and bringing back to council is, is how can we develop a potentially a, a, a targeted or different program where, where it may incorporate additional staff members or it may incorporate uh, different products that we're gonna be implementing into the, into the parks. I, I will say, if we're going to attract people to our community, businesses, et cetera, we really need to have that quality of life factor there. This is a piece of economic development as well. So we have a safety element, we have an economic development element. Our parks do tremendous things for our community. And we keep not putting personnel there. Again, all I can say is part of the realignment is to actually have us support each other mutually. Unfortunately, we were in conversations, we still remain in conversations about whose, um, for lack of a better term, turf a particular item is. And unfortunately, we can't have that conversation move forward. We gotta collapse our resources, so. We are not actually saving money by doing this because the positions are not filled and have not been filled for some time. So I'm trying to figure out why we're taking it as a cost savings when in fact we're not spending that money. And I'm hearing you say that there will be some positions that will be doing some of these when the new monies are coming in. I think and that's what I heard. And we're going so through a realignment. So then we just come back and do the paperwork all over again to reestablish these positions. Uh, I Council member, we, we can, I, I, you, you know, we, we won't necessarily be, as you heard the, the Jason, Jason say, we're not gonna be establishing the same position. We're gonna be looking at a new way of doing business. I'd just like to clarify so, too, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, council member, go ahead. Do, I, I guess part of what I also would like to have made clear is when we're in the process of shifting something from being in-house that we provide, and when we're making the shift to um, contracting out services. So if, is, if the, I guess I wanna make, make clear each of the steps on the way through when we're making a decision that instead of having employees, we're contracting the service out. Is this a position, set of positions where the plan is to contract services instead? I'm just asking that because I wanna keep that in, in my mind also. There's, there's a tendency uh, when we talk about 21st century models to talk about contracting out instead of keeping it in-house. So I just wanna make sure I understand that too. Hi, I'll try to jump in here, Kelly Magnuson. Thank you, Thank you Kelly. <laughs> Interim Recreation and Parks Director. Um, a couple things, um, just to clarify, we have six vacant groundskeeper positions. We are going to be filling two of them this summer. Okay. We also have a plan to help out we have a recruitment going on for a seasonal worker park aid position and we're hiring several of those right now to fill in. We also have a program we're going to be working on to hire more permit monitors. Those, those are seasonal folks that will be out helping with event monitoring, sports field monitoring, picnic area monitoring. It is difficult to hire seasonal people uh, at that level, but we do have some and we wanna expand that program a little bit. Um, the six groundskeepers that were hired when uh, those positions were, were uh, created several years ago, um, let's see, four or all six of them were promoted to maintenance worker, which created this the six vacancies. So the four vacancies are what, are, is on the board to be eliminated today. 
but we do have some plans to help fill in those blanks. And, and I'm not saying it's not gonna hurt us, but we're, we're trying to expand, we're trying to partner with volunteer groups. Um, as and, and I understand that and very much appreciate it. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to hear that we're hiring in the fire department so that we can expand that kind of volunteer coordination in the fire department. So I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not, a, 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 I'm liking that. I'm just, perhaps it would help me if we had a conversation at some point in the future uh, with regard to what our goals are for staffing in the parks department uh, in a way that uh, recognizes the needs of the Parks Department and the desire of our community to have a well-functioning Parks Department. We God, seem so. to regularly have conversations about the Parks Department that involve the elimination of services. And I'm, I appreciate that, that uh, some, members may, some, some members of the public may think that it's not a core function, but I view it as a core function within our community. Well, I, and, and, and we absolutely want to get into those conversations, not just for Rec and Parks, but for the entire organization. So, so yes, we, we, will, we will be back with that conversation. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we, in our general plan, we have very specific policies and goals about how many parks per thousand people uh, within the city, but we don't have as a standard process or a, or a standard threshold for how many employees we have in order to maintain those right. parks. It, and and that's, so that's what continues to fluctuate. And without having a standard to, to be able to target and to say that that's what we're going to go towards, it makes it very difficult for us to yeah. um, not incorporate cuts like this uh, into our proposal. The, the four point three FTEs where the national average is 10.5 per 10,000 is a shocking number. And it means that the folks who are doing our parks work now are doing amazing job. I mean, they're doing more than twice the load. And, and I would also say that's part of the reference that you saw yesterday. You know, we need to assess these assets too. That's one of the first things we want to do with the new resources so that we get a real understanding of what it's going to take to maintain these assets and what the strategies are moving forward. They, we have to do a better job understanding what we own and how we're going to manage it. I, I am, as I sit here now, still listening, um, understanding the need to cut possibly four FTEs there. I am not understanding the need to cut eight. So it's, I don't think you need to answer. I'm, I'm telling you that personally, I would not be willing to cut eight FTEs there. Um, just to add in, I will say that there are a couple of positions that, that the consolidation of park maintenance and uh, street maintenance, we were actually able to cover a number of the, a couple of those vacancies. Um, it's, the, it's the groundskeeper positions that are, are the hardest to, to cover. And they're very inexpensive positions relative to the other, a lot of other positions within the, our budget. So it, it, we get a lot of bang for our buck when we have somebody who's in the park doing maintenance work and keeping an eye on how it's going, getting to know who stays in the park and who doesn't and who's new and who isn't and who causes trouble and who doesn't. I, I know that our park maintenance workers do that and, and I consider that a very helpful. Thank you. I, I think I made my point, but I'm, I, I may not get my way, but I can make my point. Thank you. Other questions, Ms. Fleming? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So my questions are around um, being strategic in terms of how we, we do and don't cut these programs. What I'm trying to figure out here, specifically on cannabis and permitting um, with both legal and, um, yeah, probably back over here. So um, so are we um, having situations where people are applying for permitting and they're being held up um, in any way because we haven't built that staff position either on the legal side or on the PED side? So Councilmember Fleming, the, the short answer to that is that things are moving forward, probably not as fast as individuals are hoping. Um, we, to uh, Vice Mayor's point, 
it's, it's a front end investment that we're having to make. And what we're doing right now is utilizing fees that come in for people to do that work, trying to access those fees, put that money to consultants or existing staff to get that project moving. Um, it is not moving as quick as possible because we don't have additional staff to move it through. Um, we just, for example, yesterday we opened up the doors, or Monday we opened up the doors for retail again, and we received, tw I think, was it 24 new applications um, that are coming in over the next few months that so we have to schedule and get them moving. So um, that's another body of work that we're having to manage with, with existing staff on top of everything else. So it, it will slow things down, um, but we're, again, we're trying to utilize that fee revenue to put towards consultants. Uh, to help us move that forward as fast as we possibly can. All right, so what I'm wondering here is, are we going to, are the revenue projections that Director McBride provided us with going forward, are they downwardly adjusted in large part because we are not fully funding this service and further, you know, are we signaling to our business community that we're going to change course on something that we had made a priority to invest in? And then we change that, and, and it takes a long time to hire planners and hire good attorney, good legal staff. So you know, it seems awfully early in the process to be changing course. Yeah, I think it's a combination of two things on the delay. One is um, the industry itself is, is struggling getting through both the state and local permitting processes and, and learning the process. Uh, we're also um, finding that um, it's been a learning experience for some of the cannabis industry to implement and actually go through the building permit process in the way that most businesses do. Um, we've streamlined that quite a bit. Um, we're to the point now we're holding, uh, because of our staffing levels, uh, we're holding pre-application meetings with individuals and actually doing uh, one almost over-the-counter permit uh, review with some of the retail sites to try to make sure that, that we're utilizing our staff the best way possible, but also expecting that people are coming in with good work. Um, so so it's, we're, we're, we're trying to utilize the best we can. We understand the, the, the revenue projections um, are not going to be realized until those businesses are up and operating. And so we recognize that and we're trying to get them moving as quick as possible once they get the approval from the Planning Commission, any appeals, um, and get them up and going as quick as possible. And then my additional concern is about um, freezing or eliminating uh, unfilled vacancies both in, in your department and in the city attorney's department. About how long does it take? I've, I've had the pleasure of working with a number of staff in, in both departments and they're clearly very professional and, and hard to come by staff at that level. About how long does it take to fill one of those positions? When it, for, a, for a planning position, uh, we see it takes, uh, it's, a, it's a good three to six months by the time we can find somebody and get them up and running. running. And I would say a similar time frame, probably on the more in the six month um, time frame for uh, engaging an attorney. They often have to appropriately give uh, extended notice to their current employer. So, and again, then you're talking about learning curves once often once folks get in the job. If council wants us to go back and look how we can do short term injections, part of the reason we've 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 worked the way we have is to be reflexive to the to the business needs. We'd be willing to go back and look to um, uh, do some additional work with um, consulting services because that again that's why we structured this department the way we did. When, when I got here, the department was on life support, quite frankly, I didn't understand it. I was asking the similar questions you were, council member. Um, but you always have to, you have to ride these ebbs and flows. The, the, the industry tells us that we're gonna be rolling in, in money. Around the state, I will say that those, those projections are not as, as realized as folks do for a lot of the conversations that, that you heard from the director. So, but what I think we can be willing to do is when we come back in the final plan is look how we make sure that there's some additional resource free, if council so desires, of one-time investment to, to, to make sure we're getting over this particular, particular hurdle. So I, I, if that's the desire um, and, and the, the, that's a general desire from the body, we can look at that um, part of the conversation and that would be, I think, staff's recommendation because that is actually what made us successful to respond to business needs. What it is, is sort of understanding as the director, as Director Gouin said, we're trying to track where that business is coming in. That's why we went back out and did another study um, with, um, 
with the consulting firm to try to better understand what's going on in the state, what's going on locally, so we can revise those projections. But hearing the concern, if that's the council's desire, we'll come back in the final budget with some proposed contract services so we can get that work going right now. And to follow up on that, um, in your mind, <clears throat> uh, are contract services the only way to manage this, this need? Uh, this is the way this is, department has been successful to, to have a core group of team and then we contract out as we see business bumps come up so we can deal with it without taking on the long-term liabilities associated with certain permanent staff. Right. My, my concern about that is that, you know, we have really great in-house staff and we have some great consultants who are able to help us and this seems to be a fairly, I understand that it may be a temporary thing, but it's also a fairly sensitive thing. And to get it done right and to work out some of the structural issues is, is very important. And so I'm wondering. But, but I think the counter is what you heard is by the time we would hire that staff and get them up to speed, we were talking could be six, nine months, which I think the issue that folks are facing are the critical now wanting to jumpstart with 20 new businesses coming in the door. Our quickest way to do that and then evaluate to see if we need to do something more permanent and we can get those revenues to rise is to contract for that service, meet the immediate need, and then do an assessment after that to see what we need to do long term if those funds are, are sustainable. And I do appreciate um, the, the notion of us being nimble and flexible and able to respond to business and industry in a way that doesn't encumber us in the long run. But I do want to express my support and appreciation for our city staff and the work that they do and that you know my desire is to long term invest in, in people who are with our organization and have the protections therein, as well as provide predictability for all of our industries. Thank you. Any other questions? I just have some comments, just as um, hearing what my colleagues are saying, this is the third time we've had this conversation. I've got one question for you, Dave, just to reaffirm. Um, it's the third time we've had these discussions and having been on that side of the table when we have to do cuts, you know, the subject matter experts of staff capacity are the folks who have presented this. And going back, even if one of our goals was, you know, let's make what's going on in room six, let's say we want that for the rest of the community from now on. I'm guessing one of the responses would be that we need to hire fill in the number of personnel that we, we would need there, which I'm guessing from our uh, CFO would say, that's in conflict with the financial stability that is a tier one priority for us. So it's that constant balance. And again, this is the third time and I, I'm, I'm just very hesitant. You know, I, I'm appreciative of what you've done and supportive. You took, heard some feedback after I think our second session made these adjustments, you presented it to us here. Um, and I'm just very cautious to say, start tweaking it some more because looking at the system as a whole, you are the subject matter experts who are saying this is what we think we can do, like what Director Nutt said about, yeah, we're combining different departments. Unless you're actually in the weeds knowing how they're doing it, they know what they're talking about and just being supportive of that. And I'm just very cautious as we move through this, if we start uh, do a position here, put priority on this department versus this department, it, it, it's a tough position to be in. So my one qu question for you, uh, Mr. Gerlin, was, with the cannabis retail open, open door, I think that started Monday, right? Does that door close soon? And is it the, uh, can you share with me the capacity of your department with this unknown? So the decision was to open the door and, and not close it. So at this point, uh, we've, we've eliminated the competition element of what we've seen in the past. Um, at this point, we saw an immediate rush of individuals that want to get in to identify sites because once the site's been identified, that establishes the buffer that establishes how many can go in in that area. So what we're probably going to see is a normalization of these permits over time. That's the whole hope and goal of opening the doors and not closing them again, is this will normalize and we'll start to see a normal flow as business um, op opens and closes like a typical process. So we think that uh, this initial rush will obviously take resources and staff time. Um, we're, we're working to all of our planners to try to give every planner a little bit so we don't um, um, take over all one planner completely. Um, but over time, we're gonna have to figure out our staffing model. But it, realistically, what will happen is that business will fall in line with all the rest of the businesses, a restaurant, a, a grocery store, a hotel, anything else, will, it'll be in line when it comes in the door and it'll work through the system um, just like any other permit. 
Okay, and then um, just for the city managers process-wise, because I know each of the department heads and everyone in the city is trying to anticipate the future. So we have X number of dollars we need cut for our financial stability. Slide 56 shows you know the deficit um, increasing. What role does a mid-year budget adjustments play in what if we got a little bit wrong with predicting the future? Well, I think we've we've established a track record that we do come back. We've had that several times where there have been significant variances in the mid-year and we've brought back for council consideration what to do about that. I think uh, if we're seeing significant variances in the pro, we're gonna be coming back to say, this is how you deal with your structural issues, um, quite honestly. If we're seeing in the negative, we might be re resetting. Um, right now, um, it's unknown. There's some anxiety about the general economic forecast. I, I share that anxiety. Um, uh, because it seems like in D.C. there's uh, a change a minute of going on and what's, what, what, what's going to be the local driver. So I, I, I you know, if we're seeing significant um, um, slippage in sales tax, that would be one of the reasons we'd be back in front of this council asking for a revision of current expectations. And that would also go to from the actual operations if whether it be police, fire, rec, and park, yep. uh, any of those departments, if the impacts are unacceptable from a staff or community perspective, you come back mid yeah, absolutely. term and say, here's the adjustments we're recommending. Absolutely. Okay, great, thank you. Mr. McBride, if you continue slide 46, I think. Yeah, and I would just like to, um, to add to, to this discussion a little bit. One of the things that we've been ex examining, particularly with um, uh, planning economic development is ways that we have at during the year uh, to actually expand their budgets if we need to because they they kind of some of their revenue sources are, are really up and down depending on what's going on with permitting and building and all that kind of stuff so um, we're, we're exploring a model if we can if we can write into the budget resolution this year where we can actually um, increase their contractual services uh, if we have increases in in those in those kind of revenue sources so that's that's one of the things we're, we're looking at to give them some relief in that area. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think I've asked a couple of times, maybe more subtly, not maybe as outright as I'm asking this time, that uh, we get a staffing that shows the peaks and balances and what the appropriate staffing level would be so that we understand what percentage or how many or how much we need to spend. I appreciate that those are widely varying cycles, but I know mathematically that, you know, I, I keep saying root mean square as if it means something to anybody. Um, it, it, it's possible to predict a little bit how much staffing is a, is a good staffing level within the context of a varying uh, set of requests. And we don't ever get that information from you. And I appreciate one of my, my the, the mayor's comments that you all are the subject matter experts and we should trust you. Um, my concern is that you are under a great deal of pressure to show reductions because we have this problem. And we're in the position of needing to understand how much the service will be diminished by the reduction. And that information does not typically come with the packet we get. So we aren't able to balance service reduction with staffing reductions because we aren't given the quality of service reduction. So without understanding the quality of service reduction, we're left questioning what your decisions are. And I appreciate that we should trust you, but our job is to be representative of our community and its needs and wants. Often we need and want things we can't afford, but we have to represent that to you. And uh, I appreciate the hard work this is for all of us on both sides of the table. Um, but I do want to receive at least from the planning department, an understanding of at what point are we hiring somebody instead of continuing to contract it out? And what is the service level reduction um, that we're going to experience in this department, in the parks department? Uh, you know, have we experienced a service reduction in other departments? Are we fully staffed in other departments? Are we increasing? 
feels like we're increasing staffing in departments that already have, in many ways, re re met their 2008 staffing cuts, have been returned whole, and yet we are continuing to reduce departments that did not meet their 2008. And I understand that 2008 is gone. We have created a new model of uh, how the city is going to move, that 2008 is maybe not a good measure anymore, but I'm not understanding when is a department staffed to provide the services at the service level we anticipate. And I'm not seeing that data here. So uh, that's causing me difficulty. And, and I, appreciate, uh, I appreciate that this is very hard work to do. Uh, I think I've suggested uh, not just today, but in the previous two times this came before us, that it bothered me that we were continuing to cut parks. Um, so, be that as it may, I, I can count. Thanks. So, so, so I, I hear you. I will say that that would be a, a, to do that kind of quantification and tracking would be a major workload in and of itself. And um, I will say, this team and this team. When I say this team, I mean from every level of the organization is constantly MacGyvering their way into solution sets to prov to try to provide service levels that the, the community be finds acceptable, but it is a challenge to answer that question when we are uh, constantly trying to perform a level of task that would require a level of analysis. Some organizations do invest in that, but that's a discrete team doing that sort of measurement work. And so if council wants that, we're gonna have to invest in that work to, to do that work. Mr. Mr. Mayor, uh, if, if I may, I just want to make a couple comments as well. Uh, I came onto the council in 2008, uh, and I don't think I've ever I've gone through a process of the budget process where it was fun and exciting. Uh, I came in during the recession. Uh, Councilmember Sawyer has been on much longer, and I don't know if he recalls any time when it was really a lot of fun. There might have been times in the past where we were able to pass budgets, where we were able to have things that were nice to have, not necessarily just things we absolutely needed. I, I remember those days as an employee, but having uh, lived and survived through the recession and remembering that we made significant cuts back then to make things work. And I know that departments have been busting their butts to make things work ever since. Uh, so I think we need to put that in perspective and that we've already gone through a lot of cuts and we've, made, we've done a lot of retooling of the organization as well to try to meet the needs. Um, and there's, we always seem to be having a problem that we can't avoid and, and we continue with that, whether it's a fires, whatever the case may be. And these, these cuts and the budgets will continue to be difficult and I think we need to appreciate that. But I think we need to, I, I guess my point is putting things in perspective as to where we've been and where we're heading. It's hard to predict what's gonna happen next. Uh, hopefully someday we'll be back on our feet. We have uh, uh, local tax measures that are helping us to get by. You know, we, we have to have those to be able to get by and try to uh, close some gaps, but it's, it's not gonna be easy. Uh, so again, I just wanted to put that in perspective that there have already been a lot of cuts that have been made um, and, and sacrifices, but the workload continues. It's still a heavy workload on our staff. And I think we need to appreciate the staff that is doing that. And I too appreciate the work that our departments are doing as far as being those subject matter experts in some of these things. There does have to be some level of trust in there too. Uh, I, I don't see a big raid here in trying to, to overtake uh, major budgets from different departments because we have significant needs, uh, whether they're public safety, the things we're doing as, as it relates to our council goals. Uh, but I, I just, again, my point is as we move forward uh, today, and maybe beyond is to put things in perspective where, we, where we've been, where we are, and of course, hopefully where we could be someday, but it's gonna be, uh, it's still a long haul to get there. Thank you. All right, now we'll move into an overview of the uh, proposed uh, budget for the city. So here you see a revenue breakdown by fund. Uh, on the top there's general fund revenues, and um, we've actually seen a big change. $18.9 million in revenues uh, for 1920. And remember, we kind of discussed this at the April workshop. Some of that is um, 
ongoing revenues that we've added back in. So we cut about $5 million out of the previous budget, thinking that we'd see big downturns in those major revenue sources from the fires. Those didn't materialize us. Those revenue sources are actually still pretty, pretty stable. Uh, and then we continue to have some one-time monies coming in. So, um, so general fund revenues are, are up uh, about 11%. The enterprise funds, um, that includes everything from uh, water to stormwater, wastewater, uh, the golf fund is in there, um, the parking uh, department is, is in there also, and revenue sources there are uh, also up about 5%. Um, special revenue funds went up by $4.2 million or 17.5%, so um, part of that increase of the $4.2 million there is that additional $1.9 million that we're uh, getting from the new Measure M for parks. Also includes the old Measure M for streets and then uh, Measure O, again, the, the old Measure O uh, that, uh, that is for um, fire, police, and, and VPP. Uh, housing Authority has gone up uh, markedly, $7.4 million, about 22% increase, and we'll talk about that with their departmental budget, but a lot of that's due to HUD Section 8. Uh, they've seen, seen about 25% increase there, so that's gone up uh, on the revenue side. And then the successor agency to the RDA, that's just the wind-up of our uh, formal redevelopment agency. We still um, have debt service on, on two bonds outstanding, so we're receiving money from the, from the successor agency, and we're, we're servicing those two uh, bond issues. And I think uh, I think the last of those bond issues will mature in 2034. So we still have a number of years um, on the wind up. Uh, expenditures by fund type, uh, general fund expenditures have gone up five million dollars or 3.1 percent in this budget. Um, again, that does not include the discussion on the cuts that we just had. Um, that's just kind of a status quo budget. A lot of that, as you would imagine, we have two and a half percent COLAs that uh, were, were, were built into that um, uh, per the MOUs. So that's a lot of what's driving that $5.2 million increase. Uh, enterprise on the operating side, uh, expenses are almost flat at 1.7%. Um, the CIPs, capital improvement programs for the enterprises are down $40 million or 56%. A, a lot of that is um, because we did not have the large uh, uh, cleanup project or the cleanup project for water. Um, the elimination of those, uh, those toxins wasn't as expensive as we'd anticipated in the budget. Non-enterprise CIP, capital improvement program, uh, that's up by five and a half million dollars. I'm not gonna go into that detail now because at the end of the day, uh, Director Nutt's gonna give you a presentation on the capital improvement program, so we'll talk to that in detail at that point. Uh, special revenue funds, those ones that we mentioned, um, uh, pretty much flat uh, at 3.4%. And again, a lot of that is staff time that, that, is, uh, that is where you see that two and a half percent COLA increase. Um, and then we have other, other funds. Uh, the other funds are mostly debt service. Uh, we have debt service in there, and then we have the special assessment district and it's in there comprise those um, funds. So those are almost uh, totally flat. Uh, housing Authority is up by 10.4%, or I'm sorry, $10.4 million or 31%. Uh, and again, um, that's, that's mostly due to the, to the increase that they've seen in Section 8. Uh, and then the successor agency, the RDA, is, is just a wind-up fund, so that's flat. So this is how it breaks out um, pictorially. So you got 431.4 million total expenditures. Uh, um, you've got that split out. Uh, fires 11%, uh, housing community services 11%, police is 15% of that citywide budget. Water's 33%, those are really the big ones. Administration there is 8%. We kind of glob together a lot of things um, like uh, city council, city manager's office, uh, OC, the attorneys, finance, HR, into that, uh, into that category. And then um, non-departmental is kind of those things. It's, it's a very small portion of the budget, but those are kind of the things that we can't fit into any department. So there are things like our contract with the animal shelter or we pay the county admin fees for administration of our property taxes. So those go into that category. So now we'll start breaking down into the general fund, which is, is really our focus for today. Um, so by category, uh, you can see what the differences are here. First of all, property tax um, came in very strong last year. Uh, when we met with you in April, we had revised our estimates and we taken those up markedly. Um, however, uh, part of that was about $2 million we got in two years of, of backfill for property tax. So taking out that one-time source, that's why you see a little bit of a drop of $1 million next year because we don't anticipate getting that one-time source again. Uh, sales tax, um, 
That's going up by $8.2 million. Again, a lot of that is due to the uh, TEF or the new measure O, so we didn't have that before, so that's built into the budget now. Um, but uh, sales tax is one of those ones that we talked about yesterday with the reserves as a more volatile source. We are seeing with our last meeting with Muni Services some, um, some market downturns in, in, in new auto sales. So we're keeping an eye on sales tax. That probably I'm anticipating won't be as strong going forward, especially if we hit an economic downturn. Utility users tax is uh, pretty much stable. That's one of the ones that we took down by a million dollars in anticipation of lost revenues from the fire. That didn't materialize. Uh, the UUT say, uh, almost identical to what it was. So we're just anticipating that continues that trend next year. Uh, vehicle license fees are staying, um, are staying uh, totally stable. Other taxes is a mix. One of those things being transient occupancy tax, TOT. We expect that to, to uh, remain strong in the coming years. We've also got the real property um, transfer tax that's built into there of uh, $4 million and business taxes of about $4.5 million in that other tax category. Permits, fines, and charges, you see that's going down by about 6.2 million, um, and a lot of that uh, was kind of, uh, I think, one-time activity related to fire rebuilds, so we anticipate that that'll start slowing down a little bit in the coming year and, and bring that down by about 30%. And then the um, interfund charges are, uh, are is comprised of a bunch of things. A lot of that, when you see the departmental budgets, you're going to see this general fund admin fee that's charged to them. So that's for some of the services that we do, like payroll that we that we through the through the cost allocation plan we charge out to these different departments. Um, some of that also is real charges, like utility billing. So my department does utility billing, but that function is actually done for uh, water wastewater water utilities. So we actually um, we actually charge those. Uh, charge those funds for that service. Uh, recreation revenues are pretty much totally stable. Uh, if you factor in that 2.5% COLA, they're 2.9%, um, that's really flat line. And then intergovernmental uh, governmental interest and other, a lot of that decrease that you see is because we got one-time funds in last year from FEMA, um, so uh, we don't expect those one-time funds again, at least just going into the uh, general fund. They may be earmarked for, for other purposes. And again, just breaking this down graphically, the revenues by category for the general fund, we plan to anticipate taking in $178.7 million. Um, big chunk of that, 16% uh, comes from property tax, which, which is kind of unique about the city of Santa Rosa, I think, is, is we actually take in more, 35% of our revenues from sales tax, um, which is our, which is, uh, which is unusual um, and, and good. That it, it gives us a lot of diversification. Uh, utility users tax about 6%, this vehicle license fees about 8%, um, recreation revenues about 2%, interfund charges that we talked about about 8%, permits, fines, and charges about 8%. So general fund expenditures by department, we're gonna start um, delving into departments now. Uh, administration, again, we kind of uh, uh, conglomerated city council, city manager's office, OC, city attorneys, human resource and finance per the note at the bottom there. Um, those are, those are uh, expenditures staying relatively flat, just $100,000 increase in those. Uh, housing community services uh, uh, is going up by about 10.5%. Um, and again, this is just the general fund portion of housing community services. They also have the housing authority fund, so that's just a, a small portion of their budget. Uh, the fire budget is um, anticipated to go up by $3 million um, and about 7.5%. So again, if council remembers, in this last year, we uh, we uh, negotiated with fire on a contract that expired in 17 years. So there was some base building as part of those negotiations. So that's why you see that large 7.5% increase there. That's uh, primarily in, in salaries, compensation. Planning economic development, uh, relatively flat at 4%. Police are very flat at 1.5%. Uh, Reckon Parks, again, flat, $100,000 increase, very small increase in Reckon Parks. Uh, and, and just to kind of reiterate, as we've gone through this budget process this year, the departments were asked to hold budgets uh, uh, as flat as they could while we kind of wrestled with this structural deficit problem, and, and departments have been very good about doing that. Uh, water, uh, $100,000, again, that's the stormwater portion, that's just the general, for portion, general fund portion of water, and then non-departmental uh, is down by about $300,000. 
So again, graphic depiction of the expenditures in the general fund, $174.9 million. Um, as, as you would imagine, uh, fire and police are, are, are the preponderance of that, 23% for fire, 32% for police, for our safety services. Uh, PEDs at about 8%, uh, housing and community services, just that general fund portion of housing and community services, about 1%. Administration, those departments that we lump together that we mentioned are 12%, um, and then uh, Rec and Parks at 9%, and TPW uh, at 12%. General fund, this is this is kind of an, uh, another um, lens to look at the way we break down that general fund budget of $175 million. So as you can imagine, those top two categories there, salaries and benefits. Uh, the salaries, as I mentioned, mostly is due to that 2.5% COLA increase. Um, just one thing I'd point out there, you know, we, we've had discussions on, on how to cut the budget, and we always come back to discussing mostly salaries and benefits. And, you know, right now, uh, CalPERS unfunded liabilities is, is a big portion of that. But if you put together those two top lines there in the general fund, salaries and benefits, that's 80% of our entire general fund budget, which is, um, which is high. So if you're looking to cut budgets, those are the categories where we, where we really have to look. Professional services, uh, up about $300,000. Um, got vehicle expenses, that's the charges that we get from our fleet. Uh, those are relatively flat at 4%, and we'll talk about those when we, when we get into TPW's uh, departmental budget. Operational supplies are flat, uh, utilities are flat. Information technology um, is, is uh, that uh, internal service fund charges out to all the departments for all of your computer needs, software needs, uh, and that's actually gone down by $100,000. Uh, however, that's, as you're gonna see within the departmental budget, it varies department to department. Most of the departments have seen decreases, but some departments specifically City Council, have seen some increases in their inf information technology charges. Liability and property charges are, are just the portion that the departments pay uh, specifically for their property insurance or how that's allocated out to them for property that they own. Uh, and then capital outlay, there's usually one-time outlays that we do within the operating budget, and those are, as you would expect, uh, flat or down a little bit. Uh, CIP and uh, O&M projects we'll get into when we get into the capital improvement program budgets. So now kind of moving into the forecast, um, we showed this to council uh, when we met with you in April. So um, this is a picture that you've seen frequently. Uh, the way that it's changed from last year, the starting point is better. I think we were starting this year with an $18 million deficit when we came to council last year. Now we have a $1.8 million deficit. Um, so that's, that's good. Um, however, the trajectory of these lines is not good. That's the, that's, this, is, this is the crux of the problem that we're trying to solve with the structural deficit. I should also add that um, as the vice mayor brought up before, the $5 million in FTE cuts that we discussed for the general fund are not factored into this. Um, what is factored into this on the revenue side is the new TEF or Measure O funds at $10 million. That's built in here. So if you take that out, you really have, that's where we get to that $12 million deficit if you pull that $10 million out. Um, so right now we're, we're kind of treating that for, for purposes here of an ongoing revenue source, um, which may not be, a, uh, be an accurate surmise of that. Um, we don't, we don't take into account any economic downturns in this, so this, this picture uh, could, could look worse. Um, and then we have funding sources that expire, as the city manager alluded to, in 2024-2025, uh, the, the old Measure O um, will go away, and that actually has FTE costs associated with that in police and fire, and if, if that is not, um, uh, uh, if, if we don't get an extension of that, then that's gonna be an additional cost that we're gonna to have to deal with here that's not covered by that revenue source. So um, I hate to be doom and gloom, but I always am, but we're, we're facing a lot of challenges that, uh, that aren't necessarily represented in even this bad graph. So general fund baseline calculations, uh, this is for the measure O calculations. Um, so as you can see, uh, police is, um, is just over their baseline, the $60 million is the baseline calculation at 34%, there's $60.2 million. Uh, fires over their baseline um, by $1.6 million. Uh, uh, the violence prevention is actually under the baseline by $61,000. However, again, this, um, this does not bring, bring into account those cuts we make. If we take uh, even a preponderance of the cuts that we're proposing, that will bring down the general fund budget, and that will also bring down the baseline for violence prevention, so that will bring us, um, bring us uh, back into compliance with the baseline. 
Okay, and this is um, just a staff summary by department, so I won't belabor this. Uh, city attorney, as you can see, is um, is basically stable, and you can see that the uh, the personnel that have been added over the years since 1516. I also have a graph in here that I think goes back to pre 2007-8 to kind of show you what the citywide staffing has done over over a number of years. Um, CMO is stable, uh, community engagement stable, finance, we're giving up three and a half positions. We'll talk about that in the, in the uh, departmental budget. These are not the three and a half positions that we talked about in the FTE cuts. These are positions that were planned for reductions. Um, so again, we'll get into more detail with that when we talk about my department. Uh, fire stable, um, HCS stable, human resources stable. IT is down by two, and again, IT is a little bit unique because we did their budget earlier than the rest of the budgets. Those proposed two IT techs that we, we proposed cutting the cuts are actually built in here, and as part of this plan, we're recommending adding one of those back in. And water, we'll talk about when we talk about the um, about their departmental budget. They've cut uh, five positions, I think, that were part of, of kind of reorganization they did. Um, and this is what your FTE staffing summary looks like. So we've had council uh, ask before when we've met uh, where we were prior to the recession. You can see that we hit a high point there uh, of city FTEs at 1,376.9. Um, uh, and then we dropped down as we went through the recession. We cut, cut, cut until we got a low point there of 1197.9. Then we've uh, we've added back uh, about 100 positions uh, since the absolute low point there in 2011-12, 2012-13. Uh, I think 20 of those were added back in the last year. Position changes um, in the general fund, uh, just some additional data for you. Uh, there's one position that was eliminated in the city manager's office as part of this budget. Um, however, that was uh, that was kind of a strange one. We, we actually budgeted the FTE within the city budget, but this is actually work that's done by the county for us, uh, for the public safety uh, consortium. So we eliminated this position. The county is still doing this work, but we moved the budget for that work over to the police department. So that's now part of their budget. Uh, Long-term meter specialist that's, that's, um, is funded by water, but is within my department. It's part of that utility billing. Uh, we eliminated that. We also eliminated a long-term customer service representative that's funded by water. Those were planned eliminations. Uh, we have the uh, uh, advanced metering infrastructure, the AMI program. Uh, so those positions were vacant, and they were they were planned eliminations. Okay, and we'll get into most of these when we talk about the departmental um, uh, departmental budgets. Uh, finance, we, we reduced a parking citation review officer. That's a half time. It was just hours, uh, so we're eliminating that. That's been taken over by one of our parking supervisors that work. Uh, IT technicians we've talked about, we're eliminating two of those as part of this budget. However, we, we if the uh, cut scenario is adopted, part of that cut scenario is adding back one IT tech. They'll be funded from water and from fire. Uh, equipment mechanics were reduced uh, in TPW. Those were vacant positions, been vacant for a number, number of years, and we'll, we'll delve into that in the departmental budget. Uh, water resource tech and water, utility supervisor operators, two of those, and skill maintenance worker in water and environmental compliance inspector were eliminated. And again, those were, um, were, were planned eliminations. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, yeah. Mr. Tibbetts, you have a question? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Chuck, really quick, you know, on page 56, you're showing the forecasting. In the future, if you could add a line to that, showing us what that li what, what happens to that line if we were, were to make the staff changes, the reductions that, uh, and the reorganization that you're seeking. You know, I, to me, it seems um, like it's pretty obvious that if we are going to uphold what we said we were going to do with the temporary funding, that making those reductions, as hard as it may be, is going to be part and parcel to that keeping that promise. But I still think that for us and for the public and anybody looking, being able to visualize that and understanding the difference it could make is gonna really you know, give us a well-informed decision when it's time to make that decision. Absolutely, and we'll bring that back to council with the adopted budget on June 18th if that's... Other questions? I had one check on slide, I think it was 55. Where is overtime embedded in this? That's in salaries. So, and when we go to the departments, because I had this question for several of the departments, um, I've always looked at overtime as a resource that needs to be managed, just not 
you know, open. When or how would council get the information about how departments are managing their overtime budget? Because I also recognize that during the cuts, there's that in previous years that has been a source of cutting that fund. How would we see so, what? So are? we can we can amend that moving forward, and we will supply information. That's we'll we'll get we'll take that as a note and and see where we are and being able to supply that information currently. Great, thank you. Any other questions on this portion? Okay. Okay, now we'll get into um, departmental budgets, and I'm going to uh, try to walk through all of these. Um, I am by no means a uh, operational expert in every department in the city, so we've got all the department directors, subject matter experts here that can answer any of your specific questions. Um, we've tried to kind of cull this part of the presentation down a bit um, from previous years, just because, as I said, most of the departments have not made uh, big additional asks. So first we're gonna start out with the administrative departments, city council, uh, community promotions, city manager's office, city attorney's office, human resources, finance. We'll talk about the non-departmental budget, information technology budget. Um, and then uh, we'll move into um, office of, of community engagement, planning, economic development, uh, recreation, parks, housing, community services, fire department, police department, transportation, public works, Santa Rosa water. And then finally, when we're done with all of that, uh, we're gonna move into the capital improvement program, uh, which will be done by, uh, by Director Nutt. So the first, uh, first budget is, is uh, the city council. Um, so you see a $440,000 decrease in your budget in professional services, and as you would imagine, that's because it's a non-election year, so, uh, so we don't have to budget that. We did have to budget in the last year. Uh, $60,000, uh, same comment for that with other miscellaneous, was for printing services. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is a breakdown um, by major object for the council. So you can see that your uh, salaries uh, have stayed stable at $72,000 over the previous year. You see a line there for non-council member salaries that drops by $17,000 or 27%. That's for the um, for the sworn officers that you have for the council meetings. We've uh, we, we've planned on using less of those uh, in the coming year. Uh, so that's why you see the drop there. Um, council member benefits, uh, those have, have gone up a bit, um, up by 8.1%. And again, uh, a lot of that's back to that benefits uh, uh, discussion that we had. Uh, health benefits uh, go up by six, 7%, and then we've got PERS costs that have gone up markedly. So that's what's driving up those benefit costs. Non-council member benefits, um, we see a, uh, a reduction there, uh, 43%. And I, I would imagine a lot of that's because uh, instead of using regular time, Time, we're using uh, we're using overtime uh, officer time for that, which would bring down that benefits line. Your professional services, as we mentioned, have dropped, and that's primarily due because it's a primarily due to the fact that it's a non-election year. So, election years we have to add in that additional funding. Uh, utilities have stayed stable. Operational supplies stayed stable. Uh, as I mentioned, you are one of the areas where information technology charges, that internal service charge has gone up. Most of the departments have seen a little bit of a decrease in that. Uh, and kind of looking at the way that cost allocation plan is done, it looks like what's happening there is that we're, the IT department now is covering a lot more um, committee uh, and board meetings now uh, uh, in the council chambers uh, and, um, and uh, uh, broadcasting those, so th that's what's driving up your cost. That's one of the dri one of the drivers for the departments is is how much they spend on that. And then other other mis miscellaneous sixty thousand dollars that was that was those print services that we talked about. So overall, the council's budget is uh, is down by four hundred thirty three thousand dollars. Um, this is a uh, snapshot of the community promotions funding request. Um, I. Uh, uh, I'll just show this to you. Uh, I'm not very familiar with the individual um, requests. Uh, I know that uh, Council Member Sawyer has been uh, instrumental in this uh, in the past, but you can see there what was uh, what was requested from these um, uh, 
individual uh, agencies on the left, and then you can see what the recommended funding is within the budget for this year of $125,000. And I think last year uh, that that was actually temporarily bumped up for $5,000 uh, to accommodate an additional request. And then this year we took it back down to $125,000, which is the baseline for that budget item. May, may we also know how much was requested overall and not just from the entities that received the funds? I'm assuming that there were entities that did not receive any funding that applied. And, and I don't have that in my memory. We, we can get that information for you, though. We have a full recording of that. Okay. Are there other questions on the City Council budget from in there? So I have a question, how was the 125 k established and how long has that been the amount allocated for community promotions? I'm, I'm going to defer to Council Member Sawyer on that one if, if you know Council Member. I'm sorry, Mayor, can you request or <laughs> repeat the question? 125000 it sounds like was allocated. It seems kind of interesting that that was allocated prior to this budget so we couldn't give feedback about could we maybe increase that. And I'm wondering how long has it been at 125 k you know, it's been quite a while. We, we, we increased it a number of years ago, but uh, we are having a, um, a meeting with staff uh, in the next number of days to discuss some of our challenges with, that, with this particular, um, with the community promotions funding. Uh, there are some ongoing uh, challenges that we want to try to clean up. Um, we agree that there it's it is always very frustrating to have uh, to have the, the limitations but given our our fiscal situation uh, we had put off the the request for more funding uh, what we want to do is to hone the process um, and to become more accurate for instance if, if someone asks for city services uh, there seems to be there. There is a question as to whether or not some of those services are being adequately tracked, uh, and what the what the true cost is. So we're looking at um, creating a um, a clearer picture as to the actual costs of those requests, uh, and we're going to be those those conversations will be had in, in actually the next few days. And we'll be back with a report to the council as to, in, as to any substantive changes that we make to this process. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then I had a question regarding the IT budget. With the, you, you mentioned videotaping, and I know PEGS funds are used for that. Can you tell me how we balance general fund versus PEG funds to fund the filming and the IT for the city council? Yeah, I don't know if I have the PEG. This is just general fund. Um, I think we talk about the PEG funding within uh, within the IT budget, but I, I don't know what the breakdown is, how much of that was used for council chambers, if that's what you're asking me, Mayor. Well, I'm interested, who makes that decision? It's my understanding there's um, amounts of money regarding PEG funds, and is this a relatable expense that we could reduce our general fund obligation if we're uh, doing all the tasks and duties that an outside nonprofit profit used to do? Yeah. I'm just interested in who makes that decision and how, how do we balance that. Yeah, and that the, the PEG fund expenditure is, is part of the um, is part of the departmental um, budget. So so they ask for funds out of that. Um, so I, I I can't remember whether in the IT department I, I've got that information, but we can we can get that if I okay. don't. And then is the IT also for this, uh, does that include all the boards and commissions or laptops and all the IT for all of our boards and commissions is included in the city council budget? Yeah, I think all the all the laptops, if they're if they're purchased by the city, are included in that budget. Okay, yeah. thanks, Ms. Lenny. Yeah, thank you. Um, one point of clarification is, or curiosity here is, why uh, are we going down in um, in police or security services from sixty four thousand to forty seven thousand in going next year when the council is concerned about security, or I'm concerned about security. I think that decision was made based on their actual experience. So they, they didn't need the amount that they budgeted there. So based on what they've bought on their actual experience from the last couple of years, they took that budget down by that mm -hmm. amount. So. so we'll do some follow up on that one. Okay, I just wanna ask if it has been considered to st uh, staff the security services 
our study sessions? So I, I think we're looking at security. There had been a request um, holistically. I think this line is simply a reflection of actual expenditures versus budgeted line item. I think, so I think there's two different, so I think staff looked at what over the last couple of years has been expended. I think council has asked some other items, so we'll, we'll so this look this is not at, a policy decision, it's this just is a reflection, the, it's a snapshot of what's happening and what snap, think is happening. It's a snapshot, but I think you're right to raise the point because there is, I think, some disconnect here and we need to, to, to look at that, so, so. Thank you. Any other questions? Please, next one. Okay, now we're going to the city manager's office. So the city manager highlights, um, they had a large decrease in professional services, uh, $500,000 decrease for Ernst & Young for the post-fire recovery efforts. So that was part of the discussion we were having earlier. Um, so uh, Ernst & Young contract uh, expires in May. Uh, however, there may be an ask as part of this budget to actually ask for an additional $300,000 to keep them on for, for um, through the summer as we transition a lot of this work to internal staff. Um, and then there was also a $150,000 increase for lobbying services. Um, and we'll get into that here in a moment. So this is the city manager's uh, breakdown here. Um, salaries are up by 6.4%. Uh, um, those were uh, primarily due to, sorry, COLA increases. And then we uh, we moved the fellowship program from water into the city manager's office. So that is, uh, is why you see um, that 6.4% increase. Uh, likewise, benefits also went up, and a lot of what's driving benefits is, is the addition of that position, but also just the, uh, uh, just the, um, the increases that we're seeing in health, UAL, and all those kind of things. Uh, professional services, as we talked about, are overall down. We've got decrease in the Ernst & Young contract, uh, but then we've got increases in some other contracts. Um, so for general and disaster related lobbying, we actually added $108,000, and then we added $50,000 for the R3 contract, and that's for, um, for the waste management contract. Uh, sorry. And then um, operational supplies have stayed uh, basically stable. The information technology budget for the uh, city manager's office has actually gone down by $28,000. Uh, and then other miscellaneous uh, went up by, um, uh, went up by $19,000. And uh, some of that is uh, for advertising and for print services. And those are related to the community intergovernmental relations. Okay, questions on city managers. Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McBride, for the city manager and the city attorney, uh, in their contracts there's built in uh, cost of living adjustments. Does this, though that hasn't come before the council yet, does this proposed budget build that in? So with the proposed budget, if we didn't know for a general fund employee, we, we, built, we built in a two and a half. Oh, sorry. We, we built in a baseline two and a half percent if we okay. didn't know, so. Uh, you're good. <laughs> Was that your question? Yeah, I think I skirted to a white house. Ms. Combs. Thank you. Um, I see the increase for the lobbyists, which may, may be fully appropriate, I'm not questioning that we need to increase our lobbyists' funds at this point. But I'm unaware in the last year or so of having gotten reports back from our lobbyists about things we need to be kept apprised of. Uh, and so I'm wondering if the contract for lobbyist services will improve their communication with our council. So I think it's a good point, and we're, that's part of what we're working on on the restructuring of the PIO, the PIO intergovernmental, because that is a key conduit to that information, and that's going to come with this reorganization. You will okay. get much Thank more you. direct notice. Thank you. Any other questions on city manager's office? All right. Thank you. Okay. Now we'll move on to the city attorney. It's another relatively small budget within the general fund. Uh, so salaries in the city attorney's office, um, 
we're up a little bit by 3%. Again, that's pretty much in line with that with that coal increase to 2.5%. Benefits, uh, a 12% increase is, is again, the, the almost identical thing that you're seeing across the departments uh, due to those, those factors that we talked about earlier. Utilities, um, uh, it looks like it's up by 66%, but that's a very small dollar amount uh, to begin with, so it's, it's only an $800 increase. And then where you see uh, operational supplies, other miscellaneous, that's just the um, city manager um, is, is moving uh, money between keys, not really increasing their budget much. So their overall budget goes up by 5%, but almost all of that is due to the salary and benefits lines. Um, and then you see, uh, you see uh, uh, CIP and, and O&M projects, and that's, that's where uh, the city attorney actually budgets a lot of their training, so that's what's within those so, lines. So just for a point of clarification, I am not moving money between keys. Um, I think he meant to say the city attorney's office is adjusting their, their, their items within their budget. That is correct. The city manager did not move money. The city attorney did. Ms. Combs. Thank you. This office, and rightly so, does yeoman's work with all the other departments. My understanding was that over, I don't know, six, ten years, we've been having conversations about how to increase automation within the department, how to uh, change some of the processes, but I see a decrease in information and technology. So I just want to make sure that we're still moving toward the uh, efficiency improvements in the department that we had discussed, especially if we're going to not increase staffing. Uh, yes, we certainly are, and indeed um, we're working closely with finance uh, and with IT, uh, and just earlier this week, um, uh, staff reviewed some, uh, we, we've set out an RFP, we've received responses for some automotive automation, improved automation. Um, samples were reviewed earlier this week and I would expect we'll be making a decision on a recommendation um, very soon. I don't know the exact date, but I would ex assume within the next couple of weeks. Will that, is that taken into account within your, um, within your training budget also? No, that number is not in our budget. Um, that number, because that service is going to provide services um, across the city, um, that is in, I'm not sure if it's in your budget or IT's, but that hasn't been quite figured okay. out. Um, I just want to make sure that we're funding that people understand how to use the technology we get. Yes, um, <laughs> that is, and we, there may be additional um, automation that, that happens as well, um, which would be within within our allotted budget. And so th there's a couple of that. different pieces, yes. Yeah. I appreciate seeing the, the that desire come to fruition, thank you. Any other questions on city attorney's budget? Nope, let's move forward. All right, human resources budget. Um, budget highlights for HR. Uh, we had $250,000 increase for professional services. Um, that is, uh, that's for uh, Rennie Sloan Law Group uh, to assist with negotiations. Uh, we saw a $150,000 decrease for the wellness program. So again, that was one of those ones as part of the cuts that were brought forward to uh, council. Uh, the council uh, allowed us to cut some of the non-personnel costs and that was one of them. So that's the miscellaneous wellness program, not the safety program. Um, and then $23,000 decrease in other programs in our risk management fund. Uh, and then uh, one of the things that, that, that uh, the city has seen is a market increase in uh, the city healthcare program, and a lot of that is because of the participation. So I think we added 159 participants, participants in the city, which is almost 10% increase just in participation. So that's what's driving a lot of that cost. They also saw a 13% premium increase uh, on the team. Teamsters healthcare programs uh, for calendar year 19, and then a 7% projected premium increase in all of the healthcare programs, um, which is in line with what we usually project in when we're doing our forecasting. 
So to kind of uh, dissect human resources uh, by fund, uh, they're comprised of two funds. Uh, the general fund uh, portion uh, is up about 10% or $250,000. And again, a lot of that uh, sound like a broken record, but it's due to that increase in UAL and the increase in the COLAs. And then the risk management fund uh, of uh, $35 million, that's up about $3.5 million or 10%. Uh, again, part of that is, is due to personnel costs, but risk management uh, comprises a number of things. They've got uh, general liability for the city, so um, so the insurance for all of our uh, city facilities, city uh, city assets. Um, they also have workers' comp that's under that, and then we also put a lot of the benefits line is actually uh, budgeted within the risk management fund. Uh, so those kind of three major components are what make that up. Okay, and then another look at the human resources, and this is the uh, uh, expenditures by, by the category. Uh, so salaries um, are, are uh, up by 1.2%, um, which is a little bit uh, under the COLA. Um, uh, and then they've got the, uh, they got benefits that are up by about 9%. Um, and then professional services uh, are, are, are up uh, by um, $77,000. And a lot of that uh, is is uh, due to increases in um, uh, two hundred forty thousand dollars increases for the uh, Rennie Sloan contract that we talked about on the on the cover slide, uh, and then utilities, like most of the other departments, are pretty much stable. Operating supplies are stable. Uh, information technology. Um, Charge again for the uh, for the HR department actually went down, which is the experience of most most departments. Uh, insurance premiums, and you saw that that in the previous slide where we showed you the risk management fund, insurance premiums and claims are what's uh, really driving a lot of that increase. Uh, so when they um, when they set the rates for both general liability and for workers comp, they look at usually it's the past seven years of your experience, and that's how they set your rates. So uh, we've had some increased uh, insurance insurance uh, uh, experience that's, that's driven those rates up, as you would probably expect. And then uh, their indirect costs have actually gone down. And a lot of that's for the allocation program from the general fund. Don't you have one more slide after this? I do. Sorry, uh, risk management fund, um, uh, city health uh, has gone up overall by 21%. And again, that's back to that cover slide that you saw. We saw an additional 50, 159 employees that have come into the uh, system. And then we've seen an increase in, in the uh, Teamsters healthcare plan, about 7% percent increase in other health plans. Uh, PERS Health has actually gone down, and that's because actually some, um, uh, we've actually seen some reduction, I think a reduction of four members that are in that plan. Uh, so that actually brought that cost down a little bit. Uh, workers, workers' compensation, as I mentioned, similar to the conversation with general liability, uh, the experience uh, that we've had with workers' comp is what's driven that up. So that's gone up by about 12%. Um, other employee benefits is uh, is is uh, pretty much everything else has gone up by about five percent. Liability insurance uh, uh, for general liability has gone up based on our claim experience. Uh, earthquake insurance uh, has gone down a little bit. So overall, the uh, risk management fund within the um, within the HR department is up by about twelve percent. So, Chuck, I don't know if it would be under the workers' comp, but I know when we had some discussions about the wellness program that we're hoping to impact some of these numbers. So I know we're in this budget's recommend miscellaneous, we, we would drop that wellness program, but has the wellness program had an impact on any of these risk management numbers? Um, I, th I think the simple answer, Mayor, is we don't know. Uh, when we brought this to council in January and we made the proposal of dropping the miscellaneous wellness program, we couldn't get any data, any hard data that showed any correlation between those things. Um, you know, we, we can't really tell. We had the program in effect up until, you know, up until we dropped in the next budget system, and we don't see any reduction in workers' comp compensation, but you can have one workers' comp claim that really drives your experience up. So it's, it's really hard to correlate those things without years of data, and my understanding was that the wellness program was a relatively new program for miscellaneous, so. Okay. Council, questions about the HR? Ms. Combs. I'd like to follow up with the wellness program because we also had a disaster 
and we would have anticipated seeing increases in stress and associated health impacts, workers' comp impacts, uh, health services use impacts. Um, I understand that the wellness program has been providing more data and information as best as is possible under the short term that it has been here um, and would like to again request that we look for resources for uh, allowing our miscellaneous employees to have access to a wellness program. Uh, I know that we're seeing a number of increases in um, as a community in uh, stress-related effects following the fire. Uh, it's not uncommon for those effects to come 180, you know, 18 months after uh, a disaster like we've had. Uh, it seems to me this is, we have this program for police and fire. It seems equitable to provide it for all of our staff. Um, and I just wondered if the wellness program folks could, the HR folks could address uh, the new data that they seem to have now available. Good morning, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Amy Reeve, the Director of HR. Uh, we do have an EAP and employee assistance program that does provide counseling sessions and addresses things like mental health issues. Um, that program provides a number of sessions that are at no charge to the employees, and that's been a resource that we've offered. Uh, we did have some claims, and we would re refer those through our workers' compensation process, and I will have Dominique introduce herself and talk a little bit about that. Good morning, Council. Dominique Kariahara, Risk Manager. Um, so yeah, we do have our workers' compensation program for um, affected employees by the fires. There's um, psychological services that uh, we uh, schedule, and there's also camps. There's a whole program. So we work very closely with the departments that are seeing um, or having outreach with employees that are suffering or having issues related to the fires. And they do, they've been showing up 18 to 24 months past, so it wasn't immediate. I would say them, they keep happening more frequently now than the initial incident. So I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that we're eliminating a, a wellness program based on workers' comp not going down at a time we've just had a disaster and workers' comp is likely to go up and use of services is likely to go up. And the need to recognize, I mean, my recollection was that that wellness program staff uh, really shifted the focus toward stress reduction processes, um, exercise, a proper diet, um, that these are important elements for our, for our uh, miscellaneous employees. And I'm just wondering if this is the time, 18 to 24 months after a disaster doesn't seem to me to be the time to be diminishing or decreasing that kind of service. The wellness program does have a variety of great benefits, um, you're correct. We do have similar services offered to employees through their individual health plans and providers as well as through the EAP. So our plan on a go-forward basis is during open enrollment when we have the health fair for employees that we would kind of capitalize on those plans that are offered through EAP or other resources. Um, I think the mental health issues that you mentioned as a result of the fires will continue to be taken care of proactively through the EAP and workers' comp. Ms. Fleming. I appreciate that. Um, however, the ma majority of our employees um, get their health services from some providers that are well known for not providing great mental health in, in timely fashion. And um, that that is a, an ongoing issue. And I, I just want to make the point here that the cost of this program compared with the, the potential risk or the potential liability of not having it seems to be, even without data, questionable. Um, and so what, but what I'm really left with here is the challenge of if this is a dispensable program, why are we dispensing of it for the vast majority of our personnel but not for fire and police? Well, that is a, that, that item is, so I was the one who brought the program into the city. I proposed the program for miscellaneous employees. Again, 
The other ones are embedded in the MOUs, and so they are a matter of negotiation, and so that's why we started this program. At this point, we're not seeing any evidence or correlation um, between the things that we had said initially that it would impact, and it hasn't impacted those. Um, it is at the council's discretion to determine that this isn't a place. They're always, as I said, tough to earlier tough decisions. We didn't go in this lightly, and the city manager is the one who brought this into the fold to begin with three years ago. So, um, but we haven't seen evidence to, ins to say this was going to influence the indicators that we, we argued the investment for. Happy to take direction on this item. Thank, thank you. Just again, um, you know, as a mental health provider, I'll say this, you know, EAP is not, um, and services with one of our major contractors for health um, and mental health services are not adequate to meet our needs. And I think that we will see a bump in, in crisis severity, PTSD, af after we hit the two year mark, we're likely to have staff continue to feel the effects of, of what's happened. I'm not trying to push necessarily on this one particular program, but we see health premiums going up. We see the, the costs overall, and I think we need to be measured and fair. And it's wonderful that our, our safety and, and fire services are so good at negotiating, but this is an area that we have to look out for our employees who you know are strewn across a number of different bargaining units. And this may not be the, the right place or the right time or the right fight, but I think that we need to acknowledge that many folks who are not getting the same annual increases, the same pensions, the same, uh, you know, benefits that we confer upon them when there is a crisis, when the fire did happen, they were working 12 hour shifts at night. I wasn't there, you were, you know what they went through. and. I just con I'm concerned that we say, well, there's EAP and, and, and there's, you know, health services available. So, so again, again, my again point. the staff fully agrees with you, and that's why we're trying to figure out programs to actually continue to do this. This one was just not correlating to the. There was no demonstration that it was making a change. The council is welcome to tell us to advance the item. Um, it, it, staff is just saying they're not seeing any, any return directly on the investment that was forecast. And in an era of tough decisions, this was a decision that was brought forward by the department. Right, and, and, and I do appreciate that there, it is difficult on, in this area to collect data and to report it out and so forth. I do see that there are other areas where we could be making investments in revenue and we don't and, and vice versa. So I just would like the, the logic to be consistent across um, our cuts and our investments and to look at it holistically, you know, not just apply that set of logic to this particular position. Mr. Chibbets. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. McGlynn, are we seeing a high usage rate of this program across the employee groups? Is it pretty equal across employee groups? Um, no, this one on um, the safety side has a really high participation. Um, only about 300 employees in the miscellaneous group actually utilize this program on a regular basis. So the utilization really wasn't there to the cost and also to address the mental health issues. This wellness program doesn't address those. So the psych services and everything else are done through our workers' comp program and we partner with our TPA. So we have those services available. But again, it's not, this wellness program doesn't address psych services, in the current program even. Okay, thanks for answering that question. You know, I, I think that some good points have been brought up about making sure that we're, we're addressing the needs of, of our staff, especially after a stressful event. Um, but what you're telling me is that mental health is not actually a component of the wellness program. Um, it, it's got a low utilization rate. So I'm, what I would propose, or at least what my thinking is, so you're aware, is that we, we just basically keep it in the budget, but we look about where we can spend it more effectively. Um, that would be my suggestion, because I do believe there's, there probably have got to be some, some need right now going forward in the community, our community within the organization, where this money can actually make a lot more focused and acute difference in those people's lives than just broadly spending money on a program that has a low usage rate. 
Ms. Combs. So I'd like to be clear that there's a difference between EAP and psychological services and stress reduction and wellness services. And you get stress reduction services uh, at a low cost to prevent the need to use the psychological services that we're talking about. Uh, I know that the program did stress reduction, exercise, and diet, and I consider stress reduction to be a mental health service, uh, even if it isn't with a psychologist or a social worker. Um, so the assertion that it is not providing mental health services is, is misleading at least because I know that it provides uh, information about stress reduction and did so actively following the disaster. Um, I'm sorry that, that we have only 300 folks participating at this point. Uh, I consider it a relatively new program and they may have some outreach issues that need to be corrected. But I, I am, uh, I, I'm going to continue to, to uh, request that we find 150K somewhere to provide stress reduction that doesn't require someone to report themselves as needing a psychiatrist, psychologist, or social worker, but you can go get meditation services, for example, or something similar. Mr. Tibbetts. Just a follow-up question on that. You know, it's my understanding that a lot of programs like employee wellness programs, if people are participating, actually has a positive impact on the health premiums that you pay. Does this program, if you're a participant, reduce the premium cost to the city? No, it doesn't. Have we looked for any programs that do? That could potentially also meet the exercise, stress reduction, mental health needs of employees? I don't know that we've explicitly looked for that. I will say that in meeting with uh, the wellness program coordinator, she did provide general statistics about how health and wellness influences medical usage relating to things like stress, which can result in other issues, or how weight, for instance, would result in diabetes, which would result in additional raised health care costs. But I'm not aware of an ability to track that explicitly so that we could give you statistics that we could stand behind. So yeah, I guess I'll just affirm my position that um, we, we may not want to remove that from the budget just yet, but let's maybe look for a more So again, happy to entertain that, but we are going to need some direction of, of if we're going to keep some of these in the budget where you would like us to look um, uh, to, uh, we'll come back with proposals, but if there is a preference of where you want us to look for those savings, it would be very helpful to have that instruction at the same time as you're, if you're not contemplating adding something back. Okay. Any more, Mr. Tibbetts? Yes, just as a point of order then on that question procedurally, are we today at the end of this presentation going to be discussing what to do with that $7 million unassigned fund balance or will that be, will that come in a subsequent conversation when the public's able to attend? So council member, that'll be the last slide of the day is, is to get direction from council on what you're expecting of us coming back for budget adoption. So that is. Okay, I appreciate that but I would also really strongly suggest that, you know, after the two years I've been on this council, that's a huge question that is of interest to a lot of people in the community that, you know, at 12 o'clock in the, the afternoon can't participate in and voice their support for. So down the road, I may ask the, uh, the council to actually consider doing that during a five o'clock public hearing time, that one slide. Um, but. Well, and, and again, there will be a public hearing on exactly the adoption, but we're looking for guidance from this body at this point. Okay. Ms. Fleming. I'd like to uh, also support Council Member Tibbetts' uh, uh, question about can we find a way to incorporate the savings into our insurance. I think that data is, is really critical to this given the, you know, it's a fairly small amount of money and I understand that data collection is onerous and takes away from staff time or our contractors time. I, I will offer anecdotally that different departments from my limited experience have responded differently. I try to visit a different department every week and transportation and public works, you know, I bring a dozen donuts and those folks were the hardest sell in the world. I could not figure out why I could not, you know, get rid of 12 donuts, you know, 
but it's because those folks were participating in a wellness program to um, and competing to be healthier and lose lose weight. So I'm not convinced that there is n no long-term savings to our premiums. I'm just convinced that we're not able to track it. I'm also not convinced that there are. I'm just saying that I saw direct evidence of participation on a fairly wide and, and somewhat time-consuming on my part scale. So. Any other questions? Mr. McBride, thank you. And just to correct myself on the PERS Health, I said there was a reduction of four employees. It was a reduction of 14 employees. Okay, finance department. So a couple of the budget highlights. Uh, as I mentioned, we got rid of three FTEs, the meter specialists and the customer service representatives. Um, those were by design. Uh, so that was uh, the, the phasing in of the AMI program. Um, those were vacant positions that we eliminated. We had a half time uh, hours for a parking citation review officer. That that work has been picked up by the supervisor uh, and we are, we are just eliminating that in this budget. Um, we had a uh, capital outlay increase of $57,000. This is part of the ghost vehicle cleanup that we talked to council about. Uh, within my department, we had a number of um, very old vehicles that we were keeping uh, keeping on site. We, um, working with fleet, got rid of those vehicles. However, uh, it did result in us having to purchase a few more vehicles to put into, uh, to put into uh, service. Um, we also have CIP projects, an increase of $736,000 to repair garages one, three, and 12. Um, and there's also some ongoing uh, CIPs for other garages. I'm not gonna delve into that here because again, at, the, at your last presentation of the day, we're gonna be talking about the capital improvement program. We'll be talking about those uh, in detail. So uh, as with the other departments, um, we break down uh, the finance department by fund. Uh, we have uh, general fund is, is the preponderance of, of our funding sources. Um, that's up by 3.7%. And again, same same comments that I've made earlier on salaries and benefits. Parking district fund uh, is up by about 7%. Um, uh, that's Kim and, and her crew. Uh, and then we also have the pooled investment fund uh, for the city. So what you see represented in that line is, is the amount that we paid. We had discussion yesterday on, uh, on custodial banking services. That's what you see in that line item. We also pay a consultant PFM to, um, to help us with our investment activities. So that's, that's also included in that line item. And then we have the successor, successor agency to the former redevelopment agency. And, and as we talked about in the budget overview, that's just a wind up of the redevelopment agency. Uh, we're receiving money from the county through that and just paying off the two existing bonds that we have left over from the redevelopment ag uh, agency. And that'll go away in 2034. Another look at the uh, finance department. This is our breakdown by line item. Uh, you can see that our salaries are actually uh, almost flat. And yeah, we had the 2.5% the coal increase in there. However, you recall on the first slide that we have also eliminated um, positions from the department. So that was an offset there. Uh, that's also what's driving that benefits line item. Um, we did see uh, some increase in um, professional services. Uh, so, a uh, couple of things that we're seeing there, um, we have armored car services for our revenue division, so we've seen those costs go up. We also um, have the uh, the banking uh, charges and uh, merchant card processing for, for credit cards within our revenue division, so we're seeing some increases in that. And our city's a uh, uh, little bit unusual in that we don't cap how much you can uh, charge or, or how much you, you can pay on a credit card, so um, we've seen those costs go up a little bit. Uh, our vehicle expenses uh, overall, that's the charges that we get from the fleet are down. Um, utilities are, are up about 5%. Um, operational supplies are, uh, are relatively um, steady. Uh, we said we saw a little bit of an increase in operational supplies uh, due to the installation of about 190 smart uh, credit card reading meters that we did citywide. So that's within Kim's division. Uh, let's see. Liability and property insurance, we've actually um, seen a little bit of a decrease in that. Uh, that's, the, that's the proportion that we pay to risk management. Um, we've also seen a, a uh, 
decreased costs and our other other miscellaneous costs. And some of the things that we put in there are, are advertising um, and leases. So we had a uh, lease termination uh, of $26,000 and decrease in advertising of $12,000. And I assume the lease termination is the parking lot uh, on which that modular hotel is now being built. And CIP and O&M projects, as we mentioned, we have those garage projects that are in there, but I'm not gonna delve into those now as we're gonna be talking about that within the capital improvement program budget. And then I have a breakdown of the enter fund, enterprise fund summary. This is uh, Kim's group parking. Uh, revenue coming in of, of $4.9 million uh, uh, plus transfers in. Those transfers in are from the general fund. So the way we are set up, we, the, the money that we collect on, um, on meter enforcement uh, uh, goes into the general fund. General fund transfers that money back into the enterprise uh, for parking. Their expenditures uh, were $5.8 million, uh, CIP expenditures of a million dollars um, and transfers out of $121,000. I think we talk about this in a, in a later slide, but that $121,000 transfer out is, is for the, um, is for the uh, downtown uh, benefit district. And that, uh, that means that this, year, this uh, next year we propose using about a million dollars out of reserves, which does not mean that we're not covering our operating budget. That's just uh, one-time monies that we've built up for CIP projects like, uh, like parking lots that we're dipping into. Uh, so there's just a timing issue with the, with the revenues and the expenditures there. Take questions on the finance department. Ms. Gomes? I, I... Forgive me for taking us back to the wellness program briefly, but I thought I had heard and do see an email that I received indicating that the actual uh, budget of the wellness program, uh, that they had reduced their contract fee by 10%, that it's 135,000 now, and that they have offered to reduce it an additional 5%. And I'm wondering if you can update the information on what the cost information went to the HR director in mid-May. So we don't do negotiations in the chamber here I, with contractors. I'm not negotiating in the so, chamber. This email was sent to the so, HR director in mid-May. I'm wondering why we didn't get that information in our budget. Um, we will follow up with that, but we don't typically bring those types of contract negotiations to council in that form. I'm just asking why I got 150 k instead of... I'm really concerned about this particular contractor who's out there actively advocating to continue their relationship with the city. And I will say, we're likely, even if council continues, to go out to do an additional solicitation because this is not good practice to be doing this behind the scenes. And this has happened on more than one occasion with this contractor. Thank you. Any questions on the finance department presentation? Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. Just a curiosity question. I was not aware that the um, funds from the enforcement, of the parking enforcement, ultimately got transferred back into the, um, the, the parking enterprise fund. Is that 100 percent or is there, I, I just didn't know that was happening. I thought it, was, it, went, it went into the general fund and that's where it stayed. I mean, I'm pleased that, this is, that it comes back, but I, didn't re, I don't remember seeing this before. And I'm going to have my subject matter expert, Kim, come down here and answer that question for Thanks, me. Thanks, Kim. Good morning. Um, so how it works is the parking program provides parking enforcement services for the city. The city receives all of the uh, parking fine revenue. And then the city, the general fund reimburses the parking fund for the cost to provide the parking enforcement services. So not all of the money returns back to the parking fund, just that which is required to reimburse it. Got you, thank you very much. Kim, could you introduce yourself just so the oh, sure. <laughs> know who you are? I'm Kim Nado, I'm the parking manager. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on the finance presentation? Seeing none, thank you. All right, now we'll move into the uh, the non-departmental budget. So again, this is um, kind of a unique budget where, where it, it, it's made up of things that we can't really put within other departments. So budget highlights, um, general fund administration offset uh, increased by $825,000. 
Um, that's basically those those uh, city services that we provide through the general funds. I think things like payroll, the city manager's office for review of staff reports, those kind of things. We we uh, we build a cost allocation plan and we spread those costs out to all departments so that when they're looking at what their costs are, they're actually you know, capturing a fully burdened cost. Um, so that's up uh, up this year. Um, animal control contract uh, also increased by three hundred seven thousand dollars. That's another contract that we roll into non departmental because it. Wouldn't, wouldn't likely fit anywhere else. And a lot of that's due to, um, to the inclusion of the Roseland area. So here we break down the non-departmental non by the major objects, and as I mentioned, you can see that animal shelter um, contract going up by 16%. The county admin fee is staying, uh, uh, is staying stable. County admin fee is just what we pay to the county for administration of things like, uh, like um, the collection and the distribution of our property taxes. Uh, citywide general fund uh, insurance has gone up by um, $175,000, and this, that's just for the for the portion that is uh, general fund facilities and, and assets. That's what they pay to uh, risk management. Uh, Sonoma Kansas County Transit Authority that has stayed uh, basically stable uh, at $105,000. General fund administration again. Um, that's what we what we uh, what, where we offset that charge. So we 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 put this as a charge to the department so that their costs are are are, um, are fully burdened. However, we don't actually charge them. There's no actual transfer of money there. So we put this credit into the non departmental to offset that so that we're not kind of double counting general fund expenses. Expenses. We also have a city manager contingency fund there, fifty thousand uh, dollars. That's for one time uses that the city manager. Uh, uh, finds needs for, uh, whether those be contractual services, professional services uh, that they need. Um, we also, you'll see a line item there for separation expenses. So essentially what happens is that um, throughout the year we have employees that retire or separated from service and they have payouts. They'll have uh, vacation payouts, um, you know, whatever kind of leaves that they've accrued, they have to pay out. And th those can be substantial depending on how long they've been with the city. So instead of, uh, instead of budgeting those within the, the individual department, where it would be a highly uh, variable budget. You can imagine from year to year, whether depending on what level of employee you have uh, that leaves or how many employees you have leave, that could bounce all over the place. So what we do is we just, we just budget that within the um, non-departmental and we pay it out of there. Uh, unspent appropriations, that's essentially the turn back that you always hear about. So we, we put a credit in there to account for money that we think is going to be turned back. So uh, like this year where we put together a proposal to eliminate uh, vacant positions, as you can imagine, those positions have been vacant for, for the whole year. So we know that we're going to have some savings out of that. So instead of having the budget bounce all over the place, um, we try to account for that within the, within the non-departmental. Uh, and then debt service, um, we have a component of debt service included in there. Uh, uh, part of that's the pension obligation bond that we talked about earlier. Part of that is the debt service uh, that we have on the courthouse square, um, uh, that capital lease. Uh, so the only debt service that isn't included in here uh, would be debt service that's specific to the enterprises like the water fund. And then uh, I have, uh, I have the uh, successor agency debt service within the finance department. So that's the way the non-departmental budget breaks down. Questions from council, Mr. Vice Mayor. Hey, Mr. Mayor. So just to make sure that, uh, to clarify, when we talked yesterday about the reinvestment of that 4.2 million for pension obligations, how it would free up about 700,000 a year, that's coming in here on the debt service side. Correct. Correct. So, so that's being collected from all the departments. This is the expenditure side of that. So, so the debt service is being paid through non-departmental, but it's being collected from all the departments. Correct. Right. Thank you. Any other questions? I, I had a question on the separation expenses because I don't believe I saw this line in last year's budget presentation. Can you tell me the difference? I, I totally get when employees retire, but some of those separation agreements that are negotiated, I've never seen any data, not necessarily on the names, but who does that and how much is that um, costing the city? Can you talk a little bit about the separation on that line? Yeah, so the separation expense, this, this uh, I understand, Mayor, is, is more for, for um, like retirements, regular separations. So it's those, it's those ancillary costs that we, would be associated with it. So if you've accrued your, your full hours of vacation, you're retiring, and you're going to get that paid out to you, this is where we pay it out of. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that separation agreements would be included as part of this. I think those are normally charged to the departments. And let me just 
for I guess my question, where would we see that funding? And I know some go to closed session, but the majority is when it comes to employees, we, we never hear about it, an employee may be gone. And I'm, my assumption is there's a separation agreement, but I have no idea where that money is coming from. So as we're going through the budgets, what information can we have we, we can that. we can we can caucus on that front and figure out where to have it, but that is usually a negotiated item that that is negotiated based on the if there's a contract that's a department. But the city attorney and I can look at that issue and figure out. But this this is cure, purely about the routine matters of 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 when somebody's coming to retirement and making sure that there's enough available to pay out as the as the. The CFO said payout or, uh, you know, vacation accruals and so on, that is routine. But we'll, we'll look at that issue and we'll figure out what the pathway is on that item. Thank you. It's not, I want to also make sure it's not a frequent occurrence. So it's a no, so I, I frequent, frequent occurrence. occurrence. But absence of understanding of it, or it's got to be coming from somewhere, and I just have no idea where it's coming from because we. But you heard it's typically charged, it's considered part of the salary base within a department because it's a contractual issue and an obligation. That's typically where it would be handled. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, if I turn on my microphone. Next up is the uh, is the information technology department. So as we mentioned, um, a little bit unique with them in that we took out those two FDEs that we recommended in the cut list just because we were building their budget earlier, uh, but we're gonna recommend adding one of those back. Um, it did convert a limited term technology application specialist to a regular full-time uh, position. There was also a 190,000 decrease in professional services for license and support costs, uh, mainly with Socrata and Hansen software. Um, uh, let's see here, uh, O&M project decreased by $383,000. So there's your $300,000 decrease in PEG projects that we talked about earlier to align with uh, the actual revenue that we're getting from the PEG program. And then there was an $80,000 decrease in miscellaneous uh, miscellaneous technology upgrade projects. And right now uh, on the PEG program, um, we have about $795,000 that's available in balance in that fund. If there's any uh, one-time capital projects uh, that, um, that can be done with that money. So the breakdown for information technology, uh, salaries are down primarily because of the reduction of those uh, two IT tech positions. Um, and then uh, we see an increase in uh, retirement liability on that arc there of $150,000 in, the, in the benefits line, but that's offset again by the decrease in the number of FTEs. Uh, professional services, as we mentioned, um, have, have gone down a bit. Um, enterprise software was taken down by $90,000 uh, as we replaced Socrata with, with Esri. Um, we also had a, a Hanson contract that's paid for by IT of $80,000. And right now, uh, the city is embarking on a new software program that'll replace that, that CityWorks. And the first few years of that CityWorks contract uh, will be paid for by another department. So that's actually allowed our IT uh, ISF charge to actually go down by $190,000 or the, the expense to go down by $90,000. Vehicle expenses, so those charges that come from fleet, those have, have gone up by a small percentage. Uh, uh, or by small dollar amount, $4,200. Utilities um, have gone down uh, uh, for IT. Um, part of that's because we've moved some of their utility costs to, um, to uh, water pump station circuits uh, and to water overall. So they've kind of reallocated that uh, expenditure to where it's actually being spent. Um, Indirect costs are just, uh, they're the same as the, um, as the general overhead costs, except that these actually are a transfer of dollars. So um, if you are an ISF or an enterprise fund, then we actually do charge you for those general fund services. It's not just a, uh, it's just not just a, a accounting light item. Uh, and then again, um, CIP and O&M projects, those are down $382,000, but we will, uh, we'll touch on those at the end of the day when we hit CIP projects. Council questions on the IT budget, Ms. Combs. 
I'm looking at uh, slide 91. And my recollection is that PEG stands for Public Education and Government, and that it was a, a inter strong interest on the part of uh, the national government to federal government to ensure that cable had access, folks on, that the public had access to the cable channels. Um, do we still stream on cable? Is cable channel, was it 26, 28, 32? I think those were our three pig. I haven't looked because I use our live stream process. Do we still stream on cable? And what percentage of our PEG funds are we now using to ensure that there's public access to cable? We still broadcast on cable. Um, these meetings are broadcast on Is it one of, I don't know the exact channel, we're moving them around, but we do have four, four PEG channels, which we broadcast on an at and Comcast. also on AT&T Uverse. We also at the same time stream on to uh, YouTube and right. sometimes Facebook Live as well. Right, I knew that we streamed some places, but I wondered if we streamed cable or or not still. So we, we definitely we still broadcast, do. yeah, it's actually broadcasting. Okay. We definitely broadcast to cable. Do, does any percentage of this go toward public access to uh, cable production? Or are we now only doing government access and education access maybe? We are primarily doing government access. Uh, a portion of our PEG funds, uh, council a couple of years ago agreed uh, for county libraries, the Santa Rosa based libraries, and right. they're using some of those PEG capital funds to put in media access and creation centers in Santa Rosa libraries. That actually is happening. Is that and happening? Yeah, it oh, is. Good. They're quite uh, pleased with it and we do a review about once a quarter with them on their progress. But Thank you, I just wanted to make sure that, that uh, my understanding is that the director had changed and I wasn't sure if the program had continued. Yeah, definitely has. Thank you for the information. Sure. Eric, can you identify yourself too, just for those folks that are listening on TV? I apologize, Eric McHenry, IT director. Great, thank you. Any other questions regarding the IT budget? Thank you. And Mr. McBride, we would uh, plan on taking a break right around noon, so as you time in the departments, okay? Absolutely, Nick. Thanks. All right, next up is the uh, Office of the Community Engagement, uh, Office of Community Engagement, sorry, there's no done there. Uh, their 1920 budget, so some of the highlights. Um, so there was a, a limited term community outreach specialist that was planned on uh, being uh, eliminated in the next budget cycle. Um, however, uh, the position, the position uh, has got some additional funding from Cal VIP um, grant that expires uh, next August. Um, and uh, county probation uh, grant that expires this coming uh, September, so they were able to ex uh, to extend that limited term. Um, and then we had some uh, some increased O and M projects, or I'm sorry, decreased O and M projects by $128,000 due to the expiration of the Sonoma County Probation Grant. Uh, and then we had some professional services that increased by $150,000 for choice grants just on the Measure O side. That's not on the general fund side. So if you remember as part of our uh, cut discussion, I think we actually took $50,000 out of choice grants on the, on the general fund side in our earlier discussions. So to break down the uh, department by fund, their general fund and Measure O funds. Um, uh, general fund portion has dropped uh, by about $150,000. $54,000, um, that's primarily due to a SOCO probation grant that ended, uh, that ends in the first quarter of fiscal year 1920. Um, and, uh, and then the, uh, we had some uh, Measure O fund increases. So as you can imagine, Measure O is, is sales tax has gone up in the last year. Measure O also goes up as, as it's just a add on to the sales tax. Uh, so we had increased salaries and benefits there. Um, and we had uh, that uh, increase that was proposed of $150,000 in the choice grants. 
So to break them down by the major objects, uh, salaries are up by 6.4%. So those salaries are up, uh, that's, remember we have the COLA driver and then we also have the extension of that limited reign, uh, limited term COS position. So that's adding to the salary line. Uh, benefits is the same discussion that we've had before with all the other departments. Um, professional services uh, are up. Um, Part of that is a uh, is an increase for um, translation services uh, for the Sunshine Ordinance. Um, so they added money into that for professional services. Uh, and then professional services also includes that increase for the choice grants there. Uh, utilities was stable. Uh, operating supplies saw about a 40% um, increase. However, the dollar amount's not great, $6,700 there. And that's just for funds for Neighbor Fest, uh, Empowered Communities Collaborative uh, Promotional Materials, and for the Open Government Task Force. Uh, information technology is just that internal service charge, um, so that's gone up quite a bit uh, from OCE, um, and I would imagine that's probably the same driver within that allocation plan that's driven up council's costs, and that's just that they're having to cover and broadcast meetings uh, for OCE. Other mis miscellaneous went down quite a bit. Um, there's been a decrease in the CAB meetings uh, and print services per council's direction to discontinue the CAB neighborhood newsletter printing, so that's some of the decreases that you see there. And again, CIP and O&M projects, we will uh, we'll discuss that uh, once we get into the CIP budget. Sorry. Okay. All right. Questions about uh, Office of Community Engagement. Mr. Reismere. Just as a quick point of clarification, you mentioned the increase in professional services based on uh, translation services in the Sunshine Ordinance. Uh, is this in, in anticipation of what is being proposed? coming so forward and being approved? So it's an element of that. I would say it's not the full thing. Staff is, as you know, council member staff uh, is currently evaluating the elements within that. Um, we're tracking to July to bring that cost allocation. This is one of the things that we've heard consistently. So there's an element in here, but it is not reflect, I don't wanna make it seem like it's reflective of all costs that might be associated with items that are proposed in the Sunshine Ordinance. I just wanted to make sure that this is uh, looking at implementation of some of those, not just because we've been doing them on specifically the Open Government Task Force, uh, that, that you're not talking about just the increase for that subcommittee, but actually if some of these elements were implemented. Somewhere. Again, we have a long way to go. Staff is evaluating that. I, uh, that's why I was like, when the nod was given, there's translation services being put into the, way I would phrase it is there's an anticipation of a neat additional translation services. You're seeing that reflected in the budget. It is not a full analysis of that item, that's gonna come at a later date once we, we, we have the complete item. Staff is unfortunately wrapped up in this process, then they'll have to go through the process to evaluate the requests or, or the mandates potentially within the ordinance, and we'll have a conversation directly with the subcommittee on those items. And I, and I would just reiterate that I would look at this um, budget item as a budget item to increase uh, translation services, and I would not necessarily link it with the Sunshine Ordinance, given that Sunshine Ordinance is still in process and has not yet been brought to the full council, uh, and there'll be a full analysis of uh, the, the impacts, both operational and financial impacts of that uh, proposed ordinance for the full council to decide. Yeah, I understood, and uh, when it comes back to the subcommittee, it'd be helpful to parse out what funding have we previously increased in anticipation or that could be applied versus what's going to be needed on top of that. And I think with the timing as we're seeing it, you'll this would be an example of where we, you know, there is already resource to do some of this work. The question is what's the extent of the work? So I think the timing will work out to that Great. To, on that front. Thank you. Other questions? All right, thank you. So I think given the timing, we'll, uh, we'll try to get through uh, planning and economic development. I had to go ahead and start because uh, okay. there's some other things that need to be in place before we adjourn. Okay, got it. 
Okay, so um, some of the budget highlights uh, for PED, the art program uh, transferred over from Rec and Parks to PD during 1819, so we actually trans transferred over the FTE art coordinator, and then we had a professional service budget that went with that, and an O&M projects budget that went with that of $305,000. Uh, we also had a $137,000 increase in taxes uh, for the Community Benefit District Assessment. So breakdown planning economic developments uh, budget. The uh, general fund portion increased by 4.4%. Again, that's primarily due to increases in COLAs and benefits that you've seen with all the other departments. The art and, art and loo fee um, that uh, that was transferred over to them as part of that program, and these are uh, our, our developer fees uh, that are used for the arts. Um, and then we have the Santa Rosa Tourism BIA fund, and uh, if you recall, on top of our 9% uh, TOT base, we have a uh, Santa Rosa um, uh, TOT BIA of 3%, 30% um, of that goes to economic development, and then 70% goes to the Chamber of Commerce. So that's what you're seeing represented in that $504,000 line item for Santa Rosa Tourism BIA. Uh, and then we'll take a look at PED uh, broken down by major expenditure sources. So as I mentioned, um, there's uh, just a couple of things that are driving salaries. Most of that's that 2.5% coal increase and then also the addition of the one FTE uh, arts coordinator uh, and then benefits, um, same, uh, same comment as we've had with every department. Uh, some increases professional services. Um, uh, the uh, PED also uses GARDA armored uh, car services. We've seen some increase in those. Uh, there's also an increase of $20,000 uh, $20, there for the setup and breakdown of the live at Julia, Juilliard concerts. Um, and, then so, and then that additional uh, uh, professional services budget that we saw come over of $39,000. You saw that in the front slide, and that was for that Arts and Lou program. Uh, they saw a, 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 a decrease in um, vehicle expenses, uh, uh, which is just that charge from the fleet. Utilities actually um, went down. Um, operational su supplies um, went down, but I think that was actually with the, uh, the PED department moving some money uh, to other keys for other programs. Information to technology uh, went up for them. Uh, that's just that cost allocation plan. Other mis miscellaneous went up by $138,000. Uh, almost all of that is the increase for economic development for the downtown community benefit district property assessment. Um, and then a portion of that is the, is the cost split that's is paid by uh, parking also. And then general fund administration uh, went up by 11%. And CIP and O&M projects, um, we'll talk about those when we get into the uh, CIP projects, but that was only a $24,000 increase, so it's basically flat. Okay, PED, questions about PED. Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> and this is really more a comment uh, or a, a number of comments. Um, it's interesting that it's that, that CD is back, community development, because that's what it was when I first came onto the council. Um, then that name alone suggests the importance of this particular department. And I really thank uh, both the city manager and the council support of this department uh, as it's um, uh, it, the many projects that it has control over um, have increased over the years and they seem to be, uh, there's never a shortage of responsibilities for this department to, to deal with. I mean, looking at slide 29, that speaks to some of the issues coming before it, the, the um, climate action plan, the general plan update, which is going to be a, a major uh, effort, um, and the specific plan update as well. I think of, of the planning department as the, um, the gatekeeper of the evolution of our city, and we have all discussed the importance of having a strong and vital downtown. And all of these things fall uh, on, the, on the planning department. The, the analogies are countless. I think of it as a steam engine and, uh, and re reducing the uh, fuel for that engine as we um, at the same time are trying in so many ways to um, not only uh, focus a lot of attention on the downtown, but also uh, this council and, and in the region and the, and the state in general has been looking at housing as such an important piece. Um, and all of these funnel through 
the planning department. And I, I, I was speaking to, I was in Portland last week and speaking to an individual. Um, Portland is, is dealing right now, and everyone seems to compare us with Portland, or at least maybe compare every city in the state with Portland. Um, they have their own challenges. One of the challenges is some unprecedented growth that they're experiencing. Uh, this gentleman, when we were talking about uh, some of his disappointment about some of that growth, that seems to be uh, really rapid and is, ch is indeed changing, as and some would argue negatively, but most are looking at it positively, um, changing the, um, the cityscape of Portland. And he said, by all means, whatever you do, do not reduce your planning department. Um, because of some of, some of the, the, what he considered errors happening in his city. So what I what I I have heard from uh, over the, the development of this budget, um, the, our ability to be uh, to deal with increased um, demands on this department um, as time goes on. Um, Eleven years ago, um, we went through the same process. And there was a plan in place to uh, amp up after, uh, if there was a change in the um, in the activity in that department. Um, uh, Mr. McGlynn, you mentioned that, that when you came on, CD was on, or the planning department, CD was on life support. Um, I would suggest that part of the reason it was on life support was some of the act, some of the uh, actions that was the, the budget actions that were taking place that that did uh, in some ways eviscerate certain parts of that department. So my my I'm, I, I offer a caution. Uh, I, I am very concerned in in this case um, that we are um, starting down the road of changing uh, the or compromising the ability of this department to handle all of the the jobs that they have to do, not to diminish the, the responsibility and the importance of all of our city departments. But this particular one I, I see as an engine, and I am very concerned about um, the uh, reducing the fuel for that engine to function um, and to be and to be nimble and responsive um, and uh, expedient. continues to and will continue to concern me uh, that we are, um, that we've come so far with so much of the work that they're doing and now um, what appears to be the possibility of compromising that effort with the reductions proposed. Well, the only thing I can respond is that it, based on the budget, they're actually going up nearly a million dollars. What we're talking about is not filling a, positions that we hadn't filled to date. And so they continue to rise and, and, and the staff continues to find, as I said, resources and part of the realignment is to, to bring all these things into a, a unified vision of how we're trying to tackle these big issues, which you, you've illustrated, council member, um, in that reference back to that slide. Um, but you know, there's still gonna be choices because uh, we don't have the resource to do everything for everyone. I think we can, we can, you know, you're, you, this is the thing that I asked for at the beginning was, was investment in this organization. So anytime that we go through a conversation where we're talking about um, uh, managing that investment, we are very conscious of that. You know, there's a new conversation, as you heard before, between um, finance and PED to really try to get to the bottom of where those relationships are um, and how that we can bank on revenues. But we would be, we cannot spend money that we're not going to get, and so that's always the question we have to balance in this conversation. So we are committed to investing in this community and making sure that the processes are as easy as we can do. Uh, we're not trying to trade dr draconian, but I will say the future is gonna be tougher than even the conversation today, um, so or, or the next few weeks, because we still have a sizable issue to wrestle with within the structure of this organization. And hearing this is gonna be the important part of this conversation about where we continue to do investment. So, um, you know, the team is committed to, to doing these things. We're trying to structure the organization to do that, but we're still gonna to need to go through belt tightening as we do that conversation. 
I appreciate that, and, and I do understand it. And there are these are tough choices, as mentioned by uh, Councilmember Olivares, um, and actually Councilmember Fleming also uh, spoke to some anxiety around some of the some of the cuts. And they are painful. They are always painful. Um, it's not. Um, and these cuts, they were even more, they were draconian uh, a number of years ago. What I would hope and what I ask for is that we, and I'm sure that you will, but I, I, I have to, to um, emphasize that we watch the effects of our um, decisions that we make today and that to allow that department, because of, because of the nature of its duties, um, that we not wait too long to bolster if, if because of this this um, three to nine months uh, waiting time to, to bring someone up to speed, um, what we did before was there was a plan to do that and it didn't work and um, we were really behind the eight ball when we were trying to recover after the the Great Recession um, and the plan to do that although um, at the time it was thought to be well thought out. Uh, did not function the way we had hoped. So I'm just hoping to keep a, a really good lens on that department. And if they, if things start to slow down, and the, and the, those that are out there that, that we have, that whose opinion of that department has changed dramatically, a hundred it's been a, a complete switch um, from being one way to being responsive and, and respectful or respect respected as it is now that we just monitor it really closely because it is it is there's a lot on their plate and it's a very what they do is very very important at least to me and i, I don't think anyone would argue that so um, what you, so what I you just heard, watch what you heard was one of the things we're going to bring forward in a budget in the budget is the more flexibility so we can respond we've positioned this organization because it is one of those things that goes up and down with the health of the overall economy. I mean, we can't we can't continue to staff something that does not have revenues coming in. But what we will be looking for in the actual budget decision is some flexibility to actually apply those revenues in a more active way. Part of the challenge right now is that we have to go through a long process to tap into those revenues. So if council will give us license to be, as, as Council Member Fleming said, more nimble, we're gonna go and respond that. And those relationships actually become the foundation for building um, future employees within the organization, quite frankly. They're, they're the stepping stone for bringing folks in. But that's been the long conversation here is, how do you be with this particular agency? And I think that was some of the shortfalls before was, you just shut it down and then you bring it up. You can never bring it up fast enough to respond to the environments that are out there. We need flexibility to actually do that, to do the assessment that you're saying and actually respond to that so that we're not constantly coming back and you have revenue streams attached to that. We need flexibility to tap into those revenue streams to respond to the business and we can report that out, but that's what we're gonna be looking for in the, in, in the June conversation is to give this, the team the flexibility to respond to the business environment we're seeing based on what, we're, what the revenues are. If we have to go through the elongated process, it takes, it takes a considerable amount of effort to keep going on to the agenda to expand and contract that budget. That's gonna be critical for us to being able to respond to the environment we're counter, we encountered. So that, that's, that's a big question that'll come on the June 9th, the 18th and 19th conversation. Thank you for that. Other questions, Ms. Fleming. Yeah. And thank you. This is a, a tag on to uh, Council Member Sawyer's concerns. I see that here that we, we do have a million dollars roughly that we're increasing the budget, but none of these um, increases are reflected necessarily in staffing. I mean, we have a 3.2% increase in salary, which is consistent with probably a cost of living adjustment and not in regard to additional personnel. What what I find missing in this discussion is not a sensitivity to the importance of this department as the economic engine that allows us to fund so many things that are important to us, but rather an analysis of the income versus expenditures in this department that doesn't reflect the secondary and tertiary incomes that our community gets as a result of having um, a predictable, efficient, and fast planning and economic development team. And so to that end, you know, nothing that we do here, if we were able to recoup about 75% 
of our expenditures in this department, I, I would challenge that no other department is recouping 75%. And that's not even accounting for the, the tax or the jobs or, or all the other revenues that we, we don't see immediately. So in my mind, it's a little bit like cutting off, um, cutting off the, the, the power supply because we don't want, we, because like the lights are gonna go out this, this year, but we're not able to build the factory now. So, I, so I, I don't need, I get that you're sensitive to it and I, I don't think that my concerns are unique or, or unheard, but I just wanna so really be clear that, that we are not quantifying the economic benefit of this department in this assessment. So, so w that's exactly why we're going through the reorganization we can so that we can actually have some of those conversations in a more direct way with the community and that there's, clear, there's a clear conversation about that within the organization. Some of these conversations are spread too disparately, um, but we gotta figure out how do we maximize resources to actually address what your concerns are, council member. I mean, it, actually that's where we were um, four or five years ago, was actually shutting the lights out in response to revenues. I think, I think the teams make significant progress and sometimes you get, your, you are a victim of your success. People wanna maintain that level of success. Staff is committed to maintaining that level of success. We now need to take that next step and, dim, and really understand where revenues are potentially coming and the risks associated with that revenue as a holistic agency and bring you all into that conversation. So that's the next step in our evolution. I think we've gone from switching the light on and off now we're in this, I, I, we all value this, what this does, and it is the future revenue conversations for in the future growth conversations. But we have to take that next step to your point. W how are we evaluating each revenue? What can we count on that revenue? And, and, uh, and I love my industry partners, but sometimes they, they will give you a number that is really um, uh, 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 in, encouraging, that's the word I will turn, and we've got to vet that and then come into a proper response to that number. We, we want every business to succeed in the city of Santa Rosa, and we want to be the pathway for those businesses to succeed. And so I think we've made that leap. What we're asking is to make the next leap, which looks at these things, to your point, as a future, and what can we really bank on, and how are we going to encourage that conversation? And thank you for your response, and I, I, do, I do believe that you and Mr. McBride truly understand this. I, I, I always come back to this point, and, and I'll leave it at this, is that the, the, there's a cost, opportunity cost to everything, and getting to a balanced budget this year might be more expensive for us in future years. I'm not saying that we shouldn't balance the budget this year. We have to do what we have to do, but that we need to be very conscientious. You know, I mean, if you had $10,000 in 1998 that you were gonna put in Amazon and you thought, well, you know, why would I spend my money there? Well, if you'd left it there, you'd have, you know, $5 million now. Now, I don't um, believe that any of us have crystal balls, but I do think that we can see the logic behind um, strategic investment, and, and I'll leave that to you guys to, to take forward. Ms. Collins. Thank you. Um, sometimes it's helpful if you hear from uh, multiple persons rather than just one or two of us. Uh, I am not an obvious spokesperson for this department, uh, but want to speak up in, in its behalf as well. Um, this department functions almost as an enterprise fund in certain areas. Um, it, we, we do have a discount rate <laughs> in this department. I think it, it might fund at 75% in some of the areas where instead of 100%, that may be appropriate. That, that may be a, a wise decision for us to, to stimulate. Um, but we, did, we would have the opportunity to uh, look at fees in this department again and, and consider whether or not we want to offer the discounts that we do offer. Uh, I don't have a problem with that we're offering the discounts we offer, just suggesting that um, rather than, when, when I talk with uh, individuals in the community, they, are, they would love to have things be discounted, but they are more interested in having fast and accurate reviews and, and inspections than they are in paying just a little bit less because time may be more valuable than the money. Um, I am concerned that we have the general plan coming 
and that this department will be very busy with general plan work. Um, we're doing a station area plan, which we received funding for. Um, adding that to the general plan, we have charter review coming. Will that be in this department? Which department will be doing the charter review? We have yet to determine the full where the charter review will lie. But that should be in the 1920 budget, I would think. Council has not given, we're not, at this point, we're not planning to do charter review until we get the, the data from the, unless council wants to change that plan. Um, but I don't know where the capacity will exist to do charter review at this moment. And, and yet our 10 years is, it will be in 2020. Yes, and we'll right. have we'll have data at that point about 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 the the, the from the census, um, which we're working okay. on right now. This department is involved in that. The city clerk's department is involved in the census conversation. Okay, so I'm I'm really concerned about uh, that. And as we grow, I'm at least on in, in my social media, there is a very vigorous conversation going on now about design review elements, historic building elements, and how we are interacting with the historic and design review. Um, it, it, there's a very vigorous conversation going on. Uh, I'm seeing that we are going, the design guidelines that we have now are quite old, um, and I'm seeing that that's a coming factor. So uh, I'm agreeing with Council Member Sawyer. One of the ways to be predictable is to have clear design guidelines, and then you can go you know, that's a great way you could have the administrators doing design review because they have strong guidelines and then only special buildings have to come through a longer process. Um, so I, I am agreeing with my colleagues that uh, this is a department where uh, we really need to think about it in terms of that there is an enterprise fund here and when we cut this department, we are cutting uh, income and engine to, to our community. So I'm, I'm just throwing that voice in. Um, so that you know you have a good count for that. Any other questions? Great, thank you for that presentation. And it would now be the breaking point. Almost got it right on the nose, Jack. So we will uh, take a recess for a lunch break, reconvene at 12.30, 12.30.
Mr. McBride, why don't we reconvene? I think we're on uh, slide 101, Recreation and Parks. We are, Mayor. Okay. So, Recreation and Parks, uh, some budget highlights here. So as, as we mentioned in the discussion on PED, um, we transferred one FTE art co coordinator from Rex and Parks uh, to PED uh, during the mid-year budget. Uh, golf course enterprise fund uh, that falls under Parks and Rec, there are a couple highlights there. We had a $55,000 increase uh, for maintenance. Actually that maintenance is mostly for an HVAC system on the building. That building I think was put in service in 2007, so it's, it's getting kind of aged, so we had to do a little bit of repair on that. Uh, and then, um, I'm sorry, uh, my, my, my mistake, $80,000 was for the uh, HVAC, and then, um, then $55,000 uh, was the second half of a tree removal program uh, based on an arborist appraisal that had been done before, so they're uh, getting rid of some, some of the trees that are uh, dying on the course. Uh, Rec and Parks, breakdown by fund. Uh, general fund was up by 1%. And again, same comments that I've made uh, on almost uh, all of the departments. Um, that's mostly due to salaries and benefits. Uh, Measure O fund, um, funding was up by uh, 3%, and that was also due to the 2.5% COLA, COLA increase. Uh, golf course funds uh, were up by $201,000, uh, and a lot of that is due to those two um, projects, the tree planting and the HVAC for the building that we talked about. That's uh, $135,000 of that. Um, and then other funds, you see that drop by $163, and that's just the transfer of the Art and Lou funds. And the cop capital improvement program will be going up uh, by $741,000 due to various park projects, and those are going to be discussed when we talk about CIP later in the, uh, in the afternoon. Okay, recreation and parks broken down by their, uh, by their major objects. Um, so salaries, we had that 2.5% uh, COLA increase. However, you see a decrease because we moved the arts coordinator over to PED. Um, uh, we also had, uh, we had an increase in benefits, and again, $194,000 increase was just due to the PERS liability, so you're seeing the effect of that UAL on the individual departments, and then uh, partial part of that was offset because of the movement of that personnel. Uh, professional services there, you see it decreasing by $76,000, but you see operating supplies going up by $71,000, so that was just uh, mostly a movement of $72,000. Um, and they moved operational supplies uh, to uh, for uh, software costs um, and professional services. Uh, uh, vehicle expenses went up by $133,000. Those were just fleet charges, um, up by, by 29% there. Liability and property insurance uh, went up primarily due to premiums associated with the golf course enterprise funds. Um, let's see. General Fund Administration, that's just the cost allocation plan that we talked about before. And then in CIP and O&M projects, um, part of that is a uh, is $135,000 in maintenance projects, uh, and then $90,000 in estimated donations that will be spent um, by Parks and Rec. And then uh, we had that large increase of over $700,000 that we talked about in CIPs that we'll, we'll discuss later. The uh, golf course enterprise fund broken down. Uh, revenues came in at 500 or are, are budgeted to come in at $536,000 with expenditures going out um, $656,000. Um, so the, this leaves them with a reserve of $1.3 million for the enterprise fund. Um, so they're, they're uh, part of what's causing that $120,000 use of the reserves uh, is for the, for the ongoing trees project. Um, the uh, fund has also got uh, debt service of $395,000. Um, that bond matures in 2030. That's the golf course bond that's outstanding. Uh, so that's also contributing to that expenditure side there. Uh, operators contracts for the course come up in 2022. Uh, so I think at that time, uh, they'll be doing an RFP for, uh, for course operations. Um, And that is it for Rec and Parks. Thank you. With that last comment that you made about the operator's RFP, so if it expires in 2022, when would that be going out for competition or recruitment? Usually that'll go out at least a year before, so it'd probably be going out in about the next year, right? Year and a half. Okay. 2021, yeah. Okay, great. Council, questions on Rec and Park? Mr. Sawyer. 
Thank you, Mayor. Just a curiosity question, and it's only 14 grand, but I'm cu curious how you how the utilities went down. Any any obvious thing that that would, it, it could be attributed to? It's just unusual to see utilities go down. I don't know what to attribute it to, and I don't have a note on it. Did uh... that's okay. It was just I, it just kind of spoke to me. I kind of was a little bit curious, and I don't need an answer now or, or at all, actually. But do you want to? It sounds like it's a fire impact, and I wouldn't, and based on what Jason said, I, I think it's a loss of meters. So there, once those meters are restored, you're likely to see those costs go back up. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's an operational thing. It was a more a byproduct of loss of metering services. Mr. Alvarez, thank you, Mayor. Uh, more curiosity. I, I think this is the right time to ask this. Uh, Kelly, can I ask a couple questions related to recreation and parks? <laughs> Since you've come down here, I forgot one of them, but I'll, maybe it'll come up. <laughs> uh, since uh, all of the uh, recent budget, et cetera, how, how has all of this impacted our recreation programs, meaning our paid programs, you know, that we that we provide every year? Uh, are we doing okay? Are we meeting the needs in the community? Have we had to cut back on some of those? Is your mic on there, Kelly? Hmm. Oh, sorry. I can you repeat that? I didn't hear you. <laughs> as far as recreation programs are going, participation's good, enrollments are going up slightly. Uh, the rentals of our rooms and our community centers are slightly up, so uh, we've seen an increase in participation since the fires. Thank you, and the rental was my second question, is how we were doing there. and. Uh, so uh, financially, then we're okay. We're meeting the needs. We're bringing in the revenues that we need to address that. Or uh... we were slightly down right after the fires, and we're we're headed back up now. Okay, that was the major impact. Was the fire that caused a reduction? Exactly. We access. were Finley Center was closed for six weeks, as well as all of our field programs because the schools were closed. So it right. did impact our revenue. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for recreation and parks? Thank you. All right, next we'll move on to housing community services. So budget highlights $247,000 uh, general fund continued programs for 1819. We had uh, $150,000 for secure families fund up from $35,000 in 1819. And uh, the, uh, there's, uh, $75,000 for, for two years, and that uh, provides uh, uh, immigrants with uh, legal defense. We had $87,000 in, in a legal aid contract, and then $10,000 applied for the non-discrimination ordinance that was talked about in, uh, in council goal setting. Uh, we have $784,000 in homeless service continued programs from 1819, uh, $534,000 in the housing trust fund. Um, uh, $100,000 for Family Support Center, $100,000 for Homeless Service Expanded Hours, uh, and $50,000 for Domestic Violence, violence uh, Shelter Beds. And all of those funding sources there for that $784,000 are funded through that transfer that we do from the general fund for the, uh, for the uh, real property transfer tax. Um, so those are funded through that. And then, as we'd mentioned when we did the highlight, we have a $7 million increase in housing authority for rental assistance. So they've saw about, seen about a 26% increase in that. So that's where you see the ex ex increased expenditure and increased revenue on that side. The Housing Community Services Department broken down by fund. Uh, general fund uh, is going up by, um, by about 14%. Uh, Part of that is for the uh, Secure Families Fund. It's one-time funding, uh, and then $100,000 in salary benefits due to uh, um, due to due to their uh, salaries and uh, and less time that's being charged to the Admin Hearing Fund. So that's driving that up. Uh, the Admin Hearing Fund has um, dropped by $137,000. 
Um, so the admin hearing fund was used uh, when there were code enforcement violations such as nuisance, those were taken to that uh, hearing. And then those, if, if there were uh, fines that came out of that, those could be actually uh, leaned on the property tax bills as I understand. There was a court ruling that um, that contested that. And so uh, that's why this, this program is being used less. That's why we're seeing the 31% the dropped in the admin hearing fund. Um, the department right now is working on, on other ways to recover those kind of fines, so this is probably just a temporary drop. Uh, homeless services of $3.2 million, uh, that's, um, that's state stable. Um, and $2.9 .9 million of that $3.2 million is from that transfer from the general fund, uh, remainders contributions from the county and private parties. Uh, we have the mobile, mobile home rent stabilization of $167,000, uh, virtually flat, uh, funded by the rent control ordinance fee. Uh, and then we have the uh, housing authority funds uh, that went up uh, quite a bit there. You can see that $10 million, 30% increase. Um, and again, $7 million of that is, is, rent, rent, is rental assistance. And then uh, from the housing impact uh, fee fund where we, uh, where we uh, offer loans uh, for production, that's gone up by $2.5 million there. So that's that, that $10.5 million increase that you see in that fund. Homeless services, uh, you see uh, the real property transfer tax of 30%, that's that $1.2 million, but we, we we're obviously transferring a lot more than that. Uh, we're transferring in total $3.6 million. Uh, council remembers that we met uh, earlier this fiscal year and we discussed the transfer of those real property transfer taxes. So I think right now that we're stepping that up at 5% per year until we get to 100%, but, but right now we're actually transferring over almost all of those real property transfer taxes uh, to be used uh, for homeless services and affordable housing. So the breakdown of housing community services uh, by line item, um, salaries, there's uh, no change in FTEs. Uh, we do have some COLA increases there. We also had step increases that are driving that up by six and a half percent. Um, you see the increase in the benefits, again, in line with what you're seeing with other departments, and that's mostly due primary, the, the, the most of that's due to that increase in the, in the uh, uh, annual required contribution to PERS. And professional services up by $5,000, um, virtually flat, and some of that's just a little bit of movement between objects that the uh, uh, that the uh, department is doing. Vehicle expenses up by 8% or $5,400, and again, that's just, uh, as, as you'll see when we talk about TPW, fleet rates have actually increased, so most of the departments are seeing some increased, even though they there had no change in the amount of vehicles that they have. Uh, utilities went down. Um, there's a slight that that one was a slight decrease in telephone costs by $800. Um, operational supplies have uh, have increased, so they uh, added uh, additional $30,000 in project administration for the uh, community development block block grant fund. Uh, IT rates went up slightly, and that's what you're seeing with almost uh, you're seeing some decrease in most departments and slight increase in some, um, and that's uh, that's just based on what the drivers are for the cost allocation plan and how IT budget is, is allocated out to the city. Uh, liability insurance uh, did go up. Uh, we have other miscellaneous that went down. Um, there was uh, some movement there between, uh, between the uh, different keys by the department. Subrecipient uh, funding is basically, uh, is basically flat. Loan activity, as we mentioned, um, there's a spending down $2 million reserve that they have in the housing in, in, in lieu, uh, housing impact fee. Um, so that's uh, production of more loans uh, in that, in that, in that uh, fee. And then indirect costs are uh, up by about 3.7%. That's just the cost allocation plan that we talked about with the other department. Uh, capital outweighs, uh, there's just those one-time things. There was a, uh, they purchased a vehicle for a code enforcement officer last year. So you just see that there was no new purchase this year. So that fell off. Um, and then CIP again, uh, we'll talk about those more when we get into the CIP program. Council questions from, for this department. Ms. Combs. Thank you. Is the rental inspection program uh, initial costs uh, being held aside in any way so that uh, if we vote 
in the future to start that program, we have the initial resources? We're in the process of evaluating that, and so that's gonna come back in September, so it is not in this budget. Okay, and um, may I ask on slide 108, the mobile home rent stabilization fund, um, my, my recollection, please correct me, uh, is that that's a fee that we collect but that we don't spend out. And so I'm wondering if we should continue to collect that or what's the status of, of that fee? It's an old fee from a while ago. And it, just, I'm wondering what we're using it for now and if we can use it for something else. Okay. At Dave Gwine Housing and Community Services, this Thank is you. in the ordinance, the mobile home rent control fee. Mm -hmm. It's on a per space basis and it used to uh, fund arbitration should there be a dispute between a uh, rent increase or in park improvements. And what's the total amount that's in the account now? Because it, this is, <clears throat> isn't this number is how much comes in but what's there now? It's more than one year's worth. Yeah, I'm sorry, council member. I don't have that number, but I certainly can get it to you. Thank you, please. Um, is, is it, I understand it was for arbitration. Does that mean it's specifically limited to arbitration or is there a way that we can expand it to other legal services for mobile home park residents? That's certainly up to the council if you wanted to review the ordinance and see if you wanted to expand it into other purposes. I think, I think that we need to either stop collecting money that we're not using or use it in a way that benefits the people that we are collecting it from. And I am open to suggestions. Um, we have folks in mobile home parks who could use repairs to their structures to help keep them housed who could use legal services. We have a whole slew of people in manufactured homes that are, that were affected by the fires that don't have a place to go because their units are not easily movable to another site. Uh, my understanding is that there may be over $300,000 in this account. So, so what we'll do is for the June hearing, we'll bring back some understanding of the funds, uh, get a preliminary legal determination on what those funds could potentially, so we could start that conversation if there's a, a direction. We'll do some research, get the right. fund amount, and bring it back um, to try to figure out where you would want to, where council wants us to go with and, that. And I'm very open to suggestions and to hearing from my fellow council members. It just feels odd to collect money that we're not Doing uh, we'll come back and give you some rules of, of what we understand the fund and the restrictions or opportunities. Thank you. Yes, and I will acknowledge it's been some time since there's been a request for arbitration, and, but when there is, that's paying for the attorneys and for court fees and everything else. Thank you. Any other questions from Council? Mr. Alvarez? All right, Mr. Gwine, uh, can you give us a, a, the state of uh, NRP, Neighborhood Revitalization Program, and how does this budget impact that? So the neighborhood revitalization program um, is impacted by the loss of the 1.0 FTE, the community uh, engagement officer that's been vacant for some time. It's on the reduction list. So I would have to candidly state that what we refer to as a neighborhood revitalization program is really a neighborhood inspection program. It's resourced by half-time code enforcement officer and half-time fire inspector. So it's literally scheduling uh, inspections of multifamily units, primarily in the West 9th and Corby Olive, Corby Olive neighborhood, but it doesn't have that organizing component anymore. So I would say that the program is dying? Well, I would say one of the things that we want to do with the realignment is look at that program. We're trying to bring a lot of those programs together to understand and come back to council and propose alternatives. So at this point, we would say it is not, it is definitely not what it was, and that included reductions that happened before this team was working on it. But that's exactly one of the questions we want to ask council member, is what does the program fit? How does it fit into that community engagement and programs directive? And then bring back maybe how we reach finish line on that front when we go through the realignment process. 
Okay, because I, I would assume that the needs are still great in some of these areas. Uh, you look at our website and it shows that it's still alive and well, so we need to make some of those ad adjustments. Uh, but still, even with the annexation of Roseland, I think there's still a great need for having a program like that. And it may not be the same as it was before when it was at its height, but uh, I don't think we can really afford to lose something, something like that in our community. Yeah, and to add to the city manager's comments, part of our evaluation uh, in, of NRP includes a component in the rental inspection program. Right, thank, thank you. And Chuck McBride just gave us the fund balance for the mobile home rent control. It's $541,000. Thank you. Dave, I have a question about the rental assistance increase $7 million. I think I heard from Chuck yesterday that it, this was HUD funding. What led to that? Was it a formula change or what's that increase and should we expect it next year also? Yeah, what we're doing is we're, we're trying to get our rents increased from roughly an average of $950 a unit to over $1,200 a unit. And so it's a request into HUD that our rents are increasing to help our families stay in their homes and that we would like HUD to resources to that amount. And so they've said yes? It's, they usually do throughout the year in, in quarterly increments, so that's how they operate. So again, what would we anticipate seeing this figure be for next year? I mean, will it stabilize or are we anticipating additional increases? It's hard to predict, Mayor, but it would be at or near the same amount. And then what about the other HUD funding for the COCs, you know, the HOME, HOPWA, and CDBG? Um, are there any other discussions about changing that formula to address what the needs are in some of our communities? The uh, for, for state home, a state homeless assistance program, that would be ideally through the homeless leadership design to advocate for more resources for that issue. Um, there isn't anything currently about the block grant portion or the home formula allocations. So how or when would we have that conversation? So I recognize leadership council because uh, my interest would be having that discussion with that group, but still the city of Santa Rosa gets some HUD funding directly. At what point would we have the discussions about increasing or changing the formulas so that it's more proportion or proportional giving those experiencing homelessness numbers in our community versus other communities who are receiving more per capita than we do. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, we would have to develop a strategy uh, in partnership with you as a way to approach HUD with that case statement. Because you're absolutely right. We have the homeless issues that we're under resourced for and our construction rehabilitation costs are going up as well. So I think this was actually a really good topic for the leadership, it, you, you all that are on the leadership team to open that conversation come back to us with the, to the body and to staff with um, some of the answers to that questions. And I think we have, um, we're primed to have that advocacy conversation on a different level than we've ever had before in, in Washington. So I think if we could get some input from the leadership council on what their desires are, then I think it'd be very easy to start to fold that into our overall advocacy efforts uh, on behalf of this community. Great, because these are encouraging numbers. I'd like to keep the momentum going, so thanks. Any other questions, Ms. Fleming? Um, so we have uh, approximately $541,000 in an account for legal services for our mobile home residents. About how frequently do um, our, our residents need these services and when they do, what is the average cost per? The last arbitration was two years ago. And I don't have the cost of what that is Would you say it's more or less than $50,000? It's more than $50,000. Less than 100? <laughs> I'd have to research the number and get back to you. So I think we, again, I think now that the question's open, council member, we'll come back and report out on the fund, how it was generated, any restrictions, and exactly to your point, what we'll look over history and see if there's how many times it's been tapped in and what the average cost is. So if there's any flexibility for you to apply those funds in different ways, we can start that conversation in yeah, June. So my, my questions are coming out of a broader concern over having a half million dollars and not knowing, perhaps um, Director McBride, you can tell me where that money sits, if it sits in a savings account, if it's accruing, you know, if it's accruing a CD, what, what the type of situation is because we're, we're here that we're in dire financial straits, but to have a half million dollars laying around 
not working for us, and maybe it is. I just don't know. Yeah, that, that's that's going to be restricted funds, though. That's why it's broken out in its old, own fund within the department. So you couldn't take that money and use it, say, in the general fund. You, you can't move it like that. So right now, as, as far as the balance, it, it sits with the city portfolio earning our 2% our return. Okay. I just wanted to be transparent with the people from whom we're taking the money, what we're doing with it. And again, I'm not sure we'll be able to reassign the funds. We'll have to look at I'm that. Not that. I'm not driving at reassigning the funds. What I'm driving at is, is transparency and, and, you know, managing the, the monies that we collect in a way that benefits the people who pay the money. Ms. Gomes? And just to add extra information, the community has approached me and at least said, can they pay less each month uh, or nothing each month uh, if, if we're not going to be using it? Um, but I think they would not mind it if, you know, within legal constraints, uh, if we could find a use that benefited persons who own manufactured homes. Um, I have a question because uh, if we ask HUD to increase the amount we can spend per unit, does that increase the total amount we receive based on the number that we receive? Or does that decrease the number? Or do we receive the same dollar amount, but we can spend more per unit? And excuse me that I, I don't already know the answer to that, but. I'm gonna ask our program manager, Rebecca Lane, to okay. help out with that answer. It's sort of a mixed blessing because we get people into units because they can suddenly afford a unit they couldn't afford, but then we make, if, if we have the same dollar amount, we have fewer be benefits. Yes. Thank you, Council Member. My name is Rebecca Lane. I'm the manager of the Housing Choice Voucher Program here for the City of Santa Rosa. So, uh, as Dave mentioned, what this is a reflection of, this is a budget knowing that our per unit cost, so the average subsidy that we pay per family on the program, has increased. Um, and so, when we budget for that amount, then it allows us to to meet those costs within the funding that we actually do receive from HUD. So, so it doesn't always increase the funding when they increase the amount we can spend per household? Uh, correct. So we increase the amount that we spend per household because we're required to under the right. limits of the program. Uh, and then gradually uh, we will hope to receive the increase that we're actually spending. In the meantime, it might mean that we are able to help fewer families with the same dollar amount. That's what I was trying to understand. Thank you very much. And does that apply to um, project-based vouchers as well? Yes, it's, it's reflective of the entire funding pool, so all of the special purpose vouchers. Thank you for filling me in. Sure. Any additional questions from this department? Great, thank you. All right, next department is the fire department. So some budget highlights. Uh, we had $2.3 million increase in salary and benefits for the fire department. So you saw that increase of 7.5% for the department wide. Um, part of that was uh, some base building that was done in the prior negotiations uh, with the fire bargaining units. And then there's a 2.5% COLA increase for 1920. Um, there's also a $350,000 increase in strike time overtime, strike team overtime, and that's just based on the experience that the fire department's had in the last few years, more strike, strike team usage. So they're asking to increase that, uh, increase that overtime, and that has uh, with it related offsetting revenues. Um, and then there's a uh, $135,000 increase for professional service for contract work for building plan review, and again, that's offsetting revenue too. Um, and that's to do, uh, much of that's to do with the rebuild efforts. So breaking down the fire department uh, by fund, general fund by far is their biggest source um, of funding. Uh, general fund has gone up by 7.5% or $3 million. And again, that's that's based on those, those salary changes that we've seen in the latest negotiations. Measure O funding uh, went up by 10%, $304,000. Um, that's primarily, uh, it goes up in, in lockstep with the sales taxes as just an add-on. The admin hearing fund uh, dropped to zero, went down by $25,000 uh, in talking with the fire chief on this one. My understanding is that this was a hearing fund that was set up for, um, 
for uh, uh, hazmat, um, and it, it's just been defunct. It hasn't been used in the time that he's been the fire chief, so the department's just getting rid of this uh, of this funding source. And then uh, the capital improvement fund uh, is going up by about 10% or $90,000 $90, there. And uh, on the CIP projects, um, part of that is uh, is uh, a decrease associated with uh, Fire Station 5 from funding last year of $240,000. And then some increases uh, for uh, new South Santa Rosa Station and uh, rebuild, new rebuild efforts associated with Fire Station 5. So that's why you see that capital improvement program budget moving around a little bit. Breaking down the fire department uh, by its its major components, uh, as we as you would expect, salaries are um, are up markedly, uh, thirteen point three percent in total, or about three million dollars. Uh, benefits um, did not go up uh, quite as much. Um, there was some increase in workers' comp PERS costs. Uh, but there was also some increase in the uh, portion that the fire was paying, paying for the uh, for the employer's portion of PERS, so that's why you, you don't see quite the corresponding increase within the benefits line. Uh, professional services went up by $191,000, and as we said, $135,000 of that's related to building plan reviews uh, for the rebuilds uh, conducted by Coastland. And um, we have some uh, ancillary costs, such as new estimate for general services, such as laundry, that increased by $55,000 in the next year's budget. Um, vehicle expenses went up by 9%, and again, that's you're seeing those, those fleet costs are going up for all the departments. Uh, utilities, pretty much stable at, at 4%. Um, operational supplies uh, were, were stable, uh, down by 8%, but it's a relatively small number, a decrease of $23,000. And most of that was just to, due to historical experience. They weren't spending that, so they took that budget down a bit. Uh, information technology, that charge out has stayed stable. Uh, liability and property insurance has gone up. Um, that's the portion paid to our risk management fund, and that's pretty much the experience that uh, all of the departments are seeing as some of those premiums go up. Uh, other miscellaneous went down, um, and that's just a hodgepodge of things. Some of it's conference and training. Um, uh, some of it's equipment, rental, and repair, just some of those things that were probably one time that were done during the during the fires. Uh, indirect costs actually went down uh, a little bit for the fire department, um, just based on the cost allocation plan. Uh, General Fund Administration actually went up a little bit, and then the CIP and O&M projects went up by $56,000, um, and... Uh, uh, part of that is uh, rebuild a fire station five uh, and then a micrographics project, which I honestly do not know what it is. But, um, and those are the, uh, there's the increase this, that we've seen within the fire department. So overall, the budget went up by 7.6%. And as I said, most of that in the general fund is, is due to salaries and benefits. And then there will be some um, additional asks from the fire department. Uh, we talked to you about recovery and resili resiliency efforts, um, specifically on the capital side, but there's also gonna be some operating costs associated with that. So the fire department in this budget is asking to add, add two new positions. Um, one's an assistant emergency preparedness coordinator, uh, um, and then the other one is the community outreach specialist. So the assistant will focus on uh, internal emergency response plans, training, and exercises. Uh, they'll also work with county and regional partners on the preparation and coordination uh, plans for uh, future emergencies. Also develop and update emergency operations plans. And then the uh, community outreach specialist, which is a, a, a new position also, um, was at one time originally a full-time position within the department, but it was uh, reduced and eliminated due to budget constraints. Um, so they're asking to bring this back. And part of the duties that that outreach specialist will, will do is assist residents, residents in the community-based groups in education, training and exercises, vegetation management, fire safety, and evacuation. And then services and supplies that are related to that are another $35,000. They're also asking for one additional uh, vehicle. That'll be $40,000 and then will be added into the replacement program. Uh, so that's about an additional uh, request of $300,000 for the year. All right, thanks. If I can just ask one quick question. Um, why would the community outreach specialist just be a limited term? 
in this arena? Because this that, that's where we're exploring this new partnership with the region, and we want to understand where the where the full what that regional entity will look like, and then we'll make some decisions about whether this is a permanent position or or a short term position as we work into a partnership. Great, that makes sense. Okay, questions for fire department. Ms. Fleming. This is just a question for clarification. Um, a quick overview of the departments that we've gone through um, previously show that uh, on the, the benefit side of things that we've got uh, increases for uh, Rec and Park at 5.4%, PET at 12.5%, Office of Community Engagement at 16.2%, IT at 7%, HCS at 10.3%, and then when we jump to fire, I believe we're looking at 0.7% and skipping a little ahead to police, we're seeing 0.6%. I'm wondering uh, what, what can account for those pretty significant variances. Yeah, so as I mentioned, the, the, the benefits didn't go up in lockstep like they did in other departments, and I think the biggest reason for that is in the last negotiations, I think FIRE picked up an additional percentage of the employer's contribution to PERS, so that brought down that line item cost, so that kind of offset the, the other increases in the benefits. Thank you. Can you um, elucidate a little bit more why we might see a department like um, Office of Community Engagement having uh, a threefold increase over something like Rec and Park? In which which specific line item? I'm continuing on just trying to reconcile the, the variances in the budgets. I understand the reason why our, our sworn officers and our firefighters are contributing more money, so therefore the benefits wouldn't go up, but that doesn't necessarily account for the holistic overview when I see that some departments are, you know, double or triple other departments in their, their benefit expenditures in the last year. And I'm just, I'm not, it's not a criticism, I'm actually just curious about what, what might account for it. So remember, employees get to choose their benefit packages in some levels, and those can differentiate. So one of the things that can come out of it is, is personal choice. And so individuals, especially in a small department, you're like, likely to see much more fluctuation based on the individuals in a small department making choices on their benefit package. So that's one of the reasons that, that you can see that fluctuation uh, department to department, especially in small departments. Thank you. Any other questions, Ms. Combs? This isn't really a question, this is a comment. Thank you. Uh, these two positions that are being added, I very much appreciate that you have brought on uh, folks to do internal and external um, community prep preparedness work. So I, I really appreciate this. Thank you very much for adding this to the budget. Thank you. See no other question. Thank you. That's all we have for fire. Okay, so the next department's police. So the highlights, we had actually touched on this um, earlier in the, in the budget presentation when we talked about the city manager's budget, but you remember that we had that one FTE that was, was uh, within our budget, but it was actually a county position. So that's been eliminated. Um, and then that we're, we're still receiving those, those services from the county. So the budget was actually moved over from city manager over to the, um, over to the police department. Uh, so that you'll see a corresponding increase in their budget when we do their line items and professional services. And then uh, if you recall, the, the um, police department had come to you earlier in the fiscal year and they talked about the new uh, regional communication system that they're, that they're embarking on. They had gotten, they had cobbled together some funding uh, from sources such as Measure O for the initial phase of that. They're starting to think about phase two as they build that system out. And that's what this money here of $1.2 million is. So again, they're, they're, they're kind of using uh, different funding sources to cobble that together. Uh, $700,000 from uh, Supplemental Law Enforcement Fund, and then from their state and uh, federal asset forfeiture funds, they're, they're budgeting another half a million dollars for this project. So the police department broken down um, by fund, uh, as you would imagine, uh, most of their funding comes from uh, comes from the general fund, and that's up by about 1.4 percent, basically flat, increase of $841,000. Uh, no significant changes on the general fund side. 
Measure O went up by 3.4%. 3 um, some of that is, uh, a lot of that is salary and benefit increases. Uh, so we actually um, budget a number of, of uh, police officers within the Measure O, within Measure O funding. Uh, we had uh, federal narcotics asset forfeiture. Uh, that's flat at $150,000. Uh, that's, I think, a little bit unpredictable year to year. So we just budget that at a flat amount. Uh, same with supplemental law enforcement. Um, Part of that, however, will be appropriated for the radio upgrade uh, and then the state nar narcotics asset forfeiture fund. Uh, part of that will also be used for the radio upgrade. And then uh, that money is actually being shifted, you see there at the bottom, into that $1.2 million in capital improvement fund, and that will be for phase two uh, of the regional communication system. Then the police department uh, by the line items. Um, so there's actually a, uh, a minor drop within the salaries. Um, there's uh, eliminated uh, uh, $100,000 $100, for S SCP SCA, um, which is offset in professional services. So that's that, that's that item we talked about before. They're moving that into professional side services. Um, and then uh, benefits uh, only went up by 0.6%. Um, Professional services went up by $230,000. Uh, $160,000 of that was uh, the consortium fees that we are uh, that we're offsetting by salary savings. Uh, and then there's some increase in background investigation contracts, uh, fingerprinting alarms, wireless services. Uh, vehicle expenses, again, just being driven by the increasing, uh, increasing costs that we're seeing uh, in uh, fleet maintenance. So those are being passed on to other departments. Utilities is flat. Uh, operational supplies was fat, flat. Um, information technology actually went down by $51,000, and that's just based on the drivers that are used for that cost allocation plan. Uh, Small increase in other miscellaneous, and this, this was just a um, movement of object co codes, part of which was moved to professional services up above there, that increase of $230,000. Um, general fund administration, that's just the, uh, the general fund services that are allocated out to all the departments. And then you see that increase in CIP and O&M projects. So, uh, so over a million dollars of that is for the, for the radio communications project, phase two. Um, and then there were some uh, increased contractual services. And one of the reasons that um, that Council Member Fleming had pointed out before where, where we see some of these kind of different experiences in the departments with their benefits, you see here the, that uh, police's benefits only went up by, by six tenths of a percent. And part of that is because um, their worker comp experience uh, uh, drove down their cost by actually $200,000. So that kind of offset any of those other increases within the benefits line. Questions on the police department budget. I have one question, just noticing the big difference with the general fund administration costs, just comparing police to fire. Uh, fire was like 1% and this is 17% and I didn't see any list of for community services, the department before that. And if it's a cost allocation, uh, Rec and Park was 4.6. Can you share with me why it, police department 17.6 for general fund administration if it's so the, the cost allocation plan mayor is based on a whole bunch of different drivers for the different departments. So basically what they do, go, go down and identify how they're gonna allocate these things out. So for example, you could look at the city manager's office and decide that you're gonna allocate out their costs um, or a portion of their costs based on how many staff reports come through. So if, you know, 30% of the staff reports are allocated to the fire department, then 30% of that particular cost center is going to go to them. And we have these uh, hundreds of these cost centers or make up this, this cost allocation plan. So it just depends what those drivers were in there. So if some of the departments are using services of general fund departments less, they're going to get less of an allocation. If they're using those services more, they're going to get a bigger, bigger allocation. So this is outside the control of the department and it's more of a tell from finance or the city manager's office? It's, it's, it's totally outside the, the control of the department other than what their usage is. So, you know, unless they could decide to stop writing less staff reports next year, but really it's, it's not something okay. that's. Thank you. Any other questions, Ms. Fleming? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can you uh, help me reconcile the, the differential in, um, and perhaps you already went over it, why uh, the salary went down by 0.5% for our police department? Uh, 
Yeah, so my understanding is, is when they, when they moved the Sonoma County Public Safety Consortium Administrator over, they moved it $160,000 into, um, into the salary line when they moved it. And what police is doing in this budget is moving that out of the salaries line because we're really paying the county for a service and they're moving that into professional services. So that takes that line item down. So it kind of skews their, what, what you'd expect to see the normal you know, COLA increase. It skews that downwards. Mm -hmm. um, um. The, the issue that I'm just trying to, to come at here is that the departments have such different variances in, in their salaries with, you know, a, a negative 0.4 for a rec and park, and then, you know, with HCS, we're at 6.5, and then with fire, we're at 13.3, and then with police, we're at loss of half a, a percent. And, and I understand that each department is really different, but I'm just trying to see if you can elucidate a little bit for me about why we're seeing, you know, such variances from our projected budget to our, our actual budget. Yeah, and this is, well, this is the actual budget number that you're seeing there for 1920. You're, you're going to see variances like where we talked about the arts coordinator that we moved. That's going to, that's going to bump up over the baseline COLA, what that department's going to see in their salary line. Likewise, with fire, you're going to see a much bigger increase because we, we went back and negotiated with fire this last year. Their contract expired in 2017. So we had a couple of years of base building, I think at three and a half percent. And then we had a two and a half percent COLA on there. So fire, compared to other departments is going to show like they have a, a much bigger increase in the salary lines. So. Thank you, that's helpful. One last question about salaries. When we're looking at the cost of salary, is this the cost of uh, base salary uh, excluding overtime or is this inclusive of all expenses that show up on a person's paycheck? So uh, the salaries will include um, will include overtime. Uh, if you have any extra pays that you get as a firefighter or police officer, those are going to show up in the salary line. So that's going to be anything that that you get paid um, minus all those the benefits line. It's okay. So are those those two departments are the departments that t typically incur the greatest. Uh, amount of overtime services, I'm guessing? Okay. And would you, I'm curious if you believe that that would account for a fairly stable, I, I understand the fire negotiations played large part into it, but we, that the police didn't have such a situation. Would you say that that might account for the, the significant variance between the safety departments and our other departments? Yeah, and if anything, um, overtime would kind of skew the the spread between salaries and benefits because overtime um, uh, doesn't have the full burden that regular time does, so it's 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 not going to have as big of a benefit associated with that. Uh, and remember too that uh, that um, there's some of the things you see when you're looking at between police and fire department. You know, keep in mind that fire actually added overtime to their budget this year for the strike team. So yeah, that that could could skew you know the comparison between the salaries. Absolutely. Thank you for your patience in explaining. This. <laughs> no, I mean, and again, that's that's going to be something that the the public wrestles with. I mean, you're dealing with two, frankly, two estimated count co columns, and two. I mean, you're comparing estimated columns across the years. These are really legitimate questions. It really does. The nature of some of these businesses is so divergent. Looking for consistency, I think the public needs to recognize that. It's gonna be really, really difficult, and that's why we try to go and do some review of significant change and what that significant change represents, because it is mightily confusing and folks are looking for consistency, and sometimes the way the business operates is very, very, divergent from another right. another play well, these, these services are quite different uh, one from another yeah. and I'm not driving toward consistency what I'm driving toward is transparency yeah. uh, where where questions might arise so that yeah. our taxpayers yeah. have a clear sense of, of what their money is Absolutely. going to and why but it's Absolutely. not a criticism of the inconsistency oh no no and, and and I and I appreciate the questions I think those are really important questions that's what we're trying to say is ask because there's probably other folks following exactly the same trying to understand this so we appreciate those questions. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for police? Seeing none, thank you. And next we'll move on to transportation public works. 
So uh, budget highlights, um, there's gonna be a, they're asking for a $50,000 increase in operation supplies for the city owned libraries. So if you remember uh, some time ago, they came forward with a uh, request for one of the libraries, I think it was $50,000 uh, to uh, pay for, I think it was a, a screw compressor if memory serves. So they're asking to, to up this budget um, to address those, those type of events. Uh, Transit Enterprise Fund that falls under TPW uh, saw a $111,000 increase in salaries uh, for overtime to our previous discussion. Um, and then the 1920 estimated revenues were, are sufficient to cover expenditures, which was uh, a little bit different than last year uh, when they had a deficit there. Um, so they have some ideas this year. They actually, we'll, we'll talk about uh, transit specifically at the end of this. Um, department, but they, they've got a little bit of surplus that's left over. It's not really surplus. They want to put that aside for some uh, for some capital um, requirements that they're going to have in the future, and we'll, we'll talk about that more in a moment. Equipment Repair and Replacement Internal, internal Service Fund. So um, we've told you throughout this presentation, and you've seen within the departments that, that there's been some increases in the in the charge out from the uh, uh, from the um, fleet maintenance uh, that's hitting the departments. Um, but here you see a, 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 a two FT reduction in equipment mechanics. Those are um, vacant positions that have been vacant for quite some time that, that, that they're uh, getting rid of in this budget. Um, so you, you, that you also see a $295,000 decrease in operation supplies for, for parts and materials. So um, I think what, what they're doing is, is kind of right-sizing uh, what the costs are for that cost center, for that internal service fund. But um, they've also not been recovering enough uh, in the rates they charged the departments in previous years. So that's why you're seeing you're seeing some reduction costs here, but you're also seeing a, a, an increase in what they charge out to the departments. And that's because I think they've been charging out too little in the past years, and they're kind of right sizing that now. We're also seeing a four hundred ninety-three thousand dollar increase in capital outlay for vehicle replacements. So those first two bullets there uh, pertain to the. Um, uh, to the fleet maintenance fund, and then that last one there pertains to the replacement fund, and that's just going to fluctuate based on the number of vehicles that they're replacing in every, any given year based, based on their time in service uh, and other factors. So breaking down transportation public works, uh, total budget of uh, almost $70 million. Um, so general fund is is is, uh, is a is a very large portion of that twenty one million dollars um, that went up by uh, by about a half a million dollars uh, transit special revenue funds uh, those went down um, slightly uh, and again this is the budgeted expenditure side that's not the revenue side uh, capital improvement fund went up by two and a half million dollars uh, utility admin fund uh, up by almost a hundred thousand dollars. Uh, municipal transit went up by $1.2 million, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little more within the transit slide. Uh, paratransit operations are stable at $1.5 million. Um, Stormwater Enterprise Fund is basically stable at $538,000. And as we talked about with the equipment repair fund there, uh, those bullets on the previous slide, that's down by $472,000. And then uh, equipment replacements up by, um, by $447,000. And uh, that equipment repair fund, um, previously, before they did this adjustment in the rates, they were actually funding a lot of that, uh, funding any deficit that they had out of fund balance. So that's that's what they're kind of fixing within um, within this uh, within this budget. Breaking, trans, breaking transportation public works down by um, by light items salaries here. Uh, our you know previous discussion this this department's pretty much staying right in line with what you'd expect you see those two and a half percent colas um, that's most of that five hundred thousand dollar increase that you see there uh, and then uh, the six point six percent increase is primarily due to increases in the uh, in, in the required contribution that we have to make to PERS. Um, some increase in professional service, $28,000, uh, and they also use guard armored um, car services. Uh, they have hazardous removal, removal, landscaping, alarm services. There's been some mi minor increases in those professional services, so they've bumped up those budgets. Uh, vehicle expenses for, um, for TBW have actually uh, gone down a bit, and a lot of that's primarily due to parts and labor uh, that they need to build uh, new vehicles, specifically things like light bars and gun racks that they put onto, uh, onto police vehicles. 
Uh, utilities is essentially flat um, at $2.6 million. Uh, operational supplies uh, did go down, uh, and again, that's driven by that initial bullet you saw on the front slide, uh, where we've got, uh, um, where we've taken down the cost for parts and materials for the city fleet. Uh, information technology charges down again uh, per our conversation with the General Fund Administrative Services. That's something that's kind of outside of the of the purview of the department. That's driven by those drivers, how many computers they have, and things like that uh, that, that affect how that cost is. Liability and property insurance is basically flat at three hundred forty-seven thousand um, dollars. So. Uh, this next line item, other miscellaneous, uh, is a little bit difficult to explain. Um, so essentially what happened was that uh, we had a deficit um, uh, within, within transit in the previous year. So the way that they balanced that deficit was to uh, build the savings or, or a credit into that other miscellaneous line item. Now this year when they, uh, when they actually have had revenues cover expenditures, they get rid of that so that line item um, uh, goes back to positive. And that $557,000 you'll see here in, in I think the next slide where we talk about transit, what, what the plan is for that usage. Uh, transportation purchases up by 1%, essentially uh, flat at $1.4 million. Um, General Fund Administration, we've talked about with other departments, that's essentially flat and really outside of the purview of the department's control. Uh, and then uh, CIP and O&M projects. Uh, there's an increase of $2.3 million there. Um, part of this is uh, due to the Sonoma Avenue pavement rehabilitation project. Uh, we've got street overlay increases in there, and then uh, a Hone Avenue washout replacement. So that's driving those uh, CIP projects up. And I think Director Nutt will talk about those a little bit more when he does his portion. As I told you, um, this is that enterprise fund summary. We've got revenues coming in of $15.2 million, uh, covering expenditures of $14.6 million. So, so again, there's, um, there's some, uh, it's, it's, it's termed surplus here. Uh, Transit wanted to be very careful in, in, not, in not identifying surplus as kind of free cash flow. What they want to do with this money is actually start start building a capital outlay fund for the buses. So um, the buses aren't part of the replacement fund. So, so $553,000, that really represents like the cost of one diesel bus if they want to replace one of their 50 plus buses that they have. If you, you go to a uh, hybrid or clean air vehicle, my understanding is that's more around $800,000. So, you know, as they have these kind of uh, revenues exceeding expenditures, they're hoping to kind of build that fund up in, in anticipation of replacing those vehicles in the future. Hey, council questions for TPW budget. Uh, Mr. Rogers. So I have a <clears throat> quick question. I think they're called TIP funds. Uh, I think we've only seen in, in my two and a half years it come before us once, but they're typically the dollars that are used for, they come from PG&E and, and we've used them before for undergrounding of utilities. <clears throat> and I'm just curious where those are in the budget, how much we have for those uh, uh, currently and sort of what projects we could potentially fund with them. Uh, good afternoon, Jason, not Director of Transportation and Public Works. Uh, so the Rule 20A program, which is PG&E's underground, uh, underground program, um, doesn't come to us in our budget. It's actually a credit source that PG&E keeps within their own budget. Uh, we believe we currently have a balance of roughly around $5 million within that. Um, a large portion of that's gonna go towards the Fulton Road widening project that's currently in the budget. And uh, it can only be used towards undergrounding with PG&E being the primary contract design and contractor. So it, 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 it's not something that'll show up in our, in our list. How did those accumulate? Uh, a percentage of the bills paid by uh, customers reverts to the Rule 20A program. Um, it's probably more complicated than that, uh, and I know that the PUC is in the process of, of re-evaluating a potential complete overhaul of the program, all the way from doubling the investment that PG&E needs to make to eliminating the entire program altogether. So those are currently under uh, underway with the PUC. They had a couple of hearings a few weeks ago, um, and I haven't heard the outcome of those hearings. 
Yeah, I just, I remember uh, two years ago, Mayor Corsi and I had dinner with the chair of the CPUC and we asked specifically about those funds and undergrounding and he said he didn't recommend it because earthquakes were far more prevalent and then you have the, oper the awkward moment of trying to dig up your utilities to fix them when they've been damaged. I haven't had a chance to check with him and see if he's changed his mind at this point, but it is something that we hear a lot about from the public is why aren't we undergrounding our utilities and then particularly if there's a funding source. And, and that's really, quite frankly, the only way we end up undergrounding is utilizing those Rule 20A funds. Um, and they, they are limited to uh, quite a bit limited. Um, we only utilize them for our major arterials. Uh, we don't have enough funds even perceived into the future to be able to expand beyond the arterials. Ms. Combs? Oh, go ahead, Ms. Long, do you have a question? Yes, um, I have a couple of questions. One is about the, the library expenditure. When we uh, were asked to approve the screw compressor, it became clear that we didn't have a standing lease with the library. Are we ha do we have any intention of getting a formal agreement with our libraries before funding, um, before committing funding or just sort of ad hoc committing funding? So, so the intent is to begin that conversation. You saw the beginning of that conversation. Um, we need to sit down. Um, I I'm, I'm had some preliminary discussions with the mayor setting up a joint council um, uh, 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 library board committee to actually look at this long term. Um, and so yes, that is it. But we do have needs that come up and we'd rather be working with them to make sure that the process and procurement process is followed in the interim. Um, but right now we are not funding any of those in an active way and we're beginning a conversation for how do we get into a long-term sustainable agreement with defined parameters. So yes, that's un underway. It's good to know because the, the concern that came up for me before was we, we all love our libraries and we all wanna do everything we can for them and at the same time, you know, we'd be hard pressed to to fund anything else without a specific agreement. And I, and I think that that's well understood by everybody. And so I'd like to both provide transparency to our taxpayers and predictability to our libraries, which I'm hoping we can achieve with a lease agreement. Um, additionally, on a, back to the surplus um, that comes from the revenue funds, is that surplus independent of, of TPW in general? Is it specifically uh, housed within the enterprise fund? Yes, it's entirely, it's, trans, it's TDA funds that will end up going back. Uh, You'll forgive to, me for asking what TDA yeah, is. Yeah, Transportation Development Act funds. Mm -hmm. um, they are part of a, a gas tax set aside um, that's specific for, uh, for transit services. Um, and those funds are generally housed and distributed by MTC, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. Um, they are the keeper of our reserves, uh, and that's where our, our TDA funds tend to live. And so the idea is these funds would, would be housed at that location for future use. Um, we've traditionally used that for our bus buys. That's our, uh, or where our uh, expenditures exceed our, our revenues in any one given year. That's sort of, that, that is the reserve program that that enterprise fund has established. And so MTC holds the financing, but the TPW or our, our transportation department more specifically has some leeway over the expenditure of the funding? Uh, those expenditures need to remain within the enterprise fund. They can't be. I, I understand that, but I'm, I'm just asking if, if they can say, you know, we're going to do this part of. TDA funds are, one of the nice things is they're flexible. They can be used for either operating or capital expenditures within the transit enterprise. And, and they've been critical, um, if council will remember, um, uh, this group has really utilized those funds to assist us as well as doing operational changes. Uh, two years ago, we were asking for a million dollar loan uh, to continue operations. Uh, Rachel and her team have done phenomenal work, but part of the toolkit has been able to utilize these funds to help us smooth and keep this system operating. Um, there was some real fear about how we were gonna be able to sustain a bus system 
two years ago. We've got future questions to answer on that front um, and some rule changes which are going to make our lives even more complicated about service delivery. But uh, it, it is a critical tool in them being able to manage through and not taking a general fund loan, which is where we were two years ago. Thank you. And, and this comes from a, a broader concern about our most vulnerable citizens who rely on the bus system and hoping that when uh, when these funds are available that we make the, the most advantageous investment, whether that's in, in charging stations or in, in additional routes or in, in capital improvements or, or acquisitions and just wanting to voice my support for the amazing job that you guys do and, and just hoping that we can continue that in a predictable and hopefully increased way for our residents. Ms. Combs, you had a question? Thank you. and. Um, while we're on this, please extend, I suspect, our, but definitely my appreciation to um, Ms. Ede for the work she's done. I believe that there's an award coming her way soon, and it is well-deserved. Um, I, I have a question that's more general about budgeting and how we do accounting, um, if you don't mind me asking it now. Um, looking at this budget, as the as the sample budget, if we're paying the city attorney's office to review something, does that appear here as a fee? Is that under general fund administration? Is that where that cost for the city attorney's office to review something comes? So I think that's going to be dependent on the fund source and who's charging. Enterprise funds are going to be treated differently than a regular departmental work, so it's going to vary depending on the on the on the department and the um, and the source of, of what those funds are restricted to uh, help me figure out how to follow the funds that we pay each other's departments internally because I'm having trouble doing that um, I think IT also has this issue and I, I'll tell you what's behind my concern is that I don't understand when I finally add up the numbers at the bottom of all the different departments' budgets, how it is that we aren't counting certain departments' salaries twice. And I know that sounds funny, but no. if we're paying them here and we're listing the salary under um, the city attorney's office salary, then we've counted it in a way twice. It, and it, there must be a place it's coming out. It, it's not <laughs> funny because that is one of the challenges in the situation we find ourselves in. One of the things that I've asked uh, uh, Chuck to do is try to help us simplify some of these processes and look how we're calculating um, some of these issues. And I think moving forward, uh, we need to do a better job on that front in clarity. I'm going to let Chuck pick it up from here, but it is, it, it, one, if you'll remember in some of the budget presentations before, we've actually pulled out these internal services and presented them in an entirely different package. Yes. The reality is they have an I impact upon the overall operation, so we vacillate back and forth. So. Your concerns are, are our concerns about, again, trapping back to Councilmember Fleming's about transparency and organization, and we have some questions to ask, and I'll turn the rest over to, to Chuck. Thanks. So, yeah, it's it's a good question. So, um, if, if you notice on this slide here, you'll see two line items. One's the indirect costs, and one's the general fund administration. Yes. The reason these are broken out within an, within an enterprise specifically is that those they're, they're the exact same things. Okay, we're charging you for stuff that the general fund does. When it's an enterprise and it's a separate fund, we are actually going to charge you. We are going to hit you with $1.9 million and you're going to pay that. That's going to transfer to the general fund. The general fund administration is the same thing, but it's only applied to, to general funds general fund departments. So uh, so if you remember when we talked about the departmental fund and we had that I think $14 million credit in there, when we add all these lines, line items together, we remove that so that we don't double count because to your point, that's exactly what would happen. If we did this to general fund departments, we would just be charging the city attorney's time twice. So we take right. that out there, that's how we do that. 
Um, so where is it taking being taken out? Because it's, it's being taken out. So if you go back to your um, to the non-departmental slide, you're going to yes. see a big credit in there, and that's where that's being taken out. And the reason that's taken out is from an accounting standpoint. Um, like I told you, I want to know what my actual costs are because yes. the city attorney charges me. But if I really took the money out and moved it from me to the city attorney, I'd just be moving money within the same fund. I'd be taking it out of my left pocket, putting it in my right pocket. So from an accounting standpoint, it doesn't make any sense. If I charge if I charge transit that money or water that money, and they're actually an enterprise, then I'm actually moving money between funds. And I, I I get it for enterprise, but when I look at our total city budget and I say our city budget is X dollars, it it looks as if it really isn't X dollars. It's X minus the doubling of the city attorney or the IT's department salaries. No, that money will be taken out through that through that line item within the um, within uh, non-departmental. I, I appreciate yep. that. Maybe it, it is probably one of the most confusing things that we do. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions about TPW? Thank you. Okay, and finally, on the departmental side, uh, we come to Santa Rosa Water. Uh, so um, I think as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, uh, we actually uh, had a reduction of five FTEs uh, within, the, um, within the water budget. Uh, for the most part, um, those were planned. So you can see that the, the top two bullets, the uh, technician and the uh, operator, or I'm sorry, this, the skilled maintenance worker and the two utility service, um, utility system operators, those were part of a study that was done by COF classification uh, that was done last fiscal year. Uh, these positions were studied and recommended for reclassification, and as a result of these reclassifications, those three FTEs there uh, were eliminated. The sustainability tech um, that was uh, that was eliminated due to water improving staffing efficiencies, and then the environmental compliance inspector uh, that was removed because. Um, uh, there's actually been uh, changes in the way compliance inspections are, have been done. A lot of um, regulations have tightened surrounding chemical use, so the businesses that previously required inspection don't require that anymore, so the water department was able to actually eliminate that position. Uh, the water department also refinanced two uh, bonds during this last fiscal year, if you remember that discussion, and they've saved $660,000 uh, of interest savings going forward. And then we also returned um, um, money to uh, uh, back to the reserves. So $24 million uh, was released back to the reserves, and, and most of that was due to that contamination that required coming in at, at a much lesser cost than what was initially budgeted at. So breaking down uh, water by category. So first of all, salaries, uh, you can see those increased by 1.4%. And, and again, this is kind of underlying uh, Council Member Fleming's point that uh, you don't see total uniformity in the increases. So you expect to see that COLA increase at least of 2.5%. But again, where we went back and we removed those those FTEs in the previous slide, that's that's countering that COLA increase and taking down the cost. So that's why it's a little bit different. Exact same comment um, on the benefits side. Uh, let's see, professional services, um, those went up uh, by almost 5%, up by $179,000. A lot of that was increased in reclamation, so vector, uh, vector control, irrigation incentives, and maintenance. Um, and those were also, uh, based on experience, under budgeted in past years, so that was bumped up a bit. Um, utility billing services, uh, those went up by uh, $123,000. Uh, $23, so um, part of that is because that service is done by finance, so our costs actually uh, went up by COLAs, but then we had some offsets in those three positions that we showed you that we eliminated. So overall, utility billing uh, went up by a little bit under 3%. Uh, vehicle expenses, as we've talked about with our uh, fleet maintenance program, have gone up for almost all departments, even with um, even with uh, status quo fleets. So I think that increase there is based totally on the increase in fleet fleet rates. Uh, utilities uh, for Santa Rosa Water stayed um, pretty constant under two percent increase, ninety one thousand dollars. 
uh, purchase of water. Um, that went up uh, up by 4.4 percent, which is pretty much in line with the four and a half percent rate increase that water presented to you in the BPU earlier. Um, operational supplies are up uh, about 5.7 percent. Um, there's really no single significant uh, increase there that decides that this is probably increases that we're seeing in CPI. Uh, IT costs um, went down a little bit. Uh, again, back to those drivers that we talked about. Um, Something, something within those drivers probably brought down the allocation of those IT costs to the water department. Debt service went down um, $373,000. Uh, we showed you a $660,000 interest savings, but this is probably, I would imagine, just for one debt service uh, payment that was decreased within the fiscal year. Um, liability property insurance is flat. Other miscellaneous, there were no significant changes down by $75,000, but that's three and a half percent decrease, uh, relatively modest. Uh, and then indirect costs, um, that's uh, notice here, you don't see any of those general admin costs because there, there's no uh, general fund here that gets charged um, or that's worthy of charging out any general admin to, but those indirect costs go back to that conversation that we just had on TPW. So that's actually the cost of city attorney and other general fund functions being charged out uh, to, the, to the water department, the enterprise. Uh, capital outlay uh, went uh, up by $89,000. Looks like a markedly um, large percentage increase, but that's uh, purchase of a portable generation, generator um, and, uh, and, and budget for, for uh, vehicle purchases. So as a dollar amount, as a percentage of their budget, it's relatively small. And you can see the CIP projects um, dropped quite a bit. And again, most of that is due to that um, due to that, uh, that decreased cost for the cleanup that, uh, that was originally budgeted. So we'll talk individually about the, uh, about the enterprise front funds that make up uh, water. Um, so the um, stormwater, uh, $2.6 million in revenues. Uh, transfer in uh, uh, comes from facility fee fund for creek restoration. That's the $25,000 that you come, see coming in. Uh, O&M expenditures about $2.6 million, and then you see transfers out of $960,000, and that's to the CIP fund for stormwater projects. Um, I think the specific project within that is uh, Colgan Creek. Um, and then uh, they're drawing down on reserves, but they have $1.6 million in estimated reserves uh, at, uh, at uh, the end of, of, fiscal, of the next fiscal year, at the end of this budget cycle. Water, uh, we've got $48.9 million coming in revenues. Uh, expenditures going out of 48.9 with uh, O&M expenses, CIP expenditures and transfers, um, and transfers out. Um, majority, uh, $50 million of that $34.1 million uh, is in the purchase of water for the commodity. Uh, and then the $13 million that you see in, um, in expenditures is, uh, uh, that's for, uh, the majority of that is for water mains. So um, you see some small portion reserves being there, uh, being used there, a very small portion compared to the overall budget for the water, uh, for the water enterprise. Um, at the end of fiscal year 1920, the budget year that we're looking at, however, they'll have $53 million in reserves. So reserves in the water fund appear very healthy. Uh, wastewater enterprise, um, got $73 million in revenues uh, coming in, 2.5% increases represented there for the usage and the fixed charge. And then we've got $72.7 million, uh, $72.8 million that's going out in expenditures. The o and expenditures, uh, you see $12 million going out for CIP expenditures. Most of that is for sewer mains. Um, and then you see a, a transfer out of $48 million. $27 million of that $48 million goes to the sub-regional um, partners permit. And then another $18 million of that amount goes out for debt service. Uh, so uh, that uh, fund is estimated to have $56 million in estimated reserves at the end of fiscal year 1920. And then sub-regional, um, my understanding is that uh, we're part of five agencies uh, uh, for, su for sub-regional services. Um, we take in uh, $19.5 million from our sub-regional partner cities that excludes Santa Rosa. Uh, we have transfers in of $46.6 million that comes from wastewater and sub-regional partners payments. 
Um, and then we've got $65 million there in outweighs, uh, 59.9 million of that uh, in O&M services, of which $25 million is debt service. Uh, and then that's $6 million that you see in CIP expenditures, that is uh, plan expenditures for, I believe, the Laguna plant. Council, questions on water? Not seeing any. So at this point, before we go into the capital improvement projects, um, we'd like to offer a public comment at this point. If you are a member of the public field out of the card, we'll also have another public comment period at the end of the CIP presentation, which may or may not happen today. So first we have Gregory Furon followed by Ray Holiday. Make that Ray Holly. Sorry, while I was waiting, my laptop died. I was trying to get some work done and I kept working and then it died and it has my statement in it. I transferred the statement to uh, If there's anybody else you might want to call before me, it takes a little bit. Ray, are you ready to go? Yes, sir. Yeah, let's go ahead. Ray Hawley. We'll come Thank back you. to you, Greg. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Ray Hawley, Community Relations Manager for the Sonoma County Library. First, thank you for decades of support and partnership of free, free public libraries. I've been attending your budget and goal setting sessions since February, listening to you and your staff do the hard work to balance the needs of the community and the realities of your resources, and I commend you for your dedication. What strikes me today is how deeply embedded the library is in Santa Rosa and how we support your goals. We provide access to information about civic engagement. We have safe places to gather and learn. We help veterans, immigrants, and the homeless. We provide literacy and enrichment programs. We're even hosting some of the city's recent planning and outreach meetings in our community rooms. While our financial partnership is sometimes unclear, our community partnership has never been stronger. To respond to Council Member Fleming's question about the lease situation, we welcome any conversation with the city that supports and clarifies our valuable partnership. Keeping the focus on how we serve your constituents and ours would be a valuable effort that provides certainty for both the library and the city. Also, in recent weeks, the council has been receiving information from staff about the city's costs in providing library services, and I'm here to offer additional information. Yesterday, staff pointed out that the city has invested about 1.5 million in community libraries over the past 15 years. That average investment of about $100,000 is appreciated by the community and it makes a difference. We appreciate your staff's suggestion today to boost that annual budget under transportation and public works. I checked with our finance department and in 2018, as an example, we invested more than $900,000 in Santa Rosa library facilities. That includes both routine and one-time maintenance activities and does not include books, magazines, DVDs, CDs, backpacks, and other assets that we make available to the community. It also doesn't include staffing, the largest part of our budget. I also wanted to offer additional information about the city's assessment of the Santa Rosa Library facilities. The Northwest Branch, located in Cottingtown, was given the lowest rating by city staff based on a 2017 assessment. I wanted to let you know that the Northwest Branch is now one of the most modern branches in the city. We spent $662,500 in 2018 on an extensive interior refresh that included new lighting, carpet, paint, and shelving. That came from our Measure Y sales tax funds. As often happens when a branch is modernized, foot traffic in that branch increased immediately afterward and has been sustained. We value your partnership and we wanna point out that while Go ahead, finish your sentence. <laughs> I'm almost done. While you have many needs to compete in your budget, running libraries is our full-time commitment. We invest 31 million a year in providing free library services to Sonoma County, and we appreciate our city and county partners. 
Great, thank you. Thank you. Are you ready, Greg? I'm ready, thank you. Okay, and then we'll be followed by Chandler Jordana. Greetings. We all want to work together to assist our community to provide safer and healthier living for those who live in the city and have no permanent housing. Long ago, you responded to our request to set aside a small amount of general funds, $20,000, to help support the use of underutilized parking lots, mostly owned by our churches, to provide that safe harbor for some of our most vulnerable citizens. Most who have been involved in the implementation of that program, which we call CHAP, will admit that it has not met its goals. We think, the good news is that we think we know what went wrong, and we think it can be fixed. We ask you to continue your support for it and to commit to our re-examination of the design with the objective of adopting new rules which can improve its chances of working. Specifically, we want permission to explore sites in non-commercial zoning, and we think we need a bit more funding. We believe in our community's capacity to respond to this need, and we hope you will continue to, to extend your partnership to the community in that effort. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Is Chandler here? Uh, Dwayne DeWitt. Lana Alderman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. My name is Lana Edlawan, and I'm the, uh, with the Sonoma County Library. For the last few months, you've heard library leaders and supporters talk to you about the need for increasing library services in Roseland. You've also heard us ask you to commit 150000 a year to an interim library while we all take the time necessary to work together to create a more permanent library in Roseland. I'm here to share with you how 150000 would impact Roseland. For 150,000 investment in a partnership with Sonoma County Library, you'd provide continuous library services to Roseland residents, the city of Santa Rosa. The city of Santa Rosa and its residents would receive a 55% increase in hours available to residents from the current 27 hours a week to 42 hours a week. We would increase hours after school, add more literacy, early literacy programs, and again, forge stronger connections with our local schools and teachers. Studies show that children who are reading at grade level in fourth grade are much less likely to interact with the criminal justice system and much more likely to be successful in life. The library can make that help, the library can help to make that happen with your partnership. For every hour the library is open, where the public can freely access technology, receive job assistance, take part in literacy programs, and borrow educational materials for all ages, the city will spend $68.68. .68. In that hour, the city and the library at a minimum will serve at least 18 people, probably more. For every resident that visits the Rosen Library in the next fiscal year, the city will have spent about $3.62 per visit. That's cheaper than a gallon of gas for unlimited access, information, and empowerment to an area of Santa Rosa that needs it more than most. For the price of a grande vanilla latte at Starbucks, we can change the life of a Roseland resident with your partnership. For $150,000, the City of Santa Rosa will allow about 6,200 Rosen residents to participate in free cultural programs in an area lacking a community center and a cultural hub for residents, and it will happen year, a year, year after year, again with your partnership. For $150,000, the City of Santa Rosa will help Rosen residents check out an average of 15 books an hour in the Rosen area supporting lifelong learning and literacy for entire families in Santa Rosa's newest neighborhood. The Sonoma County Library is not asking you to do this alone. Every year the library will invest more than twice what we're asking the city to invest. We believe in Roseland and we ask you to join us again as our partner. Thank you. Thank you. Gail Simons. Hi, I'm Gail. I want to um, just talk a little bit about the program, the CHAP program that Gregory mentioned. <clears throat> For the last six months, I've been involved in helping a safe parking project here in town. 
Um, there are very few of them because, as Greg mentioned, there are some problems with the CHAP uh, requirements that require church or a private person to jump through quite a few hurdles before allowing their parking lot to be used for safe parking. <clears throat> the word safe parking is a little misleading. Uh, some of the people that park um, in our safe parking lot do say that they were not um, unsafe out on the street particularly, but what I've noticed is out on the street they did not have access to a bathroom. The CHAP program will provide um, uh, access to a bathroom um, to people that are parking overnight. Um, this is a sanitation issue for us and a health issue for our city. Very, very important. Otherwise, that effluent would not be treated properly, would be going into the creeks or um, into the gutters. So I really ask you please to consider refunding the CHAP program and perhaps increasing the CHAP money and working with us to make it a viable program. Right now, we have only about 25 people parking in the city in safe parking lots. Only half of those are in church parking lots and we'd like to appeal to the church community with a reasonable program to increase that um, possibility for the people that are struggling. There are too many of us. We have too many people that are homeless right now and need our assistance. Um, just one more side a note, the security, the um, supervision of these parking lots is all volunteer. Basically the money goes toward porta potties and trash pickup. So please don't forget us. Thank you. Thank you. Daisy, that's all the cards we have. Okay. Check back to you for the CIP program. Okay, thank you, Mayor. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Jason Nutt. Jason Nett, Director of Transportation and Public Works. Uh, I heard after yesterday's meeting I put someone to sleep in the audience yesterday, so I'll do my best not to do that today. <laughs> we'll point it out for you if we see it occurring. Per during perfect, and I can get something to throw. All right, this is the 1920 Capital Improvement Program. Uh, as you can see, and we kind of talked a little bit about yesterday, we have a substantial amount of assets, about five billion total dollars worth of assets uh, throughout, our, throughout our community that we're responsible for maintaining uh, and keeping in good operational condition. Um, the projects that we develop as, a core, as part of our capital improvement program come from a number of different resources. Um, we learned several years ago that people didn't understand how we develop these projects. Uh, and it's not just a bunch of engineers sitting around saying this is how we want to do it, um, although we like to believe we have that much power. Uh, but it really comes from all of the master plans, uh, the council documents, um, the area plans, the general plan, all of those different major initiatives that this community undertakes. Uh, those develop uh, the series of capital improvement projects that we end up proceeding with. This year, we're looking at a capital improvement program of about $58.5 million. Um, you can see from the slide, it's, it's divvied up in a number of different ways, uh, with the two largest chunks having being, or being uh, the uh, Santa Rosa Water Department and the three funds that they have, as well as the Transportation and Public Works Department. Uh, on the general fund side, we're about we're looking to invest about 2.2 million dollars. Um, the 1.2 million of annual investment into our ADA facilities. You can see the three major investments that we're intending to do: looking at Finley and Steel Lane community centers, try, trying to provide the best possible access we can to our recreational facilities. Um, we're looking at trying to improve uh, our pathways and our parks. Um, this is an ongoing effort, and we've been working on that over the last several years and making substantial progress. Uh, and then there's some some in-house repairs that we're going to make in and around a number of different facilities. Uh, we do set aside, uh, ask to set aside about $50,000 a year for our capital improvement team, our, our capital projects team, um, to assist other departments in doing some pre-development work. Uh, as, as Chuck uh, talked about with the overall budget, um, our capital projects team is 100% reimbursable. And so that general, general government overhead tends to hit every project that we end up working on. This is a way to try to make at least the initial identification and 
work on a project a little less expensive to an apartment so that they feel comfortable coming to us and using the expertise of the engineering team to vet the viability of a project. Um, as part of the deal we did last year with the council, um, we split what we thought was the last year of the LED replacement program into two years. Uh, this will be the second year of that program. This $300,000 investment, we believe, actually will complete all of the replacements in town, uh, and so we're looking forward to seeing that all finished. And then, of course, uh, the other piece is the $662,000 that we receive from the county every year for the next few years uh, to improve pavement surfaces in Roseland. Now looking at some of the specifics within the different departments, um, the fire department's continuing to work on trying to uh, locate two stations in the south part of town, um, relocating station eight and uh, a new fire station in South Santa Rosa. Uh, they've, it's, I, I'm pretty sure this is identified as fire station number nine, um, and that's probably gonna end up more towards the Taylor Mountain area. Uh, and then of course, putting a, together some um, funds uh, to continue to help us with our rebuild of Fire Station 5. Uh, as Chuck mentioned during the budget presentation, the $1.2 million in police is all going to try to enhance their communication services uh, to replace their radio system That's, that um, is, is now overdue for replacement. Uh, in the finance department, which is which is the parking team, uh, they are looking at doing repairs in three different garages. Um, in garage three, we're talking about gra uh, doing some pavement uh, pavement improvements, painting uh, a little bit of uh, epoxy overlay, some facade improvements. Uh, garage one is some concrete repairs, uh, some wa uh, waterproofing uh, improvements, uh, and again, painting and some improvements in and around the conduit uh, that support the electrical systems within the garage. Uh, in garage 12, again, some additional concrete repairs and waterproofing, uh, and so um, some critical components for them with their $1 million of investment this upcoming year. Uh, on the recreation and park side, you can see when we talk about zones, uh, when we receive park development fees, those are specifically identified for certain zones uh, within the city. The next slide will show the map of how those zones are, are split up um, throughout the city. Uh, we bring those funds in and we start to delegate those, those funds towards either projects or an accumulation account. And so uh, items like the Finley Community Park, we have specific identified projects that we want to accomplish within this year's capital improvement program. But when we look at a place to play, we're looking at putting money aside as an accumulation so that we can do a much larger project moving forward, such as completion of one of the two major ball fields up front or a new soccer field. So uh, they're looking to uh, delegate that $3.2 million uh, the way they've shown it here in an effort to try to fo um, move forward with very specific projects uh, with some parks and uh, just setting us up for future investment uh, with some of the others. And then this slide shows how each of that $3.2 million is, de or how that $3.2 million is delegated throughout the city. These are the four zones, um, with zone one being in the northwest, zone two in the southwest, zone three in the northeast, and zone four in the southeast. For Santa Rosa water, uh, we'll start talking about stormwater. Um, it's the smallest of the funds, uh, stormwater and creeks. Um, they're looking to invest about $1.5 million um, with the Logan, Lower Colgan Creek being the predominant project that they're, that they're hoping to uh, invest in this upcoming year. Some of the other storm drainage improvements include things like Pacific Avenue and Fulton Road, Franklin Avenue and Poppy Creek. Uh, a lot of those are in advance of pavement work that's gonna be coming forward uh, so that we don't have to, uh, so we're, it's completed, all the underground is completed prior to when, when we're doing our resurfacing project. Uh, on the water side, uh, we're, as, as you heard, we're looking at investing about $13 million um, and it's, it's split up between about $6 million for water mains um, 
the hazard mitigation grant projects, about $3 million, so that would be the local match in an effort, if we're successful in receiving funds from the state and federal government with the hazard mitigation, uh, this would be the local match set up for that. Uh, and then smaller amounts with pump stations, facilities, public assistance, uh, and then two and a half million for our groundwater uh, improvement projects. For the wastewater improvements, similarly, um, we're setting aside about $2.8 million or just under $2.8 million for the hazard mitigation grant program projects, uh, just under $6 million for the sewers and services. That's really the pipeline improvements. Uh, and then uh, the sewer trunks, lift stations, public assistance and master plans and smaller amounts in an effort to kind of round some of those things uh, to kind of round out the portfolio of the CIP improvements. Uh, on the sub-regional side, uh, the predominant component of the $6 million really is invested in the plant uh, with small amounts going towards the continued maintenance of the geysers uh, and then uh, future master plan improvements. For transportation and public works, more on the uh, road side of the house, uh, we've got about an $18 million portfolio that we're putting forward uh, with about $11 million in street rehabilitation um, and then uh, about a million and a half for capacity enhancements, uh, miscellaneous um, uh, street lights, traffic, ADA and bicycles in small amounts uh, to kind of round out the entire uh, program. Miscellaneous kind of includes pre-designed planning budget and GIS costs uh, that help support a lot of the programs uh, within the capital improvement program budget. Some of the specific projects that we're looking at are Sonoma Avenue pavement rehabilitation. Uh, that was something Chuck mentioned. We're excited to be able to finally get in and do this work on Sonoma Avenue between Bobby, uh, Bobby Lane and E Street. Uh, we think it's gonna be uh, a project that's gonna be valuable to our community. We hear about this road all of the time. Um, and then we're also gonna be looking at finally getting in and doing the Hohen embankment repair. Uh, as you recall, several years ago, we started to see uh, the embankment slip out just uh, along Hohen Avenue, just to the west of Farmer's Lane, um, which caused us to reduce the road by half uh, in an effort to protect the community. Uh, we're finally gonna get out there and get that work uh, completed. Uh, we've got two Two projects with our pedestrian uh, bicycle and pedestrian gap closure uh, on Piner Road and Dutton. Piner Road, we're actually going to be between Cleveland Avenue and uh, Industrial. We're going to be taking the um, uh, actually between. Cleveland and Coffee. We're going to be taking the shoulders uh, and we're going to be repaving those to provide for a smooth, safe bicycle route. Uh, and then on Dutton Avenue, there is a sidewalk gap just to the south of Jennings Avenue, and it's our intention to move forward with that. Um, we're going to continue to put about $815,000 into our Fulton Road widening project. Uh, this is a critical component. Uh, uh, it is Measure M funded for a majority of it, uh, but we do need to provide a one-to-one -one match for our Measure M dollars, uh, and this will help us uh, continue to move with our uh, Rule 28 project uh, in working with PG&E. And then lastly on the list here, and again, this is just a sampling of the type of projects that are going on, is our Santa Rosa Avenue corridor project. Uh, we're looking at investing uh, TDA Article 3 funds to help us um, move forward and get that project complete. That is the reconfiguration of Santa Rosa Avenue between Maple and Sonoma Avenue to accommodate uh, Class 2 bike lanes uh, and um, improve circulation in that area for bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, I will say um, earlier this, uh, well, yesterday, uh, council member requested that we provide additional information on bicycle and pedestrian enhancements, a little more detailed information about that. Uh, that was sent to you earlier today in an email. And with that, if you have any questions about the capital improvement program, I am happy to help. Everyone's still awake, just FYI. Perfect. Any questions from council? Um, I have one, if you can go back to slide 141, the parks. To be honest, I, I find this kind of misleading because uh, tennis court resurfacing, going back to the documents, that's actually not in zone one, but being paid for by Northwest development fees. So I think those are Gallon Park tennis court resurfacing, which is not in zone one. And Peter Springs Park, the 200K, that's actually off of Kiwana Springs, which also is not in zone one Northwest. And I know sometimes different zones get funds borrowed from other zones. And my questions are, um, especially when you show the next slide shows the balance in those, 
Um, zone three's got more than enough money as does zone four to cover those two projects. Who's tracking that and who makes those decisions, what zones to tap from? And so we're lucky to have Jen Santos, who's the Deputy Director of Recreation and Parks, to answer that question. Good afternoon, Council Members. Uh, I wanted to clarify with that, we do tend to move funds around as needed. We've done the same thing with the Southwest Zone. We've moved, if you look at um, Rosenclee Community Park on slide, I'm guessing this is correct, slide nine. I'm sorry, slide 141, we do move zones around to help complete projects. And we do track that and get back those funds back to the zones that they originated from. So we have a master Excel spreadsheet in the Rec and Parks Department where we track what is happening from one zone to another. So we can be sure that we're providing equal uh, opportunity for those zones. So for instance, zone four does not typically collect as much funding as the other zones, um, but we have a high need in zone four, for, I'm sorry, zone two, the Rosen Creek area, uh, for, um, for projects down there with our large Rosen Creek community park that isn't quite uh, ready for construction yet, so we're preparing for those projects. And we do track them, and when we do receive funds in the future for those zones that didn't have them originally, we will move them back. So what role does council or the Board of Community Services play in tracking? And I guess the priority, I have a, I have a question about that because I would make the assumption on slide 142, it shows Northwest has got over $2 million. Those funds come from developments in Northwest, which in essence are supposed to provide recreational resources for that development. That's correct, and we do uh, work with the Board of Community Services annually, and uh, recently we've been uh, moving that up to every six months to keep them informed of what we're, uh, how we're uh, using the funds, how we're getting the funds back to those original um, zones so they can be reused, and uh, keeping them informed of the tracking that we are doing and the projects related there. It is correct that those zones that we collect, the money we collect in those zones typically stays there. Uh, we do, the general plan does allow for uh, moving of zones if it's for, if for instance, if it's for a citywide benefit. So Roseland Creek Community Park and other parks, tennis uh, resurfacing projects that serve a more larger citywide uh, use, uh, we are allowed per the general plan to move, and so we do that occasionally. I, I guess I would struggle to see how taking 50K from zone one for the community-wide benefit to play tennis in zone four when there's funding for zone four. And I guess the, the question for me when you say keeping Board of Community Services informed, um, are we working with them and they have some input as to what the priorities are or are you just telling them what you're doing and they don't actually have a voice in the prioritizations of which projects can get funded and which zones are paying for the community benefit of all of us? We do seek their input and feedback on our recommendations. And so, yes, I do feel that they have a, a voice, and so does the community. Uh, when we do go over these projects, um, we are keeping everybody informed and up to date. And if there is a concern or something, we absolutely will respond to that. But um, it's a cumulative, uh, you know, like Jason, Director Nett said earlier. Um, a lot of these things are collected cumulatively. So at the time that the $50,000, you know, for instance, 50000 is moved, it might have been a uh, financially beneficial to do that, and then we can get it back to the originating zone the following years as needed. So could that data be provided to the council and the yes. Board of Community Services? Because I guess it, it, what I'm hearing you say that the ultimate decision is staff. It's not the Board of Community Services or the city council. Right, we do, we do look to the Board of Community Services to provide feedback for us for our recommendations that we take annually uh, to them on using the funds for, for so, parks. Again, and we the can decision's already been made, and I, I don't want to get in technicalities yeah. here, but what you're saying, there's one thing you said, this is what we're doing, just want to let you know, versus we want your input and decision-making ability about where we're going to prioritize which projects. Because I, I, I'm also somewhat struck, obviously, you participate in many of the discussions on Coffee Park. I know Rink and Ridge Park, which would be in Zone 3, there's no projects here, but my understanding that it, it experienced significant damage from that. Mm -hmm. 
I guess I'm an advocate of getting Board of Community Services more engaged and or the City Council, especially in light of Measure M. So I, I saw on the uh, CIP funds, 1.9 million will be coming our way. I know we don't know how that can be dispersed, but getting that community input and you know, no disrespect, but if it's still in the, just staff driven, I'm not sure that's the intent of what the voters wanted for supporting all the parks. So I don't know, and this might be a city manager decision. I, I, I don't know if it's a policy change or if you need, is this another study session feedback from council to the city manager? How would you want? So, so we'll, we'll caucus on exactly this point um, and the message is totally received. Yeah, again, just going back to echo some comments from my colleagues about the transparency in this. Some of us living in zone one would say, man, I know there's a whole bunch of park projects in zone one that could use some upgrades. And again, going back to the slide 141, that doesn't appear, if one were to read this and not know where the zones were, it looks like those zone ones are getting a whole lot of um, improvements, but that's actually not the case. The, the funding's coming from zone one, but the project is not in zone one. So clarifying that would also, I think, be beneficial for all members. Any other? Questions or comments from council? Okay, we have a couple of cards here and we'll give one. Oh, oh, sure, yeah, any of the CIP presentation. Can, can I just uh, ask, um, are the costs for, are our hopeful costs for Jennings in here somewhere? Or is that something that, because we don't know for sure, we're not saving up for it yet? So we currently still have funds remaining from our original project. We haven't depleted them, nor have we uh, eliminated the project itself. Um, it is not adequate to, it is not adequate if we have a project moving forward, and we will have to come back in the future uh, to request additional funds for council, from council. Okay, and I'm not sure if this is CIP or not. The Community Advisory Board also has CIP um, in the charter as something that they look at. Did this go through the Community Advisory Board? So last year, and I know Jason Carter's in the room or has been. Um, I see him. Last year, we, the CAB did not collect data and information because we had to defer and delay most of their community meetings. Uh, this year, they're beginning their collection process now as a component of the Wednesday night markets. Uh, and so we will take that data and information and, can, and move that into next year's process. Okay, and if I may ask the city manager, um, I recall that there was a, we paid some funds for a strategic plan for the Community Advisory Board, but I'm not sure that we've approved you, you, that, I, and I'm not sure if we're not implementing yet. Not yet, right. that, and Just is the word. funding for the implementation nope. of that in here, and I missed it? Because I could have missed it. Yeah, we have an uh, in that same process. I just okay. wanted to confirm that. And is that. the funding for implementing their strategy in here? In the budget? Because we did it, okay. Yes. Just making sure, thank you very much. We also had a couple of public comments earlier asking about the CHAP program. Is the 20K for the CHAP program continued through uh, or not in this budget? Okay. Yes, it is. Is it at 20 or 30? It's at 20. It's at 20? 20. It's at 20, and we're, Council, um, we're going to be coming back in um, in August. I, I will just point out that that's a big date in August. A to have a, August. A, a, a August currently on the schedule is scheduled for a follow-up conversation on August 27th about the program and the, the, okay. the uh, components of the program. meeting in August? <laughs> uh, some things are going to have to move. Thank you. I appreciate it. Other questions regarding CIP, Mr. Tibbetts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I apologize, but I didn't see in here anything about the Portland Loo. What was the, what's the status on that? I know it made it into our budget priorities last year. I'll bring the man in charge Everybody's of the Loo down here. The staff, so I'm wondering what I just unearthed. Uh -oh. You had to ask. Um, the Portland Loop project is con currently moving forward. Uh, following council's direction last year to 
identify uh, location in the downtown. Uh, well, first was to solicit um, vendors to see who had products that would be applicable for our downtown area, and then to focus on identifying locations. Um, purchasing went, uh, went out and did a solicitation. Um, they, it was broad and open. They had a number of different companies that pulled the information, but only the Portland Loose submitted information. Uh, so they are now the vendor that we're okay to talk about and to work with. Um, we are, you'll be seeing here fairly soon a product or a staff report item coming to you um, to purchase the Lou. Uh, it has about a 10 month lead time, so we wanna go ahead and buy one now because we know we're gonna install one. Mm -hmm. um, and we are in the process of working with uh, staff members uh, and the downtown community uh, to identify potential locations within the downtown that we believe serve the community and population that the council directed us to try to serve. And so that uh, is actively working. It's our intent to try to go to the downtown subcommittee uh, here in the next uh, uh, three to six weeks. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll see what kind of additional direction we get uh, at that point. I will say that um, I've had some direct feedback from some property owners downtown that was, um, it should be a um, interesting um, downtown meeting. We'll tell them to open their bathrooms and there'll be no problem. I'm but, just, I'm giving everybody a heads up. But in all seriousness, I do want to say thanks, Jason. I know that that was like this odd thing that got thrown in the budget last year. And the fact that it's actually come this far a year later is imp impressive and I appreciate it. Thank you. Once we get to a point where we think we've got some consensus or where we think we understand the direction that the, at least the three council members that sit on the downtown subcommittee have as consensus. We're gonna come back to council for final approval on the location um, because there, there may be uh, a portion of the public that wants to speak about that location. Okay, a council. conversation. <laughs> Any other questions about the CIP? And again, there'll be more opportunities for comments on the rest of this presentation after we take public comment. For, before we do take public comment, I think the, we have one more slide to show because we do. There's some direct feedback we need from council as you go through your comments. So, okay. Did you have a question, Ms. Fleming? Okay. No. I just wanted to let anybody who is interested in supporting or, or whatever interested and involved in the process of the the Portland loot to come to the downtown subcommittee and voice your, your opinion one way or another about it. It should be noticed online soon. So is this just what the next question is gonna be? These are, uh, this is just to lead the discussion, just some of the things that we are, wanna get some input from council on for putting together the budget for, for the adoption for June 18th. So, well, actually, I, I would like to take public comment before this, and they can maybe comment on this before we actually make comments, so we have all the information to provide any comment to you. Okay. So, with that, uh, we have two cards. Uh, Chandler Dorjana, are you here? Great. And Dwayne Dewitt has returned. Daisy, do we have any other cards? Or are these the two? Great. Uh, good afternoon. Um, uh, my name is Chandler Jordana. I'm the Senior Program Manager for the Secure Families Collaborative of Sonoma County. I have met a couple of you, but I have not had the privilege of meeting all of you. Uh, the City of Santa Rosa generously uh, contributed $35,000 to our fund uh, last fiscal year, and we're asking for a $50,000 donation for this upcoming fiscal year and the, year and the following year, as it is a three-year program. Um, thank you for allowing me the, t uh, the time to speak. I, I'm in, in recognition, especially that it's a tight budget year. Uh, so thank you for your continued cooperation. Uh, there's, I, I, as I've um, been here for the majority of the, either here in person or uh, watching via teleconference of the um, budget hearing, one thing that I keep hearing about is the, econo uh, the economy and the economic recovery, uh, including via the recovery and resiliency program. And I'd just like to share some, some facts about why the council should should support this fund and why it's important. Um, uh, the 
The unemployment rate in Sonoma County is 2.6%, and uh, the Press Democrat reported that several economists have um, rep reported a labor shortage as threatening Santa Rosa and, and Sonoma County potentially into economic recession. Um, the unemployment rate of 2.6% is 1.3% than the state average, and one county winery has rep uh, reported that uh, they they received about 15 applications last year for the uh, picker positions as opposed to about 700 10 years ago. Uh, there's an estimated 20,000 undocumented immigrants in Santa Rosa, and um, the between 2005 and 2014, the Hispanic and Latino population of Sonoma County increased by 36%, and the tourism via the accommodation and food services bring in an estimated $1 billion to Sonoma County, and we're asking for the city of Santa Rosa to uh, support our endeavors uh, in light of the fact that it's the largest city in the county and that it's um, the Sonoma County has already contributed $100,000 and we're very thankful for the contributions that the city has made already. Um, I'm sorry, I just realized that I forgot to properly introduce <laughs> the uh, Secure Families Collaborative. The Secure Families Collaborative provides uh, pro bono deportation defense for people in removal proceedings for uh, Sonoma County um, immigrants. And in addition to the pro bono defense uh, component, there's also uh, affirmative legal services and social wraparound services. Uh, it is a, it's an unprecedented uh, nonprofit collaboration and it has the opportunity to really put the city of Santa Rosa and uh, Sonoma County as a whole on the map. Um, so apart from the economic reasons, there's also sociocultural reasons. Um, also the fear inciting federal rhetoric of the, um, of the federal government has been proven untrue and um, Again, it has the potential for national recognition for the city of Santa Rosa and the economic benefits. I believe I've already spoken to them and, and they're quite self-evident. So uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Dwayne DeWay. Thank you, sir. Could you put up slide 141 again? Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland, and I'm not here to ask you for money. I'm here to help you try to save some money with the upcoming tight budgets. This slide is really important in a way. I hope that Mr. Rogers will remember a couple of years ago when the Parks Department came back to talk about an already completed master plan for Roseland Park. It was done in 2010. They sat on it for five years, didn't approve it. There was some tomfoolery that happened and the Recreation and Parks Director left along with an assistant and also the city manager. So the Parks Department came back and they said, hey, we need $500,000 because we're going to revisit this plan. Well, now I see here that they're asking for 600 dollars and 61,000 more dollars. And I'm like, wait a minute, what is going on? I'm hoping that this study session is about discussing and finding answers, that dialogue with the community that you talk about. I'm real concerned because essentially the approach doesn't seem to be geared towards actually doing what the community has said they wanted and thought the plan was finished in 2010, and then has gone through the meetings and has tried to advocate in the popular local way with those folks that live there. But the kind gentleman, Mr. Nutt, and the kind lady, Ms. Santos, that work for you folks, have told us pretty much it's their way or the highway. So I'd like for you to get the explanation as to why is costing another $661,000 for something that's already, in a sense, been done. If they were gonna do the environmental impact report, that could have been done a long time ago. And it neglects in the study here to point out that two and a half million dollars was spent by the Ag and Open Space District to get the first 5.9 acres already done, spent, nine full years ago fenced off, 
not being utilized by the community. Uh, I talk with advocates for veterans and they'd be like, you know, they could put those houses to use at least and bring some income forward. They could also perhaps move them off the site and save the money that you might have to spend to demolish them. It doesn't seem as if you're really trying to save money though. It seems it's pretty much like they give you stuff, they spoon feed it to you in a way, and then it's like, okay, we'll just go with what we can. I hope in the next session, you'll allow the public to be part of this discussion instead of just this one little uh, request for information. Please find the information. Thank you. Thank you, Dwayne. Mr. McBride. Hi, Mayor and Council. Uh, one of the things we'd like to do um, uh, is get some council direction on these specific issues that we that we've talked to you about. So you remember we've kind of broken this into pieces. The first thing that we that we had were the um, were the discussions on kind of the top level financial stability pieces. So one of the things that we want to do uh, as we move forward with the budget is is get council direction on uh, how you'd like to move forward with payment of the unfunded liability. Our recommendation right now is to. Um, is to pay down that liability using that $4.2 million. Uh, our hope is to, to do that. And then we could, we could as one-time monies become available, discuss um, implementing, you know, some sort of a uh, stabilization fund or something like that uh, in, in the future. Um, but either way, uh, however, council wants to, uh, wants to handle that one. We had some recovering resiliency asks. So, uh, so we had the disaster project funding. Um, those had some big dollars associated with them and we don't really have a, a ton of one-time money to use on those things. So I think in the slide that I showed you, we had about $3 million that we could spread between this and infrastructure. And I believe the ask on infrastructure was three to three and a half million dollars. We also have some operating asks that we'd like to get uh, council direction on. Uh, we told you we'd like to extend the Ernst & Young contract um, for uh, I think three months. Uh, at, a, at a cost of three hundred thousand um, dollars, I think we could find a way to probably we could probably pay pay that through uh, through fund balance or or just uh, through turn back money. So, uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna cut in. Unfortunately, um, the entire PA process will grind to an unfortunate halt. I, I hate to say I'm not sure you have an option on that one, but the reality is you don't because we don't we won't be able to sustain the effort on the public assistance process. So um, we are trying to get through this, but they bring a contingency of support so that we can manage and bring this internally. So the, the CFO's being kind, I'm just saying I, I need you to affirm that because we will be in a very difficult situation because we cannot absorb that internally at this point. If I may, are we looking at for example, slide 31 in the first one, not the capital improvements one. Um, is, that, is that the 26 million that we're looking at as we're having this conversation about where funds will come from or how we might allocate funds? It's, it's not clear to me from this picture where your 4.2 million is coming out of, unless I, for example, go back and look at slide 31 Right, and actually I think I'm looking, if you're looking at 31, I think I'm looking at 32. It's that kind of graphical depiction that we did with the yep. general fund deficit at the top. It says at the top of mind funding sources and funding gaps, which actually yeah. should say suggested. Right. So and that's, the sources are uh, total 26 million. Right. So is this money coming from that 26 million? Sir, so it, it is, and remember though, with the CalPERS one was a little bit different because that money was collected for that purpose, so we can really only apply that towards CalPERS. So, so the that's, pension obligation bond right. funds money has exactly. to go back into. So right. that four million. It, is, and in some form, council can choose it's not a 4 to. Four million and not four point two. It's four point two. Document. Yeah, it's four. I rounded it to four on the document just for ease of, of conversation. Thank but, you. But council can choose to uh, to apply that to PERS in a number of ways. You could also decide to uh, set up a stabilization fund. You don't have to pay off PERS. That was just our recommendation. 
Do you have a question? Because then I'll yeah. So, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Chavez. Yeah, really quick. So this 4.2, to be clear, I raised a question yesterday about um, one was basically betting on the market. The other was more of a, I mean, to use a market analogy, feathering the dollar in. Is that safe to say that a pension stabilization fund is more like feathering money into this this equities market? That, that would be a fair um, look at it. it it's it, it would be... Um, it would just allow you to ride out any annual increases due to gains or mostly gains or losses, probably totally gains or losses within the uh, within the within the uh, calipers asset. Um, so it would be a more uh, reactive approach. Um, the approach that we that we're recommending actually gets you savings and starts to pay down the UAL. So that's a more I guess proactive approach. It just depends on how you want to how you want to tackle it. But that that latter example is. I mean, what timeline of, of PERS, because, I mean, let's, as I understand PERS, is that it's, it basically tracks the, the national economy. The national economy tanks, PERS returns tanks. Yep. So what timeline are we looking at here? How long is, are we going to see that savings get generated? I think it was $6 million something that we would save in the long term. I'm, I'm supportive of using the PERS money for PERS, but right now I'd bet against a successful market. Yeah, so here's here's the deal. If, if the market takes a downturn, that's going to negatively affect our costs either way. If you put this money into PERS, um, you, you're going to you're going to still have the savings from it, but it, that savings may actually get hidden by the fact that you have a big loss in PERS. So I could come back next year and you could say, where's my $685,000 of savings? And PERS could have had a loss or could have just missed their targeted return and it would completely paper it over. But if we hadn't done that, our increases would have been even bigger. So it, I don't know if that we, we, Yeah, it does, and I appreciate it. And I think the council needs to really look clearly at this question. Um, the... Can the PERS money be put into our, our reserve? Could we, I mean, how, is there a time period that we can hold on to it? Um, and again, the reason why I'm asking here is that I, I recognize if you throw money into an equity account and you, you build your principal, that principal is going to change with the changing market. And over a 10 year average, your principal is better off with the contribution than without it. But I'm just wondering when's, is there, is there an optimal time to throw, assuming this, this PERS money can only be used for one of the two options you just laid out. Is there a way to do get, get the savings you realize, but maybe hold on to it while there's uncertainty in the market? Oh, you could do any number of things that, that would be uh, middle ground solutions. You could tell me to take $2 million of this, throw it at PERS, and keep 2.2 in reserves. I, I would, you know, caution counsel against using this money for any other purpose. But you could do not if you did nothing, we would just leave the $4.2 million uh, there to service PERS in some, you know, maybe in the future, we could call it a stabilization fund so that when, when we do have a, a year where we have a big increase in our ARC, we could dip into that to pay that. And, and, uh, or you could go, you know, full Monty and pay the whole 4.2 million to PERS. And, and you're right. I mean, you do have to think about the flip side of this coin. I'm trying to pay down PERS and, and, and attack that UAL, mm -hmm. but that's the finance side of me. You are putting $4.2 million at a risky market. Uh, the only problem is, you know, if you're asking me to hold on to it and tell you when to get in, uh, I can't time the market. I couldn't tell you when. Yeah, we're, right we're, we're not, I mean, that's one of the, the challenges is us managing the portfolio. It's not, it's not something that's going to be in our regular, regular wheelhouse of management in terms of market chasing is not going to be a successful thing for a city to do. What I, what I think we could maybe do is bring back a sort of global picture of what communities are doing for June. You know, say, say this is, this is the choices across the state that are going on. And if you're feeling comfortable at that point, we can delay the conversation. I think our staff's chief concern is we've gone, uh, the fire has been a big detriment. We were supposed to have this conversation about this item to you years ago, specifically about getting a strategy. I think what the community is going to look for, council member, is a commitment to a strategy and what that strategy is. Yeah. And so what, I, what I'll what i say is we'll come back in the June and we'll give you maybe a better picture of, of what communities are doing around the state, how they're approaching this problem to give you some guidance. 
Um, and then you can make a decision about where, where you want to go with the 4.2, but we just wanted to make sure that there's an opportunity, the opportunity for this session is closing, and so if we don't take it now, we're going to have to wait till a full year, right, to, to take this opportunity again. And so we just want to make sure that you're comf if that's the choice, you're comfortable with that choice. So, Mayor, to answer your question and get this, what are our comments on that going? My suggestion would be is we give Chuck 2.2 million right now to get in on this year, but then keep 2.2 for us to have that conversation because if we're gonna be doing this sort of thing, this organization needs an investment policy statement. Um, and maybe we have one, but it's, it feels to me like we're just saying, we see savings now based on current returns, let's throw it in. And without there being an established policy around that, it feels a little bit like we're being cavalier with a lot of money. Just to me, and that's not a, a, a value statement on the work that you're doing. I think it's great. I just, you know, to be to be prudent with it, it makes sense to me that we pay some of that down, get some savings, and then we keep some as a stabilization fund, or at least keep some to have a conversation to tell future councils what we're going to be doing going forward. All right. So let's uh, try to keep it to questions first, and then we'll go around for the final comments. So it'll be Victoria, Chris, and then Julie. Thank you, Director McBride. I asked you this question yesterday, but I, the languaging keeps coming up again. When you say pay down PERS, you don't mean that we're paying down PERS, as far as I understand. You mean that we are investing in the hope of getting a return that's better than what it currently gets in, in our um, portfolio. Um. So let me say yes to all those things. So when I say that we're paying down PERS, we have that $338 million unfunded liability. That liability is spread among three different plans, police, fire, and miscellaneous. If you go into those plans, you will see a page that lists out line after line of amortizations. And, and the best way I can explain those things is they're like seconds on your house. So every time they have a loss, we get a new 20-year amortization line. The next year they have a loss, we get a new one. If we change benefits, which we haven't done in a long time, that gets new amortization. It's like block of line items that makes up that $338 million. What I am recommending is we go in and we pick those line items, when we pick three of them, one in each plan, and we are knocking out a piece of that. And unlike, you know, my, my mortgage analogy, if you went in, you paid additional principal on your home, it wouldn't lower your mortgage. You still have the same monthly payment. This lowers your actual mortgage. PERS will actually go back in and re-amortize it, and you will get those annual savings. And then you will also get those, those other savings. To your other question, um, yeah, I, I am, because PERS is assuming a, a rate of return of seven and a quarter percent on those amortizations, that's how they build our cost. So we are essentially um, taking 2% money and throwing it at a seven and a half and a seven and a quarter percent problem. So in that way, you are actually uh, using the money, I think, to, to a better use. But again, you know, I, I can't talk about that without talking about the risk that we have of putting additional money in a PERS asset that is susceptible to, to uh, very volatile market conditions. But right. I, I, And so that's where I'm going with this, is that it's not as though we're paying down part of a mortgage. We are investing in, in, in our system. You are paying down part of a mortgage. Yes. When, okay. when we put, if we put that $4.2 million in, your UAL, your, your unfunded liability goes down by $4.2 million. Do you feel confident with the current leadership at, at PERS to manage that money going forward if we were to make that decision? Do I, do I have to answer that? <laughs> I, I, I do. They, they have investment professionals. I, I think they're, um, I, I think they, I think looking at what the returns have been over the years, I'm not, I'm not suspect. Too invested in risky assets, but that's because of that high average rate of return they have to hit. They have to invest in risky assets. I think as time goes by and they will start to de-risk this portfolio and get into less risky assets, I think um, that'll be better. I will like that investment policy better, but you know, as per the way it's- you, you, it will increase our costs, you know, temporarily, but but over time, I think it will be better and more realistic. I think part of the problem that got us here is that we haven't really felt the feedback of what our actual costs of these programs are. Uh, so I, I think I think what they're doing is is correct. Mr. Rogers. 
Thank you, and I, th I think your explanation kind of went where I was gonna go with this, which is the way that I think about this is you've got five credit cards, each of them of different uh, uh, interest rates. You get one-time dollars if you pay off the one that has the highest interest rate. You're still owing what you owe on the credit card, but long-term, it's gonna cost you less because you've gotten rid of that, call it that credit card. You use the line analogy. Uh, so we can talk more about it, but I'm comfortable putting the 4.2 in because it does actually, in real terms, think of it as debt financing, thinking of it as interest rate, gets rid of $700,000 that we would have to owe towards it each year. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and before you ask your uh, question, Ms. Combs, uh, Mr. Sawyer, the staff has asked for direction on this, so what I'd like to do is ask your question. We're just going to go through the order, starting with you, Ms. Combs, work our way around so Mr. Sawyer can get caught up, but this is the information that staff would like to hear from council. Go ahead, Ms. Combs. Thank you, Mayor. It's, I think I recall asking a question yesterday along these lines of why would we do one over the other. What I'm remembering you, you mentioning is that, uh, is it correct that currently if we were to invest $4 million or $4.2 million ourselves in a, in a fund? Uh, Section 115? Yes, Is that the, um, then we would earn roughly 2% on it. Oh yeah, so um, council member, that, that my comment there was that when you talk about stabilization funds, which, right. is, which is one of the ways to handle this and actually was a recommendation by PFM, uh, you can do it in a number of ways. One is that you can in invest the money in what's called a section 115 irrevocable trust. Um, there's a couple of things I don't like about that. The irrevocable part I don't like. And uh, you know what that allows you to do though is invest in things like equities. So you can chase a higher rate of return. But again, I'm, I'm a little bit uncomfortable in that arena. The other thing that you could do is just have your own stabilization fund where the money is just pooled as it is now with the city's investment portfolio. So you're not going to get a 7% return on that. Our but current investment portfolio yields about what? About 2%. Okay. So that's where that 2% comment we, came from. If we put it in CalPERS, although it is possibly too much that they're suggesting they earn, what is the ballpark that's about 7% at CalPERS right now? Seven and a quarter is what they use right now for okay. their- Okay, and so even if they drop to six, somewhere in the sixes, um, that's better than two? That is better than two. Okay, um, I, I have a couple of questions about the recovery and resiliency. Now I'm still looking at page 31, which may be c confusing me. Um, is that the $7 million R and R local match that's listed on page thirty-one. That was that was a part of that. Yep. Okay. So is the three hundred k extension of Ernst and Young part of that seven million, or is that on top of? That's on top of. So we'd actually be though. I, I should kind of separate these out. So if you look at the yeah the uh, disaster project funding, that's really kind of capital projects that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. So the fire station five rebuild, um, you know, that's that's that 15 million we talked about. Street light replacement, I think, was a million dollars, and then tree removal, I think, uh, is a, is over two million dollars. But so the immediate ask was 250. I'm a little confused, and, and some of what I'm confused about, you need to help me with. Okay. Um, you're asking for council direction. If I sit here and say I would like to see us fund some program, I'm asked to show where the 100,000 or whatever fund amount is coming from. But you're asking for these without showing clearly where you're taking them from. And I'm tr I thought that it was on page 31, but now I'm not sure. So can you? The 4.2 on page 31 was the POB funding source. Yes. So where is the recovery and resiliency coming from and what is the total amount? So that's what we what we have to get council direction on. So we have about $3 million to spread on that and infrastructure. Okay, so under funding gap here on that same page 31, I'm seeing a $3 million infrastructure. Yeah, that that was that was the initial ask. But if you do three million dollars in infrastructure uh, per Director Nutt's uh, presentation yesterday, that uses up all that money. Right. So that means that right now you don't have anything for for recovering resilience. So I don't. So that three million on this page doesn't cover the recovery money. 
Uh, not if you give it all to infrastructure, no. Okay, now there's something that says R&R &R local match on page 31 for seven million. Yep. Is that this or is that covering something else? That's part of this. That's part of disaster projects funding. Okay. And then the, I'm showing a deficit of 12 million on page right. 31. Right, so remember the way that we covered that, that deficit was, was from two sources. So you had deficit of $12 million. Um, unfortunately, I can't flip back and these are separate slideshows, otherwise I'd go to my other slide. But um, so, you, so you got $12 million. So we had $10 million in additional funding from the new measure O or the TEF as we're calling it. Um, and then we had, assuming council's amenable, we had $5 million in, uh, in savings from those from those 39.25 positions we showed you. So that's $15 million to address a $12 million gap. That leaves $3 million, rough math there, left over to address infrastructure and resiliency, one-time funding sources. The bottom two bullets that you're seeing there that are the EOC um, personnel, that's an ongoing operating cost. However, I think, and, and I'm, this is just me tying two things together, it doesn't mean council has to tie them together, but the reorganization that the city manager proposed to you, if you recall, had a savings of about $350,000 in, in ongoing savings. So you could feasibly, if we implement that in the budget that you adopt, we could move money to the EOC for that ongoing operating cost and those would roughly offset. Okay. But I that's can, operating I'm my pretty service. good at math in my head and, and, and I'm having a little trouble keeping up and I'm betting others cannot keep up. Um, I walked into the room sort of thinking there was $7 million of unassigned general fund balance somewhere. And thinking about what we would be doing with that. It looks as if, if we approve what, that's 32, not 31, at least on my page. If we, if we yeah. do what you have asked in your slide, we use all of the 26 million funding source dollars we have. Yeah, and thank you. Is that you. correct? Yeah, and, and hold on there, council member, because thank you. You just, I, you, you're right, I was miss, missing a piece of this. So that other bubble there, that one-time excess is what you just brought up. So we said we had $26 million were required for fund balance. We have 33, we had seven to use. So you're exactly right. You do have $7 million that you can use. It. Yeah, so <laughs> you outdid the CFO with your math skills. Very well done. Um, so you have $3 million that drops down from those ongoing portions right. Right. that you can use for those. and then. And you've got that additional $7 million if we take that from excess reserves and we apply that to those two boxes. So yes, you do have okay, that available so does, to you. Does the proposal that you have asked us to comment on use the total of the $26 million that's on page 31? Yeah, it does. If you it don't does, go to page well, I, I can add these it's up. hard on everybody. Yep. Can you go to page 31? Yep. <laughs> Thank you. So on the left hand side of page 31, there's a list of sources of income that right. we might have, and a list of how we might think about using it. And exactly. If we use it in the way that your final council decision question is framed, we're doing the funding gaps on the right side of this. Yes. Okay, yep. that's where I'm trying to get. And does, are the Ernst and Young in this or not? So the Ernst and Young is an operating cost. These are really, um, so the answer is no. So the answer is no. Okay. Yep. So we have to find an additional 300,000 for Ernst and Young. We do. And yep. there's a second one that's about 300,000 that my brain has just lost. So that was for the EIC, EOC personnel, the that's two the FTEs EOC and the- one. So that's also not in this. That's, that's part of the operating budget. So, so that would be ongoing another, costs. There's another 600,000 that we need to find that's not on this page. So that operating cost for the EOC, what you could do is if you tell us to do the reorganization the city manager recommended, that's going to save you $350,000 in operating costs per year. Then if we add in $300,000 in the final budget, it's which is what wash. we're asking, it's kind of a wash. Okay, yeah. so we still have to find the three hundred. dollars Still have to find another 300000 but that $300,000 for E&Y would be one-time money. Yeah, that's only for three months. So okay. um, that we would, we would you know, probably go and look for if, turn back or something like I that. If I want to help fund the Roseland Library, none of these dollars are available to do that. There isn't, 
in the unassigned general fund balance of seven million dollars to do that because it's being used here. No, no, council member, this is only a proposal. You can decide to do it. You could, you could, you could take that local match of seven million dollars and reduce that because we're using general fund you know, above uh, excess over our required reserve $26 million. That's $7 million, this is just a proposal. That doesn't say that's what you have to do. You, you could, you could, but you could do us. What do I not fund if I do that? Well, that's so, up, that's so up to you. So that, that, that's, that's the 50, that's, the $26 that, million. That's why we're question, asking right? for some direction. Right. We'll come back with a proposal if there are things you want us to fund. Okay. The, 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 the the 150,000 for Roseland Library is is an ongoing cost, so we'd have to factor that on into the ongoing support mechanism for the organization. And likely, I think the outcome is where we're going to be looking to to um, crunch the numbers as the right now is over infrastructure, right? So the so, three million in, in infrastructure is I, I in here, though. Yeah, it's in this proposal, but, but it's that's only three million. Yeah, it's only three million. We already know what the need is, and so where we would be looking to 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 chase the costs at least at a higher level is to start to depress what we're doing to invest in our infrastructure, which again defers that conversation longer. So I think. That's the likely outcome because the local match you're going to need, you're going to need to get that. I mean, and again, this is why it's not a single year issue. That's why we're trying to understand we need, we're going to be back here in this tough conversation next year. Some of these monies uh, will be sort of circling where it's way back into our coffers because some of it's admin costs that we'll be able to get some of it back. But right now we need to know what we're fronting up, up front. And so that's why we're trying to understand, are there priority things that we need to go between now, this budget, and the final adoption to add in? What we would, what we're telling you is likely, if you add stuff in, the infrastructure is going to be the thing that we're going to push back. And that has implications across the organization to not address our ongoing infrastructure. You saw that. We're, our facilities are in a five to ten year period where they're going to start to head towards failure. So. And so that's the question. Are there things that we want? I think there's a lot of things that got handled in the budget. Um, yes. And um, it, um, secure families were trying to understand what the real request is. We heard 50 here. We we had understood 75. We'll sort through that and see what the real number is and come back in the final proposal and, and answer that. But currently in the budget, it's tagged as a $75,000. Request. So at what point do we tell you if we have things that it concerns us that we aren't funding, for example, the library? At this what, this is the point to so do this so. Is, that's, so do I do that while well, I'm questioning? Okay. Um, so I'm interested that we fund the library. I think you know that I'm interested in funding some kind of miscellaneous wellness program without it being necessarily the specific wellness program that we may have some concerns about? So can I ask a clarifying question on that? There was, and again, I don't want to put words in another council member's mouth, but there was some concern about um, uh, 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 mental health issues and, and, and is, so is it a wellness program? Do, are we looking at both? I, I just want to make sure that that issue gets some conversation here because there are different programs. I, I think I'm looking for parity with what okay. our fire and police have that our miscellaneous employees have access. And if we change what our police and fire have with regard to wellness, which includes stress reduction, which I consider to be a great mental health benefit, um, then I would expect that our miscellaneous employees have it. So I'm looking for parity across employees. I'm concerned if we have not put aside the funding to implement the CAP strategic plan. The Community Advisory Board, excuse me. Staff has told plan. me that we have set aside those. Okay, funds. making sure I did that. Um, I have a strong interest in increasing our parks maintenance, grounds maintenance. I, I mean, 175, 200,000 for couple of parks people, I think we need to look there. I, I know where I would take it, but I don't think I have floor votes for where I would take it from, so you may want to find another place. 
And I'm also concerned that we need to have some ability to call on resources for the rental assistance program in order to get it started. Because while it pays for itself, that initial startup cost, will we will feel that. So that's my, um, that's my list. And your feedback on the 4.2 million? We, I think we have to do the 4.2 million and into uh, PERS because that's where the current best return is. Um, and we haven't, we've, every conversation I've heard is that we're not going to buy out of PERS and into Social Security. Okay, did that answer all the questions? Can you put up that other slide just so we can kind of, sorry. <laughs> right, yeah, so I, I appreciate that. Okay, Ms. Swing. Give the feedback to staff based on those presentations with when the slide appears. Yeah. Yep, okay, so um, in terms of the 4.2 million POB, I'm in favor of investing it with PERS. I would be most in favor of investing it not based on um, the three different classifications, but based on the worst credit card that we have, if there is one. If they're all the same, then fine. But I think that we owe it to our taxpayers and our employees to look at the global picture. And so if that's an option, that's what I'd like to see have happen. It's a leap of faith going with PERS on this. Um, and so I think we need to really do it as strategically as possible. I'm uncomfortable conditioning um, a funding allocation for the Ernst & Young and the other contract, the, both the $300,000 ones, based on a reorg that we haven't had a full public conversation of at this point in time. It doesn't speak to my feelings on the reorg, but I, I don't want to tie two things that are not really related to each other. So the $300,000 is not uh, tied to the reorg. It is something we have to get done. We have to keep accountants employed. So I, I wanna make it clear that we're gonna have to look for a resource when we come back in the budget to address that. Um, I, I don't have any options around that. I understand the, uh, if you don't wanna tie the other things together, we can get through that conversation. Yeah, I just um, think it's a cleaner conversation yeah. to say, you know, these are priorities we have and here's how we're gonna fund sure. them. And this is a reorg that is recommended and evaluate that separately. That would be my request there. And then um, I echo the sentiment around funding the Roseland Library as a high priority and, um, and then w requesting parity with regard to wellness for employees where possible. And um, finally, you know, just a continued long-term approach to wh where our investments are gonna give us the best bang for our buck. So, thank you. Mr. Tittes. Thank you, Mayor, and I apologize, I'm gonna be a little bit long-winded. Um, one of the things that uh, I was hoping to bring up earlier, but I apologize, I was absent when housing and community services came up, um, was actually two things. Uh, first was looking at uh, carving out funding for a homeless services attorney, just like we have uh, an attorney, a housing services attorney. And, and the reason why I wanna paint a picture that I've learned firsthand, um, a lot of people who are experiencing homelessness in our community today are easy, easy applicants for social security disability insurance. But to be able to go through that process, they have to have an advocate. It can be a, um, somebody who's certified to handle their HIPAA records, or it can be an attorney. Attorneys are better because it gets them through the appeals process. But as we're doing all this work with housing locators and navigators, this is one of those investments that's relatively small that will really complement all the work that we're doing vis-a-vis um, -vis housing locators, because if we compare people with their SSDI, that's another $800 a month in their pocket. So I really hope that we can look at that in this budget cycle, if there's support for it on the council. Uh, if not, certainly as we, we proceed looking with our comprehensive solution to homelessness. Uh, the other question I had was on page 109, and it was around the real property transfer tax. We went through that resolution back in August. Um, I tried to uh, solicit a, a copy of the resolution because I couldn't quite remember how the funding appropriations were supposed to be made. I noticed on the page 109 slide that we're currently allocating 30%, but that seemed a little bit low to me. But then again, I remember, I think it was 75% in 2022. So when you bring this back to us, just know that I really want that resolution, a copy of it and understand 
um, how that resolution is supposed to play into this budget process. As, as I believe it was written, we were supposed to be presented with a question about that and the council was supposed to make a decision about funding appropriations consistent to that resolution or holding off due to economic circumstance. And I don't believe we got that question uh, through the last two days. So it was discussed, I mean, and I think this is the input, I th we'll bring it back. Uh, we still are funding RPTT is the actual dollar amounts outstrips the percentage of investment, but we'll bring that back okay, to just, that yeah, conversation. Okay, a copy of the resolution too. If somebody on staff could send that to my email, I'd appreciate it. Um, the, for me, the Roseland Library, if there's one thing that we walk away with for the community from this budget process, I plead that it be the Roseland Community Library. I would preferably like to see two years of capital outlay so that they can move into their new lease space. But if we want to just look at one, that's fine, because I recognize there's economic uncertainty ahead. Um, but just making sure that we help facilitate that library getting relocated, because that is our responsibility now, it's our sphere of influence. And when you walk into the library in its current state, it looks like what people always feared it would look like. And that is that the city of Santa Rosa and the people on the east side are ignoring it. And I know that's not the tenor of this council. This council achieved, well actually prior council achieved annexation. But we, we have to make a really clear value statement about that library. The, um, the other one that I actually thought we had the opportunity to achieve that would be low hanging fruit is the rental inspection program. That was 1.6 million I think when it was quoted to us a year or so ago. Uh, and the reason why is if we do have this unanticipated $21.6 million surplus, this is something that gets paid back through the program as it was designed. I don't know if it's since changed since Ms. Howard sat me down and told me about the program, but I think there was uh, landlords were gonna be paying a, a per door fee and I thought, boy, what, what an easy way to get that inspection program going and then we can recapture that, those funds for whatever else the city priorities are at the time. But we have money to catalyze it now. I would suggest that we do that. Um, I think that, that about does it for me. Uh, the, you know, the parks thing, I just wanted to chime in on this. Uh, it is, to me, a little bit sad that we're, we're well below the national average. I'm sure a lot of California cities are, given our UAL. Um, situation, but I, uh, I do think there might be a middle ground here with seasonal employees. When I look at a lot of other cities, they're looking at seasonal employees to come out during the spring and summertime, tidy up the parks when they're at peak usage, then there's no UAL significant, you know, um, fiscal obligation to those folks because they're non-pension positions. So, you know, I could come around to, or at least as I understand it, I could be ignorant to that, but um, if that were the situation, as I understand it, I could see setting aside and supporting uh, some funds for seasonal park maintenance positions. And that's it. And I do want to thank uh, everybody and definitely you, Chuck, uh, for making this budget process pretty straightforward. Thanks. I thought you were almost going to say fun, but straightforward. I'll go with that. Mr. Olivares. This is never fun. Um, as, as relates to the uh, unfunded liability, yes, I support that. We do need to do something about that. It's been a problem for a long time, will continue to be a problem, so we need to address that when we can, and I support the others as well. Um, overall, I, I think uh, there's still more information that I need to make final decisions as we move forward, and uh, I'll go back to, to the PED and the cannabis issues, also related to the housing. Uh, I want to make sure that we're nimble enough as we start seeing what we're getting as far as applications, potential businesses, potential revenue coming from that. Can we be nimble enough to bring on the staffing that we need when, when it's time? That will be very important. Uh, and the other piece is public safety. With police, uh, we have some reductions. I know some of these are non-sworn positions, but those non-sworn positions allow uh, the opportunity for our, our sworn officers to be readily available to respond to urgent and emergency calls for service uh, and also try not to uh, impact response times. I need more information on these real impacts because uh, again, we've made uh, reductions in this department quite a bit uh, and it's hard to bounce back and start hiring officers right away. It's, 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 it's tough now all over the country in recruiting officers to come to work for any department and I don't want to get caught short and I do not want to jeopardize uh, public safety as we move forward because it, it, it means a lot. It means a lot to our efforts as it relates to tourism, making this a safe and healthy place to live and all the other things as well. Uh, as it relates to housing, um, 
and uh, community engagement, I think it's called, or whatever it, whatever it is. Uh, I need more information on NRP. What, what, are, what is the plan then? If, we're, if it's gonna die, what, what's, the, what's the new NRP gonna look like? Uh, we, we annexed a, a big piece of, of land in Roseland uh, in 2017. And for me, I haven't seen uh, enough yet to demonstrate that we're actually doing more with some of these communities that are in great need. Um, so I look forward to that. Recreation and parks, I mean, primarily the recreation. Again, I need more information. I know we have some index numbers and such, but from my perspective, I think our parks are doing pretty good as well. Uh, so it's, where's that separation with programming and parks? I know we're moving maintenance folks over to um, uh, public works. So where, where is the issue? I think you know, we talk about it, but uh, I, I need to understand what the real issue is before I start making serious considerations about adding more back to recreation and parks. Um, and again, considering it as, as citywide priorities uh, and looking forward into the future, not maybe something we can address this budget year, but we have to, and it's going back to Roseland, we have to look ahead as to what our needs are and one of the greatest needs that I see, regardless of the open government task force, is our bilingual needs in, in helping that community. How are we, what are we doing to make local government accessible to those who don't speak the language? And it, it, uh, it's troublesome to me when somebody has to drag in uh, uh, an interpreter for themselves or when there isn't anybody to do the interpretation for them while they're here. So I'm not saying we need it now, I'm just saying we need to start thinking about that because we've already annexed that, that property which brought in a lot of, I believe, monolingual Spanish speakers, but we need to make sure that we meet these needs in the future. Uh, the wellness program is, again, I don't have enough information. I don't think we, we had the right information here today. We need to have a better understanding of what those programs do, what each of the individual program does, because I don't believe that we are making a, a negative impact on the needs of our employees needing uh, uh, behavioral health assistance, whatever the case may be. I, I believe this is something that's kind of what we're getting maybe cutting back on is something that's nice to have and may be available someplace else. So I'm not ready to make a commitment with that because I don't believe we have the, enough information to make that decision here. And to the extent that we can, uh, I do agree that we need to uh, put, make the library a priority and how we can make that happen. Uh, I know it's gonna be tough because it's not just a one-time cost, but uh, I'm interested in looking at that as well. Mr. Sorry. Thank you, Mayor. Well, over the many years of going through these budgets, I've learned that um, one-time funds are some of the most difficult to spend. Um, I am in favor of the 4.2 going to the, as, as proposed by staff, um, going to CalPERS, as, although it does make me a little nervous, um, most investments make me nervous. So um, I think that's, that is prudent. Uh, there, you know, I, I think Councilmember Olivares um, highlighted public safety, and that is something I consider an absolute core service that we provide. Um, I would, it would be um, easier for me to, to move forward with that recommendation um, to, if I were to get a, a much clearer um, picture as to what, how that impacts our police um, and their, their ability to do their jobs. The, um, the, the, our homeless issue uh, has placed a great deal of, of pressure on that department. Um, and the city in general, all of our employees are, are affected, as are the citizenry and of course the homeless themselves. So um, I know there's been a, any reduction in their um, staffing does concern me. Um, I'd be willing to do it, but I, w I would like to hear what, what, the, what staff is, is suggesting will be the impacts um, on their ability to um, do their jobs. Um, as far as the Rosen Library, I, we, the, there, we have heard a lot of testimony about the importance of the library. Um, the ongoing commitment concerns me, uh, given our, our budget situation, and I am not convinced, um, and it's very difficult to take the, the temperature of, of a neighborhood, especially when the size of a, of a small city, um, as Roseland is when we annexed it. But I'm not sure if we, uh, that, uh, that I have 
that I have a firm sense of what it is, the residents of Roseland, what is most important to them. I have heard the library mentioned a number of times, and that is um, we, we are used to uh, hearing a, um, a fairly large number of, of constituents that are, that are interested in a particular endeavor um, to come into the chambers and suggest to us that the entire community um, is behind what they are behind. I'm not convinced of that. I, and I agree that is an, libraries are very, very important. They are much more meaningful in a way today than they were um, 20 or 25 years ago. They, they have changed. Roseland needs a library. I'm not prepared today um, to commit an ongoing support for that. Um, if I knew that that was the most, I, I just have this feeling that, that Roseland is going to, is going to identify uh, in the not too distant future some real needs that we didn't identify when, during the annexation and that we'll be needing some additional uh, support fiscally. And uh, so at this point, I would, um, I would want to hold back before I committed our funds on an annual basis to the library. Uh, so I'm willing to take this recommendation. Um, I would like to hear more about the, the public safety issue, um, but uh, I have come to the realization that uh, we have many more um, wants, um, and the, the list could go on forever, And but I'm gonna concentrate on the what I consider absolute needs um, on this budget. Thank you. Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you know, I think that one of the challenges here for me is how we look at the different pots of money that are coming in. And while it's easy for us to put in additional things that we'd like to see with the $3 million of found money, I can't look at that as found money. Uh, in fact, I don't see us with a $3 million surplus. I see us with a $7 million deficit because that's still what we owe to the public when it comes to the emergency measure that's come forward. Uh, for me, it would be really challenging to add in anything to the budget that is a, an ongoing programmatic uh, number as opposed to a one-time investment. So when I do look up at the uh, 4.2, that makes a lot of sense to me. That's one of our biggest long-term liabilities. That's one-time dollars that we have that we can put in to try to address it, not an ongoing addition. When I look at some of the recovery and resiliency projects, that's what we ask the public to fund with this emergency measure, is one-time dollars that we knew over the course of the, the five years that we'd have that measure, we needed matching funds and we needed some other strategic investments. I look over at room six where we took $8 million from our reserves and it was a bit of a risk but we drew, drew down our reserves to make a strategic investment that we knew was gonna help the community to respond and to recover. And we knew that it wasn't going to be an ongoing thing past recovery, and so that was an appropriate use of those as a one-time uh, investment and fund. When I see the 300,000 for Ernst & Young, that's the same thing that I'm saying, is it's a one-time investment that's going to help us to recover better. What we have, not discussed over the last two days, uh, except tangentially, is what exactly our reserve number is. We know what the policy is, we know we're meeting the policy, but we don't know where we're actually at, we haven't talked about that. Or if it would be more appropriate for this council to use some of those reserves to actually make some more of those strategic investments in recovery and resiliency that will help us to recover faster. To me, the contract extension for Ernst & Young falls into that category. So even if it meant that come June, you had to come back and say, we're actually going to take that 300,000 and take it from our reserves, understanding that the service that they're providing is going to allow us to recover more on the PA side, that's fine with me. Uh, where I'm having a little bit of a dis difficulty with this conversation is looking at the $3 million for ongoing expenses or ongoing programs at the budget, and I'd hope that we wouldn't add too much more into that. Again, understanding that we still have $7 million to get back to the voters, and if you want to go even further back, there's an additional quarter cent sales tax from far before my time that was billed again at that time as an emergency measure that is still in place as well. Thank you. Um, so let me just try to go in that order. Um, the 4.2 million go directly to PERS. And again, I, I like the way you offered it off of the miscellaneous police and fire. I'll leave it up to the subject matter experts to invest it the most you know, wisely way. And I <clears throat> totally get there's no, um, no guarantee. 
Um, so specifically with our unassigned general fund balance, I too um, support a one-time commitment for the Rosen Library, and that's where I think it should come from at 150K, because we are in the middle of having the discussions about our other three libraries and how we funded those, because one of the things that we said when we incorporated Roseland, we're gonna treat Roseland like the rest of the city. We're also not gonna uh, have a negative impact on the city when we do that incorporation. And I've shared that with many members uh, that I've spoken to regarding the library. Until we know how we are actually funding those other three libraries with the leases, I, I would really like to have uh, much better clarification on that within the next year so that we can, again, whatever, however we choose to do the other three, that's the way we should do the Roseland Library. So I see it not as an ongoing funding source, but a one-time, and I think it's appropriate for the unassigned general fund balance. Additionally, regarding Roseland, the initial cuts that we heard in October, then again in January, were two police officer positions that are gonna be added back. I do have the same concerns as some of my colleagues expressed with the civilian uh, positions there because again, they free up some time for our public safety officers, the sworn officers to do what they're trained to do. Um, but as we add that position back, I would ask that that position would be the SRO to Roseland. Um, again, treat if I'm, I'm making the assumption it was an oversight that when we did do the annexation that the additional police uh, positions, we have SROs at every other high school and it's a glaring uh, omission that we don't have one in the high school that we have located in Roseland. So if the police department had uh, made the adjustments that they're gonna do without that position, now that we've given that position back, I would ask that it be assigned to the SRO in Roseland because it's a huge uh, preventative uh, community benefit that I think that campus deserves. Um, I, I'm totally comfortable with the, the, the reorg. And again, one-time costs with the Ernst & Young, and then I, I'm in agreement with the, the reorg that 350K does pay for the EOC or emergency preparedness one. I think that is a sound strategy. Those I think are, are all of the comments I have. And do you have the direction that you need from council? There's another, there's another page we didn't talk about. Some of us have included that in your comments or in our comments. I, did you include Sam Jones Hall in your comments by not including Sam Jones? Uh, Sam Jones Hall, I, I don't think there's any feedback I need to give direction to because I think that is going to work itself out. We received that funding. We've received funding. Um, we have some questions about the terms on that funding, but we're working on our contingencies if we need, but we believe that, that the Leadership Council will have a conversation around that, and we are, we are optimistic. Some of the questions, my, my concern was whether or not that included the uh, former senior center navigation facility. We're looking at that, but we need to get through some of these other conversations. That is that is the second thing on the on the agenda to look directly at that as an activation point within the system. And any, any activity on that piece of property would come back to the council. Before. Absolutely. Great. Can, Go ahead. If I may, I'd like to ask a follow up question. My recollection, I'm following up on a comment by Council Member Oliveris. Um, my recollection was that we were so pleased with the neighborhood, the NRP, that we were wanting it to go citywide and that that was the direction that our conversation had been taking and before we started having these conversations. Um, can you clarify for so, me so what, again, what the direction so, is? So what we want to do is get into this real, you know, get reorganized and, and as, as the council member alluded, we have citywide issues and start using that as a measuring stick for investment, especially upstream investment. How are we shaping our programs to meet those needs within the community, many of which have been outlined here um, as resource management, especially around the Roseland Library, um, support of that new part of our community. So that's the reason we want to organize in that way is how do we gear to meet need and provide programs for the general public, but also really meet those needs in the community. Thank you. So did you need any additional feedback from council or so, have you received enough? So of Mayor, um, just keep my current state of mind. Let me walk through what I'm going to bring you back in June, I think, 
Are we coming back? Okay, so on June 18th, l let me tell you what I'm bringing back to you, and you, you tell me if this is if this is capturing what you want. Um, so we are going to go ahead and and uh, plan a budget that invests the 4.2 million dollars towards the unfunded liability with PERS. Um, we are going to look at moving uh, seven million dollars in one-time money to the disaster projects funding that are up there. Uh, we are going to find a way to fund, find one-time money to fund the Ernst & Young uh, uh, contract. We are going to appropriate $300,000 for the EOC. That'll be an ongoing operating cost. Um, the organizational structure, I'm not sure I heard, is that, am, am I doing that? Um, that's, I'm going to do a budget, a proposed budget for the 18th that has that in it. Okay, and then we are also going to build in the staff reductions that we talked about today, and we will come back with additional discussion on what those impacts are to the departments that council's asked about. Is that is that what's expected yes. for the 18th? Um, okay. Just for you, you said all seven million dollars that came from the unassigned general fund balance, correct? Right. Right. So yeah. my assumption, the comments that I as one gave to you, I would, you know, seven million if you took four hundred fifty thousand. That's your three hundred thousand for Ernst and Young one time, and one hundred fifty k for Rosen Library. If that's the figure, that's the bucket of money, at least for me. That that, that seems like uh, it's not having any impact. It, it's unassigned. Okay, Mr. Tibbetts, you had a question. And, and I, re I realized I didn't comment on organizational restructuring. I wholeheartedly support that. Okay, Miss Fleming. I'm uncomfortable with restructuring the organization without having a robust conversation about it. We went through a lot of budgetary items and we heard about cost savings. We did not discuss in any sort of detail the restructuring. And when, what I want to know is when we are going to do that because I can't sign off on something that places a council of six people who are not representative of the city of Santa Rosa at the top of our leadership structure without having an open, honest conversation that the chances of having six Caucasian straight men running our city, the probability of that is 0.7%. And I think that the public deserves to have an open, honest conversation about what type of organization we run and, and where we're going and where our values are. And that getting rolled into this conversation I think steamroll is something that I've been pretty clear on going up to this point. It doesn't mean that I'll say no, but I, I'm very serious about us having a conversation. So there's, there's, there's no, we, we were planning to bring this back to the, have a decision on the 19th. We are preparing a budget that's gonna reflect that. If the council doesn't want us to do that, the, then in change plans, this is the time to give us direction to not do that approach. I heard comments from other council members were okay with the, the, the proceed as staff is recommending. Uh, I'd invite other comments so that the direction is clear. I, I understand the importance of the reorganization and I also understand my colleagues' concern about having uh, the leadership not be as diverse as we would like. I understand how we've ended up there, but um, I, I appreciate my colleagues' comments with regard to um, diversity within the leadership. And I, I just, I get it that this is going forward regardless, but council members Combs and Oliveris won't be on our council in two years. I'm looking at being the only woman and no people of color on the council and at our senior leadership. That is not the Santa Rosa that I'm here to represent. And so I dissent. Any other questions for council? Just one last, Mayor, and um, we also, as part of what we're gonna bring back on June 18th, will be $3 million of one-time money towards infrastructure uh, per Director Nutt's presentation. Did you get the Roseland Library? I counted. Ye yes, we, he, he, he yeah. listed that. Yeah. Any other questions for council? So I, I just want to thank you and, and all the staff that's been here over the two days. It's a tremendous amount of information and the volume of information for all of us. Um, I really appreciate the um, 
the way it was presented and the um, the answers to all of our questions. And I think it's um, it's a nice step in the process that will finalize these decisions, these discussions, third week in June. So thank you. And with that, meeting's adjourned.